Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our event. Uh, my name is Jeremy Lamstein, and I am the symposium editor for the Cardozo Law Review. Thank you all very much for taking the time to be here today. A lot of hard work has gone into planning and creating today's program. Given how timely and relevant today's material is amid the current state of our country, we are thrilled that this event has come together. I want to thank everyone who has been a part of this long journey, namely Professors Roth, Seabach, Hertz, and Rudenstein, Quay, the rest of administration, the Law Review Board, and the Florsheimer Fellows. Now, for those attorneys attending today on Zoom who wish to receive New York State CLE credit for our program, please record all attendance verification codes announced during the program. In order to receive your CLE credits, you must report all such codes on our online affirmation form that was distributed to you by email and is now also on the Eventbrite page. For those seeking CLE credits here in person, please ensure that you've signed in with our staff seated right outside this room, and please ensure that you sign out with them and pick up your certification form when you leave. With that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. Representative Dan Goldman is a member of the United States House of Representatives from New York's 10th Congressional District. Prior to becoming an elected official, Representative Goldman served as lead counsel in the first impeachment of former President Donald Trump and as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York. He has written about and provided expert analysis on significant topics ranging from criminal justice reform to the special counsel's investigation. Please give a warm welcome for Representative Dan Goldman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you, and I want to thank um, my friend Jessica Roth for uh, inviting me here today. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here, especially um, for two reasons. One is, one is that um, Cardozo, of course, is part of Yeshiva University, which has a, a special place in my heart um, because my wife went to Stern College, uh, which is part of, uh, of Yeshiva University, so it's great, uh, great to be here. And the second, of course, uh, is we're in my district. So um, great, for, uh, great for that and great for, uh, really appreciate all of you uh, coming here today. I I'm excited um, especially to speak on a topic um, that is so timely and so important um, as we have been going through in our country an ethical stress test um, that has really jeopardized our rule of law and our legal system broadly. Uh, obviously, um, we are, we're in a different era post-2016, um, and we have had to face uh, a number of different aspects that have really pushed our system to the ethical limit. Um, I'm going to talk today about a, a few of those of those things, um, is starting with some of uh, my own experience from working in the Department of Justice as a nonpartisan career official. Uh, then I had time uh, working down in Congress as a staff member on the House Intelligence Committee, so I've had some exposure um, to prior to being a member to the legislative branch and I had done a couple clerkships in the judiciary and have obviously uh, followed very closely um, what is going on in our judiciary and and the three branches of government and our basic fundamental constitutional foundation of checks and balances and separation of powers have all converged in this time especially even with very recent events um, to threaten what we have all known and all benefited so much from, which is a basic uh, reliance on the rule of law, basic fundamental democratic values, and institutions that are created and have developed 
uh, to ensure that we are a nation of laws and not men. I want to take a, a moment just to go through um, my background because I do not so much because um, I, I'm asking you to vote for me, um, although you can, <laughs> but because my experiences um, have oddly kind of dovetailed into um, a very critical um, convergence that we're dealing with today. Um, for most of my professional career, I imagine speaking at one of the excellent panels that you're going to have today as a practicing attorney. Uh, it's a profession that I really loved. I never planned to go into electoral politics. I was quite happy as a lawyer, um, and I don't think it was entirely because I never worked at a big law firm. I am the first to acknowledge uh, that I am truly the lucky beneficiary of the American dream. Uh, on one side of my family, a, an ancestor of mine went out to California and instead of digging for gold, decided that uh, he was going to make some jeans for all of the miners to wear. Um, and it became an iconic brand of jeans that uh, ultimately my family has, uh, has had a significant role in building. On the other side of my family, uh, my grandmother escaped anti-Semitism in what is now Ukraine, uh, escaping the pogroms in the early 1920s coming through Ellis Island and ultimately settling in uh, the Washington Baltimore area where her brother worked 16 hours a day at a little store that he opened in order to put all of his siblings through college. And my grandmother was at the time the youngest woman at 16 years old to ever graduate from George Washington University. And my father told me before uh, he passed away when I was 13, that to whom much is given, much is expected. And with that mantra firmly ensconced in me, I ultimately committed myself to a career in public service to try to provide everyone in this country with those, that same opportunity to pursue the American dream that my relatives have had. I was motivated uh, by my idol, Jack Greenberg, who was one of the founders of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, worked on Brown versus Board of Education with Thurgood Marshall, and ultimately ran the LDF for many years uh, to go back to law school and try to become a civil rights lawyer. While I was at Stanford Law School, I worked closely with Michelle Alexander, uh, first in a criminal justice clinic, and then as her research assistant on her book, The New Jim Crow. I was also a member of the very, very first Supreme Court litigation clinic at any law school. Um, and in fact, in that first uh, semester, one of the cert petitions I worked on was granted. After law school, I uh, did a district court and then circuit court clerkships, and then I applied to work as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. I did have some concerns at the time, given my deep familiarity with our criminal justice system from that academic perspective, that I was going into a system of becoming a part of a system that was flawed in many ways. But there were two principal reasons why I felt like this was an important path to take. First, I wanted to be the one making the many discretionary decisions that a prosecutor has to make. I did not want to be on the other side as a defense attorney begging the prosecutor to make the discretionary decision that I thought was appropriate. I wanted to be in the arena making those critical decisions. And second, I felt like if I eventually did want to reform the criminal justice system, I needed to understand how it actually worked so that I could have the credibility uh, and the wherewithal to figure out how to fix it. I was hired in 2007 by U.S. Attorney Mike Garcia, appointed by President Bush. And politics, my political views, never came up as part of the application process. And in fact, it almost never came up uh, during my 10 years in the Southern District of New York. The SDNY turned out to be a, an amazing place to work, um, not just because uh, of the important work we were doing, and not just because I learned how to be a litigator and a trial lawyer, but really because I learned how to be a lawyer 
of the utmost integrity. When you are a prosecutor, you do not have an opponent on the other side of the courtroom. You are representing the United States, and your job is to do the right thing, to do justice. It is not to beat the defense lawyer. And that can be hard sometimes, but it was something that was truly ingrained in the Southern District and something that became a huge part of the type of lawyer and the type of person that I wanted to be. When we appeared in front of judges, the judges expected to get the unvarnished truth about the facts and the law from us, even when it was not favorable to us. And we knew that it wasn't just our reputation at stake, our individual reputation, but it was the reputation of the entire office that was at stake when we went in there. I prosecuted a range of cases, mob cases, mob murders, all the way to complicated securities fraud. And never once did politics or my political views or the political views of any of the law enforcement agents I worked with ever come up. And even in the public corruption unit, while I was there, both the Democratic Assembly leader, uh, Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, was charged with public corruption, as was the Republican State Senate leader, um, who was also charged with public corruption. Even in the public corruption cases, the politics did not matter. I left the Southern District in uh, November of 2017, shortly after my brother and niece died in a tragic plane accident. Before he passed away, my brother had clued in to a rising danger in the form of Donald Trump. And in one of his final messages or writings uh, before he died, he urged all of his friends and his family to get involved, to stand up. He said, the time for action is now. And I had those words squarely in my head when Adam Schiff called me in November of 2018 and asked me to lead an investigative unit that he was setting up as the new chairman of the House Intelligence Committee that was intended to investigate the financial conflicts of interest, especially internationally, of the then president and some of his family members. I decided that it was time to get back in the arena and that if I was going to uh, make a difference and be able to stand up for what was right, then I had to jump back in. And so I did, commuting down to DC every week for 14 months um, while my five children were here. Um, I did get some sleep, that was helpful. Soon after I got there, we, as part of this investigation, the Intelligence Committee subpoenaed Deutsche Bank, which was uh, Donald Trump's principal bank. Almost immediately, Donald Trump filed a lawsuit preventing, uh, trying to prevent Deutsche Bank from turning over his, his bank records. Ultimately, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and it was decided in June of 2020, and generally, broadly, it was decided in favor of the, the House and in favor of Congress, which could now get access to some of Donald Trump's uh, records. But that was 15 months after we had initially subpoenaed the documents. And in June of 2020, as the election was approaching, there was not enough time to do any meaningful investigation with it. Trump had run out the clock. He had won by losing because delay was the objective. While that case was being litigated, I had the opportunity to dig into uh, Robert Mueller's investigation as the special counsel and also the investigation that the House Intelligence Committee had done of Russia's interference in the 2016 election. And I had exposure to a lot of classified intelligence material and to understand how that intelligence works and operates, is collected, is used, uh, and ultimately informed the decision by the intelligence community to uh, determine that 
Russia did, in fact, interfere in the 2016 election. In September of 2019, um, we learned on the Intelligence Committee of a whistleblower complaint that the White House had prevented from being provided to the Intelligence Committee as was required by law. And I, I have such strong memories of reading for the very first time the opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel and Department of Justice, which is truly the sort of lawyer for the executive branch of government. And its opinions are binding on the executive branch. And that opinion twisted itself into such absurd pretzels to support a decision, a lawless decision, not to turn over this whistleblower complaint, uh, even though it met every criteria of the law that required it to be turned over to the committees of jurisdiction, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. Now, when we got, finally got the complaint, uh, and with it, the not-so-perfect phone call between Donald Trump and uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine, we understood why. We understood why the White House had gone to such great lengths to uh, try to prevent Congress from getting that document, because it really laid out in detail um, the, the degree to which Donald Trump was using his official authority as President of the United States uh, to coerce a foreign government and a foreign president uh, to do his own political bidding. As soon as we got this complaint in this transcript, it was almost as if muscle memory kicked in from my 10 years in the Southern District. And one of the things that we learned uh, in the Southern District is that speed kills. Um, to be aggressive and to move quickly makes a big difference. And that's what we did. We knew that the White House would try to obstruct our investigation. In fact, in April earlier of that year, Donald Trump had declared that he was going to, quote, fight all the subpoenas, unquote, from Congress. And we ultimately, at the very last minute, the White House did intervene to prevent the State Department from turning over documents pursuant to a subpoena that we had issued that were directly relevant to this investigation. And ultimately, we did not receive a single document from the Trump administration as part of our impeachment investigation. But the witnesses were a different story. The witnesses were all either current or former diplomats, Department of Defense officials, or intelligence officials with the United States government. All of them had dedicated their lives to the United States, to working for our country in anonymity at least until the impeachment investigation, and now many are household names, but they were the true patriots who stood up to the pressure from the White House and came in and testified. They had taken an oath to their country, not to any individual, and to them, a congressional subpoena was a binding obligation to testify. Many more of their superiors, their senior officials who are pol were political appointees, refused to come and testify. But by the time that happened, um, we, we knew that we had a good foundation and understanding of the facts. And we also knew that it was pointless to try to enforce a subpoena because the courts would take so long to resolve it, and by that point, the investigation would have to be over. These 17 witnesses who came in were some of the most impressive people I have ever come across. And I can tell you that as a prosecutor for 10 years, I would have given anything for any of them to be my key witness in a criminal case. And, but still, even though they knew that what Donald Trump had done was wrong, they did not allow partisan politics to enter into their testimony, almost to a person. What they testified to was what they knew and only what they knew. And over and over and over, they resisted 
any effort to get them to opine or conclude about the ultimate conduct and whether it was correct or not. Now, the House ultimately impeached Trump for abusing his power of his office and obstructing Congress, and then it went over to the Senate for a trial. Uh, not surprisingly, Donald Trump was acquitted of the charges in the Senate, um, but I took solace in the fact that Mitt Romney, a Republican senator, became the first senator from a president's party to vote to convict a president of, for uh, impeachment. And even several of the other Republican senators who voted to acquit did so because they said they wanted the voters to decide in November rather than uh, have the senators decide, even though they acknowledged that we proved our case. As I remember Susan Collins saying after that Donald Trump had learned his lesson, if only he had. I left the Intelligence Committee shortly in March of 2020 as uh, COVID hit, and I did take some comfort in knowing that we had proved our case and we had shown it to the American people and it would be factored into the election in November. I had hoped and expected that Joe Biden would win and Donald Trump would ride his golf cart into the sunset. Well, the former happened but we know that the latter did not. And after the election, Trump put together a ragtag team of lawyers led by our former mayor here, Rudy Giuliani, who was also a central player in the Ukraine affair. And they went to every court they could find to try to stop the election from moving forward and stop the transfer of power. 60, more than 60 cases in all. But they ran into a problem when they got to court, which is that courts and judges require evidence. You cannot simply say whatever you want to say and have any kind of chance of winning. And they, of course, had no evidence to prove any of their allegations of election fraud. And that is why they lost every single one of their cases, including a number that were before Trump appointed judges. The judiciary branch held the line. And notwithstanding the efforts to overturn the election through the legal pathways through the courts, it did not work. Donald Trump, of course, did not give up. And he moved to increasingly illegal and unethical means of trying to stay in power from creating fake slates of electors to pressuring Vice President Pence to simply refuse to certify the results of the election to even trying to install an assistant attorney general to become attorney general so that he could send a bogus letter to the Georgia legislature questioning the results of Georgia's election. None of these worked. And so the final recourse was to incite a mob to go to the Capitol that ultimately led to uh, the January 6th insurrection um, that we are all so familiar with. After that, Trump was quickly impeached again. This time, 10 Republicans in the House joined, all the Democrats. And after he had left the White House, uh, he went on trial again in the Senate. Seven Republicans voted to convict him, but it was 10 short of the two thirds needed to ultimately convict him. A conviction, even though he was out of office, would have prevented him from running for office ever again. And it would have also prevented him from having a campaign committee and raising any money related to any kind of political elected office. And we can only imagine where we would be today if leader Mitch McConnell, who is no fan of Donald Trump's, had rallied nine more Republican senators along with himself to vote to convict Donald Trump. And I have a feeling that is something that leader McConnell will regret for the remainder of his days. As the Republicans 
especially in the House, uh, who many of whom had voiced opposition to what Trump did on January 6, slowly started to fall back under his spell. I realized that January 6 was really the beginning of the threats to our democracy. It was not the end. And that the effort to whitewash and to maintain the election denialism was an ongoing and grave threat to our electoral system and our democracy as we know it. And ultimately, about a year and a half after January 6th, when the New York lines were redrawn by a special master, and this district ended up uh, being a brand new district that did not have an incumbent, once again, I decided that I was gonna try to get back in the arena to do whatever I could to fight back against this threat to the rule of law and this threat to democracy. It was a whirlwind three-month primary. We had 12 candidates, uh, many, several elected officials of very high caliber. Um, and in the end, I squeaked it out when I won only 26% of the vote. And we should have another conversation about the fact that 26% of the vote can be enough to uh, elect you to Congress, but that's a different day. So all of a sudden, here I was, an elected official, nothing I had ever thought about doing. Um, and I was heading down to Washington to become a member of Congress to try to preserve and protect our democracy. And I guess I have to accept the fact that some people will now call me a politician. I wanted to go into this detail because it informs so much of what I am doing in Washington and so much of what we, the threats that we are facing right now. Before 2016, there was a basic respect for the rule of law and for our constitution. And there was an understanding that we were founded not only on judicial and legal ethics, but that our fundamental constitutional values of separation of powers, checks and balances, meant that every federal official understood that there was an important role for the other branches to play. And it was taken for granted in many respects, after Watergate, that these norms of legal and judicial ethics would rule the day, that they were understood, they were assumed to be the case. Many were not codified into law, but were policies and regulations that were adopted by, largely by the executive branch uh, to make sure that the laws were faithfully executed under the Constitution. I'll give you a couple of examples that now, in retrospect, seem somewhat quaint. The first, for example, is that the White House and the political um, appointees in, in the White House do not interfere in individual criminal cases. They were walled off from discussing any individual case, and there was a very, def there is a, was a very defined chain of command, so to speak of which people in the White House were allowed to speak to which people in the Department of Justice so that they were walled off from any potential political influence. Since then, um, another, sorry, another aspect um, that I don't think we thought much about until recent times was the intelligence community, whose sole purpose is to provide unvarnished and accurate information to the political decision makers to inform the decisions that they make about what is best for our country, what decisions our leaders make for the benefit of the United States. It also includes some, nor there, these norms also included the military, of course, which follows very detailed sets of rules of engagement uh, premised on international law and our own, on our own values, such that those in the military understand that they are not 
political operatives. They may take direction and orders from the commander in chief, who of course is elected, but those who represent the United States are following orders to the extent that those orders are lawful and constitutional. And then finally, we understood that the State Department was a apolitical institution. Diplomats in the State Department, in the Foreign Service, in the Civil Service, are charged with executing official foreign policy of the United States that is vetted through an assortment of different uh, executive branch officials and is always uniformly carried out without regard to partisan politics at home. For all of these career civil servants, and I was one for 10 years, it is a basic understanding and condition of the job that you leave your personal political views at the door. Prior to 2016, presidents and executive branch officials also operated under a common understanding that our democratic system of government depends on the separation of powers and the checks and balances that are inherent in our three branch democracy. This concept embedded in our constitution and it was well understood that taking the oath to faithfully execute the office of the president and to preserve, protect and defend the constitution included a recognition of Congress's important role in conducting oversight of the executive branch. But since 2016, many of these norms of separation of powers have been under assault. Much of this attack stems from what is called the unitary theory of government. And that is a theory that the president has the power to control every single aspect of the executive branch, even the traditionally apolitical and nonpartisan parts of it. This theory was pushed very aggressively by former Attorney General Bill Barr. And it essentially confers maximal authority to the President of the United States over every single decision, including criminal investigations, diplomacy, the military, or the intelligence community. And there are just a few examples of how the Trump administration interfered in our, uh, ex I should say, executed the unitary theory of government and undermine those norms that we have become so accustomed to. There was political interference in the criminal justice system. Some may remember Donald Trump asking FBI Director James Comey to decline to charge his ally, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Ultimately, Flynn was charged and pled guilty, but then Attorney General Barr remarkably intervened in an individual criminal case, unprecedented, uh, to try to dismiss the case altogether, prompting some of the line assistants, the line prosecutors like I was for 10 years, to withdraw from the case. Barr also overruled those line, his line prosecutors in the sentencing recommendation for Trump's political ally, Roger Stone, whose sentence then Trump commuted after Stone publicly made it clear that he had potentially incriminating information about Donald Trump. Four prosecutors, all four prosecutors on that case withdrew from the case. One resigned outright from the Department of Justice. Many of you will remember Special Counsel John Durham and his investigation, during which Attorney General Barr traveled with Durham to Italy several times to chase phantom leads of uh, corruption related to Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. Durham had so politicized his investigation prior to the 2020 election, and along with Barr and Trump, that his longtime deputy resigned because of this political interference. We also saw a lot of politicization of the intelligence community. One of the absolute sacred, sacred values in the intelligence community is to preserve the accuracy 
and the truth of intelligence that is collected. You can understand why. If, if you, we are providing secret information obtained through various sources that is to inform our government's decisions, if we are not accurately relaying that information, it will lead to potentially disastrous consequences and potentially horrific decisions. A president or a political appointee can choose to ignore the intelligence that they receive. But I saw during my 14 months with the House Intelligence Committee that political appointees altered the intelligence information that was collected by the intelligence community and tried to have even more information altered for their own political benefit. And it wasn't just a whistleblower complaint in the Ukraine impeachment. The political appointees can also selectively declassify information to have an impact on our political system as the former director of national intelligence, John Radcliffe, who was a Republican member of Congress during the Ukraine impeachment investigation did right before the 2020 election, when he released particular information uh, that was designed to mislead the public before the election. The politicization of the intelligence of our country is perhaps the most severe threat to the rule of law because it is unlikely to be uncovered due to its classified nature. Reporters can almost never, unless someone violates the law by giving them classified information, use their investigative reporting skills to uncover um, errors or problems within the intelligence community because all the information is classified. And so that is incredibly dangerous. Now, in addition to the internal understanding of how the executive branch works between the apolitical and the political aspects of it, Congress's authority to conduct oversight as part of its legislative responsibility has long been understood. And that includes oversight over the executive branch to ensure that the money appropriated by Congress is spent correctly and to do the proper and necessary investigations and oversight to inform future legislation. The Supreme Court has conferred upon Congress subpoena authority for matters that have a, quote, legitimate legislative purpose, unquote. That is a nexus to possible legislation or oversight that Congress engages in. And as you might imagine, this leads to frequent clashes between the Congress and the executive branch. But I'm not going to get into all of the detail, but over time, both branches have agreed in part affirmed by case law, affirmed by the Office of Legal Counsel, to negotiate what are their true needs in a effort to compromise uh, and to reach an understanding consistent with constitutional obligations. This is called the accommodations process, and it was well understood that this was how the executive branch and Congress dealt with congressional requests for information as part of the oversight authority for decades and decades. This process, though, only works if each branch recognizes the legitimate constitutional authority of the other. And until 2016, that was really not an issue. Now, since 2018, in particular, the deference to the separation of powers and constitutional authority of each branch has been significantly undermined. As I mentioned during the impeachment investigation, the Trump administration refused to comply with our subpoenas. And that was not the only occasion when they just defied all subpoenas. No accommodations process, just refused to give any information. Then in 2022, five Republican Congress uh, persons 
refused to comply with lawful congressional subpoenas from the January 6th committee, actually undermining, in many respects, their own authority to pay fealty to Donald Trump and for political purposes. So what we are left with is, right now, a congressional subpoena that is hardly worth the paper it's printed on. Yes, Congress can hold someone who defies a subpoena in contempt of Congress, but right now there are really only two options for enforcement. The first is criminal contempt, where it is referred to the Department of Justice for prosecution, which is very rare, although it has happened twice in recent years related to Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro in the January 6th committee. And then there's civil contempt, where you can try to enforce a subpoena through injunctive relief in court, um, which, as we saw, takes an incredibly long time and almost defeats the purpose altogether. Now, there used to be a third method to uh, hold someone in contempt when there was a jail in the bottom of the Capitol and the Capitol Police would go and get people and hold them in jail until they were willing to comply. Uh, that jail is not functioning and that option is no longer available, although some may argue we should bring it back. Challenges to these notions of separation of power are not the only aspect that has been truly put to the test because we've also been forced to deal with a seemingly unprecedented number of lawyers who absolutely violate their ethical obligations under their bar licenses. As you all know, and Jessica's ethics uh, center certainly preaches, lawyers are prohibited from lying or knowingly causing lies to be submitted or made in court. But following the November 2020 election, and really ever since, lawyers connected to the effort to overturn that election have flouted ethical, legal, uh, ethical obligations and lied to the public in shocking fashion. The list of lawyers who have either been criminally charged or subject to bar discipline is too long to go through right now. But my, uh, my excellent senior counsel went, did go through and identified 24 different lawyers connected to Donald Trump or the 2020 election who have either been criminally charged, referred for disciplinary action to the state bar, or sanctioned by a court. The most noteworthy, of course, is Rudy Giuliani, who is now criminally charged in Atlanta for trying to fraudulently overturn the election, has been disbarred in New York, is subject to disciplinary proceedings in front of the DC bar, and is also uh, the subject of a defamation judgment against him by Georgia election workers who he falsely accused publicly of engaging in misconduct. Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell, two other well-known lawyers uh, connected to Donald Trump, have pled guilty to knowingly violating election laws by making false representations. Other charged defendants include John Eastman, the architect of the scheme to persuade Mike Pence to overturn the election, Ken Cheeseboro, the architect of the fake elector scheme, and Jeffrey Clark, that assistant attorney general who prepared that false letter to be sent to the Georgia legislature. Without going into the details of the ongoing matters, I want to simply say this. Not all of these lawyers are bad people who set out to do bad things, but they all felt themselves being pushed and pressured into a rabbit hole. And the question that they faced, every single one of them, was are you going to continue down this questionable pathway or are you going to hold firm to your own ethical values and obligations and do the right thing? Lawyers are faced with these questions every day. And as the old saying goes, it can take a lifetime to build a reputation and a minute to destroy one. So for all you students who are gonna become lawyers and are gonna pass the bar, and you will pass the bar, remember that you have a higher obligation to the court and to the bar that you do to any individual client. 
Now I want to focus last on the third branch of government, the judiciary, which, as I mentioned, really did hold the line in 2020. Judges stood up for the rule of law, insisted on following the law, requiring evidence, and ruled based on the facts and evidence or lack thereof. But since then, we have seen the Supreme Court take us in a very, very different and dangerous direction. The ethical violations, the disclosure violations, and the blatant violations prohibiting conflicts of interest on the Supreme Court alone has undermined the credibility of the entire judiciary branch in deeply concerning ways. Now, there are very legitimate arguments to be made that the Republicans have used dirty tricks and improper methods to effectively pack the court with very conservative justices by not allowing Merrick Garland to have a hearing for over nine months and then rushing Amy Coney Barrett through the confirmation process in a matter of weeks before the 2020 election. There's a very good argument that they are, this is not a legitimate way to go about appointing Supreme Court judges. Now, many in my party have called for a bill, the Judiciary Act, that would expand the court by four justices. This was actually introduced uh, shortly after the 2020 election in order to push back against what was viewed as um, truly inappropriate conduct in the advice and consent process in the Senate. But I have not supported this legislation, notwithstanding its popularity within my party. And the reason is because I truly believe that if we are going to add justices in a way that seemingly responds to court decisions that we don't like, we are going to truly undermine permanently the credibility of the Supreme Court at a time when we need to be doing everything that we possibly can to bolster and support our democratic institutions. But the Supreme Court seems to be doing just fine on its own in undermining its credibility. It is one thing to ram through conservative loyalists into the court, but it is altogether something totally different to discard centuries of legal practice and precedent for purely political ideological objectives. Now, there are six conservatives on the court. Three were appointed by Trump and two who just seem to operate in their own extreme right world. And over the last couple of years, this court has simply ignored the fundamental concept of stare decisis, which as every law student knows, is the basic principle that our entire legal system depends on. Without stare decisis, every new justice, and soon lower court judges too, will simply ignore precedent if they don't agree with it and will reverse settled law. And nothing will then be settled anymore. We, of course, saw this in its most shocking form in the Dobbs opinion, which overturned Roe v. Wade and was so clearly an immediate outgrowth of Donald Trump's effort to pack the court. But it could only happen based on the justice's willingness to simply ignore settled precedent, which was settled precedent that they all acknowledged during their confirmation hearings. But that's not the only case. And if that were the only case, I think we might have a, a different conversation, as egregious as it is. Let's take the Bruin case, which was a, a gun safety case related to a New York law. Its opinion was so arcane, relying on some absurd notion of originalism, going back to what guns were available in 1789, that it is impossible to implement. And it has had a unexpected trickle-down impact on so many gun cases 
uh, and so much gun legislation throughout the country. The recent Colorado ballot case, where Colorado uh, prohibited Donald Trump from being on the ballot. Now, the Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing to say that that was not proper. And the rationale that they all agreed to is that it is not reasonable, not constitutional for one state to make a decision to take a federal candidate off of a federal, a federal ballot. And we can disagree about it, but I certainly understand the rationale. That should have been it. That was the case that was presented to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court is supposed to decide cases on the narrowest rationale that they can. They need to have an actual case or controversy in front of it to decide it, and they did that based on that rationale. But that was not enough for the majority. They went ahead, and even though it was not at issue in this case, they went into great detail about how Article 3, or Clause 3 of the 14th Amendment must be implemented through a congressional legislation and all sorts of other detail. This goes to the heart of what the Supreme Court's jurisdiction is. And it is not the only case where conservatives who used to use a very, very restrictive version of standing have thrown that out the window and are now ruling on any case regardless of whether they're standing or not. The, uh, the, the um, Colorado uh, Baker case um, is, a, is a great example. There wasn't actually anyone who was harmed by the law, but the Supreme Court didn't care and they just decided it. So when we combine the partisan politics of putting ideological judges on the court with those justices' willingness to ignore settled precedent and to overreach to decide matters that are not squarely in front of them, we see why polls show that the Supreme Court's credibility is at its lowest point ever. Now, if that were it, we would just have a significant problem that we need to deal with, but something that we can get our hands around. But it's not. The crisis at this court is far more serious than just the politicized substance of the rulings. Supreme Court justices, and on both sides of the coin, but as we will see most egregiously by two justices in particular, have flouted the basic rules of ethics and disclosure obligations in egregious fashion. Judges on the district courts and the circuit courts are bound by a judicial code of ethics, which sets forth very detailed restrictions and disclosure obligations that are enforceable by the judicial conference. The Supreme Court is not bound by that judicial code of ethics and they don't have a binding code of ethics at all. The justices are expected to individually adhere to a set of ethical mores without any enforcement mechanism or any accountability provision. And what we have learned over the past couple years is that even though Chief Justice Roberts says that the court can police itself, it simply does not. Let's just take a look at a couple of these examples. Now, on one side, in 2021, Justice Sotomayor amended her 2016 financial disclosures to include six free trips to American universities that she had not included. It's noteworthy that none of those trips had any connection to any cases that were in front of her. But the disclosure violations by Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito are of an entirely different category. Let's start with Justice Thomas. A conservative benefactor named Harlan Crow, as well as several other billionaires, 
have provided Clarence Thomas with 38 destination vacations, including a yacht trip around the Bahamas, a nine-day Indonesian excursion on a different yacht, 26 flights on private jets, plus an additional eight flights on helicopters, VIP passes to sporting events, stays at luxury resorts, amounts to millions of dollars, none of which was disclosed by Justice Thomas. Harlan Crow also purchased a string of properties owned by Clarence Thomas, then renovated them, and now allows Clarence Thomas's mother to live there rent free. Harlan Crow has paid more than $100,000 for tuition of Clarence Thomas's grandnephew, uh, who is actually the, for whom he's the legal guardian, to attend a private boarding school. Justice Thomas has received a $267,000 loan uh, on an RV from an individual that he has not re ever repaid because a longtime friend and benefactor bought out the loan from him. He's also accepted gifts valued in the hundreds of thousands of dollars from Harlan Crow and other benefactors. Harlan Crow also made a $500,000 do donation to a Tea Party group founded by Clarence Thomas's wife, which paid her $120,000 salary. Unlike Justice Sotomayor, Harlan Crow has had business in front of the court. In January of 20, 2005, the court declined to hear an appeal from an architecture firm that wanted more than $25 million from Harlan Crow's company, which was at the time accused of allegedly misusing copyrighted building designs. There was a one sentence order denying the petition and there were no recusals. Justice Thomas's wife has also received backroom uh, money channeled through uh, the side door, so to speak, from Leonard Leo, who many of you know as the former head of the Federalist Society and the architect of the right wing, um, the, the right wing effort to overtake our, our Supreme Court. Leo arranged for Ginny Thomas to be paid $80,000 in fees from something called the Judicial Education Project, which is an organization that has had a number of cases in front of the court. When Leo was making sure that that money went to Ginny Thomas through political consultant Kellyanne Conway, he said that the paperwork should contain, quote, no mention of Ginny, of course. Now, Justice Alito has also received numerous benefits that are far, far more than uh, what any judge would be able to receive if you were on the lower courts. I'm not going to go through all of them because you get the point. But it gets worse. And this is really what I want to focus on for a second here. Justice Thomas has blatantly flouted conflicts of interest rules by failing to recuse in cases, in, in cases where his wife was involved in the underlying conduct. Now, the first time we learned about Ginny Thomas's role in the 20, 2020 election and the effort to overturn it was in a case involving Mark Meadows that went before the Supreme Court, ultimately ruled in favor of Congress getting documents from Mark Meadows, and in those documents were text messages with Jenny Thomas that revealed she was involved in this effort in some way. I, no one is accusing her of committing any crimes, but she was involved in the underlying facts. About a year later, a case involving John Eastman got to the Supreme Court, which also involved some of the underlying facts related to uh, January 6th and the effort to overturn the election. Clarence Thomas recused himself. 
we thought he had learned from the Meadows case that his wife was involved in the underlying conduct and that is an actual conflict of interest. It's not an appearance of a conflict of interest, it's an actual conflict of interest and he recused himself. Recently, however, in two cases involving the same underlying conduct related to the effort to overturn the election in which Justice Thomas's wife was involved Justice Thomas did not recuse himself. He has seemingly acknowledged, based on the Eastman case himself, that he should have and that he must. But in this case, the Colorado ballot case, and then the uh, criminal absolute immunity case that's coming before the court where he did not recuse himself, he has decided to participate in cases involving his own wife. This is unconscionable and it is unacceptable. So as I conclude, I I want to emphasize a couple of different things because um, I think we could all go into a deep depression after hearing uh, the litany of issues that we're we're facing. But I do think that there's some hope and there's some actions that we can all take. First, Congress must act. And there are a number of bills that have been introduced uh, that would address many of these issues. Some would address separation of powers to expedite enforcement of congressional subpoenas. Um, some might, would address uh, contempt of Congress to potentially add a fine to someone who defies a congressional subpoena. And we need to pass laws that confer robust oversight and direct instructions to executive branch employees about how to execute their apolitical roles. What we are facing if Donald Trump wins the election in November is his openly discussed effort to completely eliminate the apolitical nonpartisan jobs in the executive branch. It does not get as much attention as some of the other things, but I promise you it is a grave, grave threat to the government as we know it. With, as it relates to the judiciary, we must act to bolster the credibility of the court. There must be a binding code of ethics on the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court will not do it itself, then it is incumbent upon Congress to do it. There are several different bills that are designed to reform the Supreme Court from term limits um, to uh, what's called the Judicial Integrity Act that I am a co-sponsor of, which would apply the same conflict of interest provisions that exist with the executive branch officials to the judiciary as well. And then I will shortly be introducing a bill to create an independent investigative body at the Supreme Court with an enforcement and accountability mechanism, as well as an office of ethics that is designed to oversee the disclosure obligations of the Supreme Court justices and to ensure that they are disclosing everything that they should disclose so that the public can know whether or not we have Uh, ethically challenged or compromised justices. The legal profession has a role too. And it is essential that lawyers not only stand up for ethics and the law, but the bar associations also have to consider to what extent lying in public should be included with ethical obligations that right now exist only as it relates to lying in court. But ultimately, it is up to we the people. We the people of this country, of our democracy, must rise up, speak out, activate to preserve our democracy. The ultimate source of accountability remains the ballot box. So as I sum up, I have a call to action. We are facing a stress test on our democracy like nothing else since the Civil War. Our institutions are under attack, 
our basic notions of the rule of law and separation of powers are wavering, and the credibility of the Supreme Court is at an all-time low. We have a choice to make. We can either bury our heads under the pillow and just hope it all goes away, or we can motivate, we can activate, and we can engage like never before. You don't have to run for elected office. You just have to do one more thing than you've ever done before. If everybody does one more thing, we will save our democracy. You can speak out, you can write articles, you can support good government educations, you can bring someone to vote, you can talk to your family and friends. There is a five alarm fire and we all have to be the firefighters. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Ben Franklin's famous quote shortly after the Constitutional Convention in 1787. He was asked, quote, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? And he responded, a republic, if you can keep it. It's on all of us to keep it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman Goldman. Um, that was a stirring call to action. And you could be on any of the three panels we're having today. And it's extraordinary to have somebody as a keynote speaker who truly could be on any of the panels discussing the specific topics, but gave us such a wonderful background on what's at stake and a call to action. So thank you so much. We are lucky to have you in Congress. My name's Michael Hertz. I'm a longtime uh, Cardozo professor, and it's my delightful pleasure to moderate this first panel. We'll be kind of picking up where the congressman left off, talking about the Supreme Court. Um, we, uh, the, the title of this conference uh, asks, you know, are we in crisis? Um, the congressman has an answer. Um, and I think that, you know, you can pretty much assume that as a group, the organizers and many of the panelists think the answer is yes, that we're not just going to spend a day saying, eh, nah, it's good, we're good. Um, but we do want to spend a little time trying to answer that question. And then, of course, the, uh, uh, there's an obvious follow-up is, so what do we, what do, we do, with, do about it? And the themes that the congressman sounded, I think, will we'll run through all three panels, and, and certainly this one. Um, we are going to take a sort of informal approach. Um, not the straight traditional academic uh, paper presentations, but more of an informal discussion. And we'll plan to go for maybe 45 minutes among the, among the three panelists, um, and, then, and then some time for question and answers. We're scheduled to stop at 11.45. Since we've gone a little over, maybe we'll go till noon or so, but not longer than that. Um, let me just quickly introduce uh, our, our three uh, panelists. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, um, I just say that all of them may be familiar to you because they keep showing up in the news or on television or one thing or another. Um, these, are, these are all kind of go-to sources for people writing about the issues we're discussing. Um, uh, in alphabetical order, uh, Melissa Murray, immediately to my left, is the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at NYU. She, to NYU from Berkeley, where she started her teaching career and was interim dean at Berkeley for a year. She writes mainly about constitutional law and, and family law, um, <clears throat> widely published, um, uh, including most recently a great big article in the Harvard Law Review. Um, she also is becoming more and more a very visible public figure. Um, if you look at the New York Times bestseller list, you will find right at the top of the nonfiction uh, list a, a volume called The Trump Indictments, which, are, which consists of exactly what the title says it is, but with, with a wonderful introduction and annotation by Professor Murray and, and her NYU colleague, Andrew Weissman. And she's probably best known as, as the co-host of the podcast Strict Scrutiny, along with Leah Littman of, of Michigan. And... Um, uh, Get the third. <laughs> uh, I'm going to see her in a few minutes. Oh, this is sure very uh, yeah. She's dead to us. <laughs> uh, no, the, the third, of course, is my friend and co-author and alas, former colleague Kate Shaw, who now teaches at the Penn Law School. 
And, and Professor Murray just mentioned that she will, has to go straight from this event to Times Square. For what exactly? The podcast is getting a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The rest of you have to stay. You can go look at the billboard <laughs> later, OK? Um, uh, Richard Painter uh, is the S. Walter Ritchie Professor of Corporate Law at the University of Minnesota. His expertise is both in securities litigation and in a, a wide range of, of professional responsibility issues. Uh, he taught at the University of Oregon, at the University of Illinois, and then served in the uh, second Bush administration uh, in the White House Counsel's Office as the chief ethics attorney um, from 2005 to 2007. Um, I think we could say the Trump candidacy and presidency made Professor Painter famous. In 2016, he became very visible as a, as a commenter on and harsh critic of Trump's ethical lapses, been a key player in, in CREW, the, the uh, uh, Committee for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, um, and, uh, and has written a book called American Nero, The History of the Destruction of the Rule of Law and Why Trump is the Worst Offender. Um, and James Sample is on the faculty of the Hofstra Law School, where he teaches con law, civ pro, fed courts, ad law. Um, before joining the Hofstra faculty about 15 years ago, he was an attorney at the Brennan Center uh, at NYU doing in the Democracy Project. Um, he has particular expertise on questions of judicial recusal, uh, has an article tracing the history of, of judicial recusal over the centuries, and is co-author of a treatise called Judicial Conduct and Ethics. Um, Professor Sample is also, I think, the only panelist on this panel and probably the whole day who has won three Emmy Awards. Uh, I'm sure several have one or two, but he has three, um, all garnered while director and producer at NBC Sports before he went to law school. So that is our distinguished panel. And <clears throat> I want to start uh, the conversation by you know, turning to the basic question of the, of the conference. You know, are, are we in in crisis, I say that Donald Trump, of course, has taught us many things, um, mainly what not to say or do and how not to act. But one of the things that he does all the time that drives me crazy is announce that something is unprecedented, right? You've never seen anything like that. We've never seen this. Or you're going to see something like you've never seen. This is, this is completely unlike anything we've ever seen before. And there is a kind of presentism about um, a lot of political slash uh, social issues um, that it feels new and maybe unprecedented and unusually serious. And I think the thrust of the congressman's, congressman's remarks was that we are in such a moment. And I just want to start by asking, you know, how bad is it? Is this a real crisis? Is it unprecedented? You know, what's, what's the state of the play? And maybe, James, because you've written about the history of these issues, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, thank you, and, th and it's a privilege to be here. I don't think it's unprecedented, and I think that one of the starting points for that analysis would be to go back to Marbury itself, right? There's basically never been a justice in a case who was as conflicted as John Marshall was in Marbury v. Madison. Uh, you know, we're talking about the outgoing Secretary of State, who was also the incoming Chief Justice, whose task it was to deliver the commissions at issue, whose own brother, Jay, and, and to the extent that a ball was dropped, he's guilty of the fumble. His own brother James is in the same general position as William Marbury, who's filed the writ before the court. Uh, and Marshall finds a way to rule in a manner that is maximizing of his own power. Uh, there have been many instances through the years and through the decades and centuries since then, but this has always been an issue. I think that maybe to the extent that there is something unprecedented about our current situation, it is specific to one justice. And I think Congressman Goldman 
alluded to this, and uh, he lumped Justice Alito in with Justice Thomas, and I think that's a defensible thing to do. Uh, but realistically, I think we have two categories of justices on the court right now. We have eight justices who are more or less in within a margin of error relative to American jurisprudential history. And we have one individual who is a one man syndicate of illegality and unconscionable behavior. Um, and that is unprecedented. And so I think that to a certain extent, we are witnessing a moment in time where ethics and laws are not so much the, the, the problem as an erosion of norm, uh, which is to say that we've had through the years massive conflicts of interest by members of the Supreme Court, perhaps most notably Abe Fortas, uh, who gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar to the extent of taking thousands of dollars in payments by an individual who was facing an insider trading uh, case while Fortas is on the court. But what is radically different, and I agree with Professor Hertz that you know, Trump is m many things, but one thing he is, he is the superlative user of superlatives. Uh, Fortas, who's appointed by LBJ, gets caught in this unethical behavior and decides, though he's a close friend of LBJ's, who again appointed him, to resign despite the fact that Richard Nixon is the president when, when Fortas decides to resign. Which is to say, if you're to go with a comparison and contrast point, imagine for the sake of argument, Clarence Thomas resigning while Barack Obama was president or Joe Biden was president because he got caught doing something that in today's world would be a news cycle of what, 72 hours? That's where I think we're different. Other comments about the time? So I, I think that's really terrific context to add to this. And I also was thinking of Marbury versus Madison, where you know judicial review is created amidst a tangle of various connections that would prompt ethical quandaries. Um, you also did not mention that. Marshall and Jefferson, the president with whom he's in this antagonistic relationship, are also cousins and, and have hated each other for a long time. Um, so, so there's a lot there. It's also worth thinking about the court during World War II. I mean, we have we've seen situations in which there have been entanglements between the court and certainly the other branches of government um, during World War II. Many of the justices were appointed by FDR, who had famously threatened to pack the court. He ultimately never won on his court packing scheme, but he eventually had enough vacancies to fill that he essentially packed the court with his preferred justices. And they knew that he was their guy. Um, Cliff Sloan's book, The Court at War, details this really fantastically. But they essentially knew that they were there to do the bidding of the Roosevelt administration. One justice actually makes an appointment with FDR at one point in time at the beginning of his tenure on the court to discuss the president's plans for him in the seat. And FDR has lunch with him and ostensibly tells him what his hopes and aspirations are for this justice during his tenure on the court. And then when FDR passes away and is um, succeeded by Harry Truman, the same justice notes that he feels relief that he can now be independent. So it's not the case that we have never been in a situation where the court has faced ethical quandaries. I think what makes this particular moment feel magnified or amplified in some degree is that these ethical lapses are coincident to real questions about the court's decision-making and whether or not the court's decision-making is animated by neutral or objective principles, or rather is driven by ideologically predetermined outcomes. One of the things, I mean, <clears throat> Professor Murray pointed out to me in a note, you know, at the State of the Union, there was this very awkward moment where President Biden sort of directly confronts the six justices who were in the room and, um, you know, query whether the whole exchange or the very presence of the court at this utterly political event is itself and raises ethical issues. Uh, but um, he said nothing about ethics, right? He talked about Dobbs. And, you know, that may just be that 
especially, at least for elected officials, ethical considerations are always gonna be secondary to preferred outcomes, right? Outcomes are really what matter at the, at the, at the end of the day. When you say, okay, you know, there's, there's this suspicion about, you know, it's an ideological court, um, are the ethical consideration, are the, are the ethical objections secondary to, you know, you put it as neutrally as possible, that it's a, you know, concerns about methodology somehow that are coupled with ethics, or is it just people are using ethics because they're upset about outcomes? Richard? Well, uh, there is a tendency to uh, criticize the ethics of people you disagree with. Uh, I've certainly seen a lot of that. Uh, having uh, served in uh, President Bush's administration, uh, and uh, of course it was very popular to criticize the ethics of Democrats, uh, but if you had questions about torture memos, nobody really wanted to uh, talk about it. Uh, and we are, have gotten used to the idea that all of law is somehow political. Uh, and that everything boils down to politics. Uh, and uh, this is a very dangerous assumption. Uh, there was the uh, German uh, legal philosopher Karl Schmidt who wrote about the concept of the political and how law boils down to politics. And I know that he's popular with the far left too these days, uh, but uh, that was a very dangerous road for Germany as they found out in 1933 when Schmidt joined the Nazi party. Uh, law is not just politics. Uh, po their, uh, politics does shape law, but we also have uh, right and wrong. We have ethics rules, and that was a message I tried to make clear in the Bush administration when I was the chief White House ethics lawyer, uh, that just because somebody did something in the Clinton administration didn't make it right, uh, that also uh, we, we need to be consistent uh, as to what the ethics rules are. Uh, let's talk about disclosure of uh, free trips by judges. Uh, I discussed that uh, with uh, Judge Alito and Judge Roberts who were being considered for the United States Supreme Court and their financial disclosure forms. I mean, the rules are what they are. And you gotta disclose all the free trips. So I said, gee, are there any of these free trips at George Mason Law School? That's the stuff I was worried about. Absolutely not. Uh, because if you went on a free trip and it's not on this form, Senator Kennedy, uh, this is Kennedy of Massachusetts, um, is gonna come after you. Uh, not the fellow from Louisiana, I can talk about him later. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, you better, you better figure it out and make sure these forms are right, and they were. And uh, we had people being considered for the U.S. Supreme Court who didn't disclose uh, conflicts of interest or some of their financial holdings or who participated in cases uh, where they uh, owned some stock in a parent company. Uh, and uh, those... Uh, uh, candidates for the Supreme Court would not advance because you know you're going to get heat in the Senate in the confirmation process. Now the problem is lifetime tenure. I'm not going to complain about lifetime tenure. I have it with the university. It's a very nice situation. But uh, once they get on the court, uh, I guess there's a different attitude toward everything. Uh, they don't have to worry about the uh, United States Senate in the House because they don't have to show up and testify. The Chief Justice can basically tell uh, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, he just doesn't feel like showing up. Uh, so they can do what they want. And uh, I think uh, the, you're right, Justice Thomas in particular has, um, has multiple ethics violations. And this shouldn't be about partisan politics. We should have the courage to stand up for right and wrong, just as Senator Mondale of Minnesota did when Abe Fortas uh, had his scandal there back in 69. And Senator Mondale, liberal Democrat, was one of the first to say he needs to go. Uh, and this had nothing to do with it. Ethics should have nothing to do with partisan politics, or whether you agree with Da or any of these cases. Uh, it, it, that's not the issue. Uh, are we going to play by the rules or are we not? And we're going to hold both sides accountable. Uh, and I think there's a deterioration uh, in Washington uh, when ethics is uh, politicized. Uh, in the way it has been. I'm not sure that in this circumstance that the ethics have been politicized, that, that is that people are concerned about the ethics because and only because they disagree with the court's decision. That's, but I do think they're related and it's worth sort of disaggregating why they are related. You know, One, I don't think we right now understand the court to be 
a neutral entity. And that is largely because the court has been irredeemably politicized. Um, this goes back to 2016 with Mitch McConnell holding the empty seat that arose because of Justice Scalia's unexpected death, um, not allowing that seat to be filled until after the election, um, making the seat itself a focus of electoral politics. Um, then fast forwarding to the fact that you get a conservative six to three supermajority on the court because of another vacancy and suddenly long settled precedents that had just as recently as a year earlier had been decided by the court are now up for grabs again. All of that makes it look like the court is politicized. The fact that you cannot accomplish certain domestic policy objectives through majoritarian processes like the Affordable Care Act. Donald Trump ran on repealing the Affordable Care Act. He was unable to do so through Congress. Um, John McCain famously voted thumbs down on that. The first thing that they do then is run to a district court in Texas to file a lawsuit to challenge the ACA in such a way that it would effectively be repealed, using the courts, a minoritarian institution, to effectively accomplish what can't be accomplished through majoritarian politics. I think all of that gives the impression that the courts are politicized, the court's decisions are ones that I think inherently arrogate decision making power to itself at the expense of other institutions. And then on top of it, as the court is politicized, and we all seem to understand that, the court is accruing power to itself, and we all seem to understand that, then it comes out that the justices are not necessarily playing by the same rules as everybody else. And in fact, it looks like some of them are in the bag for some of the interests that their decisions actually favor. And I think it is that perfect storm of occurrences that have led us to where we are. So it's not one single thing, but rather the confluence of all of these things. And each of them independently, I think, would be troubling and problematic. But it is all of them in tandem that I think makes it feel like this is a particular crisis that is especially profound. I want to ask James to comment, but I'll just beforehand just say, assuming you're right, it does make a solution very challenging. In other words, it means you cannot solve the problem by, say, a new ethics code and nothing else. James. Well, that's all very, very well said. And, and to Richard's point about partisan politics and, and the disaggregation aspect, I mean, I'll be, I'll put my priors on the table. I am thrilled that the Affordable Care Act became the law. Uh, and it became the law by a five to four, and it, it was upheld rather by a five to four vote in the Supreme Court that frankly is a travesty. Uh, not the decision, but Justice Elena Kagan's participation in that decision, uh, which is to say, I think that there is absolutely abundant reason for us to be focused in particular on one or two justices because of the egregiousness, frequency, regularity, severity, whatever adjectives you want to throw in there of the particular violations, especially when it comes to issues of disclosure and especially when it comes to issues specific to his spouse, Ginny Thomas. But let's be clear, Elena Kagan goes from the Solicitor General's office when while she's Solicitor General, and the Affordable Care Act is passing narrowly, the famous John McCain moment in the Senate where with the thumb, right? And she writes to Larry Tribe, her former colleague at Harvard Law School, I hear they have the votes, Larry, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation point. This is, this is wonderful. Then she's on other emails with Neil Katyal and Brian Houck, also in the Solicitor General's office, preparing the strategy and, and formulating meetings and setting up plans for the defense of the very law that she then casts a vote in the five member majority to uphold. So set the priors aside. I'm thrilled that people have access to Obamacare, but that's problematic in many of the same ways that Justice Thomas uh, transgressions are. One of the things that's politicized is the White House, right? <clears throat> but the White House, as an ethics lawyer and a sort of strict set of rules, they've ebbed and flowed a little bit, right? They tend to change a bit from administration to administration. Is it that the, you know, and, and we, but there's less of a sense that there's a crisis. Is it because we cut the 
the White House more slack? Or is it because the White House actually has stricter rules than the courts do? Well, the White House, strict ethics rules. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on about that. Um, well, in some area, it depends, of course, on the White House. Uh, and uh, with respect to President Bush, uh, I made it very clear when I interviewed for the job that I was concerned about what I was hearing about interrogation of uh, detainees. I was just coming out because I, I didn't uh, go into the White House until 2005, but someone was coming out. And they said, oh, we're handling that over at the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense. Uh, it's highly classified. The ethics lawyer doesn't need to deal with that. Oh, um, well, I got to read about that in the New York Times. Uh, you know, I had a lot of financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I think that we did a pretty good job on that. Uh, but I have to say that the environment in the White House is extremely political. Uh, and whenever I would criticize uh, policies from an ethics perspective, uh, including what was going on, what was coming out in the papers, on um, the detention of the, and the interrogation of detainees, uh, there was uh, a lot of pushback. And all I got, of course, was what I, was out of the Times. They wouldn't get, uh, show me the classified information. Um, the White House is always going to be a political environment. Uh, I have urged in my 2008 book uh, with Oxford University Press, my book on getting the government of America deserves, I urged that there be an inspector general in the White House. Uh, but uh, nobody else, particularly the White House, does not seem to be enthusiastic about that idea. I've also urged an inspector general in the United States Supreme Court in the forthcoming Law Review article. I don't think they're enthusiastic about that either. Uh, but we really need to depoliticize at least ethics. Everything's made political in the White House, but the ethics issues shouldn't be political. And I discussed a lot of this with uh, my successor in the Obama administration, Norman Eisen, and I've worked a lot with him on ethics issues. And uh, I think it's critically important uh, that the, the White House Ethics Office adhere to the same rules as a Democratic or Republican administration. Whether that's happening or not, I won't comment further. <laughs> So we can't kind of explore normatively exactly what all the rules should be, but there's one idea that floats around, and it, it was floating around back when Fortis and Douglas were in trouble, which is there ought to be a single government ethics code, and the same rules should apply to the courts, Congress, and the executive branch. I'd like to ask any or all of you whether that approach, forgetting the, what the details would be, whether that approach makes sense or whether we should really think about the different branches is presenting different issues and having different set of rules. Anybody? <laughs> well, I don't know that I have the gestalt answer to that, but there are aspects of our laws that are that do operate in that way, including the Ethics in Government Act of 1978 and the follow-up to that in 1989, which is essentially, and, and Richard probably knows this area better than any of us, uh, it's essentially the disclosure law for officers of the federal government, and it includes members of the judiciary and specifically um, justices of the Supreme Court. The, the, and the reality is that that particular law is enforced against members of the government in every single aspect of the government, including the judiciary, save for one entity, the entity of nine individuals where no matter the severity of the violation, Enforcement, I mean, there have been periods of time where Justice Thomas failed to disclose things. The Los Angeles Times revealed back in about 15 years ago, a series of non-disclosures. And this was during a period of time where Justice Thomas was disclosing some things. So his solution based on the LA Times investigation was to, dis to stop disclosing anything. Um, which is to say, I do think that in terms of the gestalt question that Michael's asking, I think there are different considerations in a constituent branch, right? The legislative branch and the executive branch, you're representing a constituency, whereas in the judiciary, the constituency really is or should be the rule of law, it should be due process, and there are some different considerations. But there are aspects of our laws that do apply across the branches. And the problem is really that we're not enforcing even those laws as applied to one particular entity. Let me give you an example of that on the disclosure laws. Everybody knows the rules on private jet travel. I went 
over them over and over with the White House staff, and yes, discussed it with both Supreme Court uh, nominees. Uh, the rule is clear that you are not supposed to be taking free rides on private planes, and that Justice Alito's empty seat theory doesn't fly, that there's just an empty seat, so it didn't cost anybody anything. Uh, you can't do that, and we uh, emphasize this point over and over again about the airplane trips. There's one narrow exception, as a personal friend wants to give you a gift of free travel, you may be able to take it from the personal friend. And then guess what? It goes on your disclosure form. The personal friend, it, it, there's no exception to disclosure of the free travel. And no, it's not personal hospitality. Personal hospitality is I invite someone over to my house for dinner. It's not I fly them on my jet or my yacht. Not that I have a jet or a yacht. <laughs> uh, that, that goes on the disclosure form. This is open and shut. It was not ambiguous. I don't care what the Administrative Office of the United States Courts wants to say. Everybody knows the rules. The same rule applies across all three branches of government. And I am very shocked and saddened that we have justices of the court who interpret the law binding on all the rest of us who can't figure that out. The law is what the law is. And it should have been on the disclosure form. And I, Justice Alito messed up once. I they just wish he had said, I messed up. It should have been on there, rather than writing this thing in the Wall Street Journal trying to wiggle his way around it. Justice Thomas, I mean, he's beyond redemption. <laughs> so the question you asked earlier, um, given how inextricably intertwined all of these different issues are, the politicization of the court, um, the distaste that many have for some of its decisions, and then the questions of ethics, would an ethics code or any kind of accountability on the ethics question even make a difference? Um, obviously, an ethics code is not going to make a difference for the question of whether the public views the court as irredeemably politicized. But I think it helps for exactly the reason that Richard suggests. Um, it doesn't sit well with the rank and file public to watch as rights are whittled away or protections that they had taken a sacrosanct are reconsidered or you know the entire system of the administrative state is being just renegotiated before their very eyes it doesn't sit well to watch that happen while you see the people who make the rules not playing by the ordinary rules that everyone else has to comport with and so i think this is a big reason why the ethics code the ethics ish code um the ethics adjacent code was <laughs> not especially satisfying for many. I mean, and, and again, I don't think it helped the court to issue what essentially was a codification of their ability to kind of just decide to pick and choose what they would adhere to and what they would dismiss. And I do think that they should abide by the general principles. I mean, the things Richard is talking about are very simple. I mean. I have to disclose on a tenure letter whether I know the person, whether we have any kind of relationship. Like, it can't be that hard to say, yes, I have friends. Sometimes they're billionaires. Sometimes they pay for my mother's house. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> you can disclose that and, you know, let the chips fall away. I mean, like, again, it wasn't the fact of the largesse, although that's certainly the problem. A lot of people were just sort of like, why isn't it disclosed? You're picking and choosing what you're disclosing and for an institution already shrouded in a lot of secrecy but yet at the center of making decisions for so many the lack of transparency around their behavior i think is the most concerning so richard and james would you agree so just this i assume everyone knows in last november the supreme court did for the first time officially issue a ethics code for itself um, and there, there are a lot of objections both to its scope and more importantly to its enforceability or non-enforceability. Um, and uh, um, would the two of you agree it just was fell so short as to be meaningless? I don't want to put words in your mouth, Melissa, but you came no, that's, close to that's, saying that. That's, that's right. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there's no enforcement mechanism. There's no, there's not the inspector general that I've called for. Of course, I think Congress might have to do that, but no other enforcement mechanism. 
Uh, we have enforcement mechanisms for the judges in, uh, in the lower courts, federal courts, but not for the Supreme Court. Uh, so it's fine for them to uh, say they've got an ethics code. Uh, but it, uh, as I said in my uh, law review article coming out with Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics, is like a fraternity house uh, with, it says it's got a bunch of rules and there's no college dean uh, to enforce the rules. Uh, and then on top of that, we've had some justices say that Congress constitutionally cannot impose rules on the court, that the court, uh, separation of powers, requires that the court can do anything it wants. A very similar argument to the argument that Donald Trump is making right now before the court about the presidency, that the president can violate criminal statutes and is immune from prosecution. Uh, so are we going to have a court that can do anything it wants with no checks and balances from the other two branches of government, a president who can do anything he wants, including commit crimes with immunity from prosecution even after leaving office, and then, well, then there's Congress, and they're too busy trading stocks to uh, figure it all out. <laughs> it's tough to follow. Uh, <laughs> So I, I think we could approach this from the standpoint of maybe the, the kind of spin room perspective. So if you want to take a if you want to put a positive spin on what the court did in November of last year, I think the positive spin is this, that it is a meaningful delta relative to where Chief Justice Roberts was a little over a decade ago. So in 2011, that year, as every year, the Chief Justice gives a state of the judiciary address that's embargoed for release on the last day of the year and that Adam Liptak reports on the next day in the New York Times. That year, John Roberts took the bulk of his state of the judiciary address to say in a, no uncertain terms that the court absolutely positively did not ever need and will never need a code of conduct whatsoever because We've got this, right? Uh, 12 years later, he, the, the court, I think, in what is relative to an institution that we, I think, can all agree is not exactly known for being agile and quick to change, uh, decides to adopt a code. That's as close to the court acknowledging a problem as this court is likely to get. Right, so that is a step. And I think that there is some reason to interpret that as a step that is meaningful and that may actually be consequential in as much as it does tee up the possibility of Congress taking the next step and imposing it on the court. And the next step is an enforcement mechanism imposed by Congress. And we can talk about the interesting questions about congressional authority to do that. And I think that that's an interesting discussion. The, the negative spin, and I think the negative spin is, is absolutely right, is that the court peppers this supposed code of conduct with watered down language, even relative to already existing federal statutory law. So the federal recusal statute, 28 USC section 455, says a judge or justice shall disqualify whenever the judge, judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. The court, sleight of hand, inserts over and over again the word should rather than shall. The court then balances and goes into this long-winded you know, tangent about the rule of necessity and how any judge considering a recusal needs to balance it against the necessity that there be nine justices and on and on and on. Let me put this bluntly, and here's where partisan politics and ethics does really, or do really intersect. The court had eight members for 13 months when Merrick Garland couldn't even get a hearing. It operated just fine. Compare, and there's no due process interest at stake there. Compare eight justices for all of the cases for that 13 month period to one justice recusing in one case in order to serve the interest in due process. There's an upside there that isn't there on the other side, and the downside is comparatively minimized. So you mentioned the 2011 year-end report. There was also a year-end report. Um, this one was during the pandemic. It's either um, the year-end report in 2020 or 2021, but it was after the Wall Street Journal reported on a spate of ethics issues involving lower court judges who 
some inadvertently, um, some consciously, had financial holdings in companies that appeared before their courts. And it, it was a big deal at the time. And again, the Chief Justice in his year-end report was like, we don't need congressional intervention. We can handle this ourselves. And he talked about how the Federal Judicial Conference was going to take steps to deal with it. Um, there's a lot of, we can do this in-house from this court. Um, from that particular non-intervention to the Dobbs leak, which was you know, apparently handled by Inspector Gadget in-house. Um, <laughs> Like, the court thinks that it can do it itself. Um, this too is an irrigation of power. I mean, like, there is a role for Congress to play. The issue is the court knows that this Congress at least is not going to play that role because one, it is so polarized. And two, those who are in whatever the shifting minority is that favors the court making a lot of these decisions on substantive policy issues would rather the court have free reign to decide these questions so that these domestic policy issues could be decided through the courts as opposed to Congress. And that's exactly right. A hundred percent. And I would amplify that um, and, and echo one thing that Congressman Goldman said, which is that in the recent Trump v. Anderson case, you know, the, the public perception, and, and to a certain extent rightly, is that this is a nine to zero decision. But the reality is, and, and, and Melissa's point about the court knows that Congress isn't going to do something, the reality is Justice Thomas participates and makes the five, four, he, without Justice Thomas, there is no holding that section three of the 14th amendment is not self-executing. And therefore, and the, the consequence of that holding, the consequence of him participating in the case, to Melissa's point, which I think is spot on, is this. The court knows that in the context of whether or not there was an insurrection and whether or not Ginny Thomas was complicit in an insurrection and all of those questions, the court knows that the, there are members of Congress who were part of the underlying predicate events. And they, the court knows that the court is not, or that the Congress is not going to take action to say that this was an insurrection. So in other words, by participating in the case, Justice Thomas provides a fifth vote to say that the only body that can declare that it was a section three insurrection is a body that the court knows isn't going to say that. A, a question they don't even have to reach. Right. So I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just think 18, uh, 28, 28 United States Code 455 on recusal. Uh, I know we have gray area cases, but this isn't one of them. I think it's really clear uh, for judge or justice. If your spouse is an insurrectionist, you recuse from all insurrection cases. <laughs> Wait, say that again. <laughs> I, I just think okay. it, uh, my, 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 my spouse is not an insurrectionist. Uh, <laughs> she's a musicologist. But, but if, uh, <laughs> If you, your spouse is an insurrectionist, just recuse from the insurrection cases. Got it. <laughs> um, I do want to ask about the question of congressional authority, but I have to do a little bit of housekeeping first. So you start thinking about that uh, while I make the following announcement about continuing legal education. Uh, for those attorneys attending today who wish to receive New York State CLE credit for our program, please record the following code. Supreme 67X. So in order to receive CLE credits, you must report this code and any others that we give out on our online affirmation form that was distributed to you by email and on the Eventbrite page. Again, please record the following code, SUPREME67X. That's 1-800-929, no, sorry. <laughs> One final time, SUPREME67X. All right, on the question of congressional authority, because there have been bills, I think, you know, in each of the last five or six Congresses, someone has introduced a bill about Supreme Court recusal and transparency, and there are a couple of versions pending now. Um, and, and in principle, such a piece of legislation could overcome exactly the shortcomings everyone described with the court's own effort. Um, so there's a two obvious questions, good idea, yes or no, and do they have the authority? <laughs> so, I, mean, I think this is a start, right? And I do think they have the authority. I mean, the idea that as a matter of constitutional design, the court would be entirely insulated 
from any kind of oversight from the other branches to me is just unfathomable. Um, and, and I don't think there's any textual support for such a reading in the Constitution. So I think it's it's a start and, and it's a good start. I also though, you know, want to come back to something that James said. I mean, the fact that we're even talking about this, the fact that they decided to issue this codish ethics thing, ethics adjacent thing, speaks to the fact that they understand the import of public perception. Right? I mean, the court is an unusual entity in our constitutional system because unlike Congress, it doesn't wield the power of the purse, unlike the president, doesn't wield the power of the sword. There is nothing that requires us to obey the court other than our own sense that they're playing by the rules and that what they do is legitimate and fair. And so when that begins to erode, the court is in real trouble. And, and I think they understand that. I think it is why the Chief Justice issued that code of ethics as you know amorphous and inchoate as it was and toothless um, to at least show that they understood that there was something really wrong and that the public understood that as well. Again, I don't think that's enough to make up for the gap in public perception. And I do think there is a role for Congress to play here, even if it's only like turning off the lights at the Supreme Court. Congress controls appropriations to the courts, how they hire clerks, the money they have to keep their building going. They have nice fancy chambers, maybe it would be hard to work there in the winter if there was no heat. I mean, like, you can make this, you can make things uncomfortable. Like, I'm saying this as a former dean, like, you can make things uncomfortable. Um, not that I ever did are. that. Yeah. Never did that. But, I mean, Congress has cards to play, and it doesn't necessarily have to involve enacting legislation, per se. They can deal with their power of the purse and use that to at least bring the court into some measure of compliance on some of these things. So I believe it is constitutional for Congress to regulate uh, financial disclosure by the justices uh, and also gift rules. Uh, simply say no free trips with billionaires. I don't care if you're personal friends or not. Uh, we pay you enough, you can buy yourself an airline ticket. Uh, Congress can make the rules with respect to uh, the personal conduct of the justices, financial conflicts of interest, and so forth. Um, 20 United States Code 455, I believe, is constitutional the way it's drafted. If Congress were to up the ante and say, well, no justice should ever participate in a case involving a president who appointed that justice, uh, I would have concerns that they would be intruding into the decision-making process of the court. I agree with you about Justice Kagan should have recused on the health care, okay, because she had actually participated in it. But I don't think you can say that every justice should uh, have to recuse from every case involving the president who appointed them. That would be too broad. So you could go too far with congressional uh, regulation of the court where you would be infringing on separation of powers. Uh, I, when I called for an inspector general at the Supreme Court, I made it very, very clear that the inspector general should not be getting into the substance of opinions or the deliberations of the court, and Congress should not be able to discover uh, and get documents underlying the deliberations of the court unless it's a very clear case of bribery or, or something of the sort. Uh, we have to be careful of the privacy of the court's decision-making process and the independence of the court. Absolutely true. The same with the President of the United States, by the way. Uh, and we have separation of powers, but once again, separation of powers doesn't mean no accountability whatsoever. Uh, we do have checks and balances. And uh, th this court seems to, at least some of the justices, say that Congress can't do anything to regulate them other than just continue to send them taxpayer money by way of salaries for themselves and the clerks. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all in general agreement on these points. And I think in terms of historical uh, context, you know, the as far back as the Judiciary Act of 1789, uh, you know, which creates the lower courts, but vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Courts, it provided the funding to establish the Supreme Court. It set the size of the court at that point, the number of justices. It established the quorum rules for the court at that point. It prescribed the specific oath that justices have to take. It has imposed in the past, and for the past 75 years, it has been abundantly clear that 28 U.S.C. Section 455 does apply to the justices, although the one party to whom that's not necessarily been clear has been the justices themselves. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the, the Congress 
has some powers. And to Melissa's point about the purse strings, I mean, there's two ways of, of using the purse strings. You can turn off the heat and look, we only have nine justices. Maybe we should offer them a raise in order to, as a, as a carrot. I mean, one is the stick, one is the carrot, right? Maybe a carrot in order to increase, a, along with a stick, by, whether it's an inspector general, whether it's a referral to a panel of, you know, randomly selected retired federal judges, whatever the case may be. And, you know, Senator Whitehouse has a bill. There's a, there's a bill that's sponsored by a number of people in the House. There are lots of proposals out there. But this idea that the court is completely above any oversight by Congress, that isn't separation of powers. That's a different system of government. So when, the, when all of the allegations or reporting about Justice Thomas emerged from ProPublica, I had a hot take on Twitter. And I'd be interested to hear what you think of this, James. Um, so one of the things I noticed, Justice Thomas is appointed to the court at the age of 43. Um, he becomes a judge at the age of 41. That's very, very young. Um, but certainly, um, historically, I mean, for, for many people, a federal judgeship is a capstone of a career. This really begins to change um, with the rise of the conservative legal movement. Um, I, I think the concerted effort to stop the lower courts with movement lawyers who are younger and will stay on the court in those lifetime tenured positions for an extensive period of time. So age really becomes an issue. So he comes to the court at just 43. This is a point in time if you're a young lawyer where you really haven't begun to really maximize your earning potential mm. in the profession. Um, and, and Justice Thomas has talked about this. You know, he graduates from Yale Law School, cannot find a job, works for Senator Danforth, spends a f like maybe a year and a half in private practice as a lawyer for Monsanto, but then goes back into public service as the commissioner of the EEOC and then on to, um, I think, a stint at the Department of Education and then on to being a federal judge. He's broke when he gets to the court. And all of the judicial disclosure forms bear this out relative to his colleagues. He has the least in terms of liquid assets, um, durable assets, all of this. Is that a problem with a movement that is focused on stocking younger and younger people in the courts? And I don't say this just about the conservatives. The Biden administration has been very focused on this. And you know, is it the case that you are eventually going to have people who are like, listen, I've got kids, I've got college looming, I've got my own student loans, like, I'm going to need a billionaire patron. Or is it a problem like we are appointing individuals who just may not be ethical? I mean, like, it, it's hard to disaggregate. Like, these are real concern, real financial strains that lots of people face. Um, if you're a Supreme Court justice, your spouse is in a more constrained position in terms of what he or she may be able to do in terms of a profession and income bearing profession. Like, is this just a no win proposition? And maybe we should again return to the idea of thinking of these careers as capstones or hotter take limiting the time people spend in these positions. Got a response, James? Agree, concur. I mean, I, <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, I, I, it's an either or. I, I'm fine with either or. I mean, I, I complete. I don't know the answer. I mean, to the, to the to the either or question of, are we should it be a return to the capstone model or are we appointing people who are just inherently? I don't know. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I certainly don't know the individuals personally, um, much less in a way that I would be comfortable opining on that. But. Uh, <sighs> You know, I think the reality is Justice Thomas um, is trying to live a life that is commensurate with, that is financially commensurate with the, the circles in which he runs. Um, and given a salary that R by- RV users. Right, right. Mm. The RVs People of a, who like Walmart, yeah. um, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm not necessarily proposing that. I just think it's a fairly modest investment. If we were to give every Supreme Court justice a significant, we could double their salaries, and that is a relatively insignificant investment in something that I would call if the return. If the return on investment is an increase in due process, count me in. That is not a politically palatable solution, though. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What's the salary around two seventy? For Supreme Court, that's quite a lot of change, uh, and it's uh, going to be hard to um, to get through Congress a bill that would raise that salary. Now, um, uh, 
you know, they don't have the opportunity to do uh, consulting the way a law professor would and so forth. And so that's, uh, that's a factor. Uh, but uh, then again, their spouses are doing consulting on matters related to the Supreme Court. Um, it, it's, a, it's a real problem uh, how you can control uh, the ethics, not just of the justice, but of the spouse. Uh, and that's what we're running into in the Jenny Thomas uh, problem. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, though, it, it's not entirely clear that you could not, under the Constitution of the United States, say that these justices, while they have a lifetime tenure, uh, their time on the court uh, would be limited. I mean, I have lifetime tenure in a very well-paid job courtesy of the uh, state of Minnesota, but I don't get to teach the same courses every year. If the dean wants to rotate me into something else, uh, that's, that's what's going to happen. And I think that the same thing here, that, you know, you could say after 20 years on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, you have all the experience you need to become a circuit judge uh, and be reversed by the court. Um, and I'm not sure that would be unconstitutional any more than, by the way, um, adding, adding seats to the court. And when Chief Justice Roberts came to the University of Minnesota to speak with the faculty a number of years ago, I asked him if he thought the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill of 1938 was unconstitutional. And uh, he said, well, it's not an issue before the court. Uh, he knew exactly what I was talking about with the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill of 1938. And that uh, the fact of the matter is the President, with the consent of the House and the Senate, can increase uh, the number of seats on the court. Uh, if the founders have wanted any different, they would have put it in the Constitution, the number nine. Uh, so there are controls on this court, and uh, I think some of these options need to be explored. So with this group, obviously, we could go on you know, for many hours, but I do want to leave some time now for questions uh, from, from the audience. We've got another 10 or 12 minutes. Deborah. <clears throat> I'll just say before you answer, if anyone does have a question, please just come up to the mic and, and uh, we'll take you as, you, as you're up. So. That, that's such a great question, Deborah. Um, and, and Kennedy is the case of the praying coach where Justice Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion for the court in which you say played fast and loose with the facts. I think Justice Sotomayor would say he lied. Right, he, and, and to prove he lied, she in her dissent provided photographic evidence of what the court apparently glossed over. Um, yes, yeah, so, so there's a real question about elision of unfavorable facts. Um, you know, a, another way I think you see this playing out at the court is, um, you know, the way that history is marshaled. And I think this is especially important now that history and tradition is the principal way by which we understand what rights are fundamental and entitled to more searching judicial scrutiny. Um, you know, the court and many of the justices, Clarence Thomas among them, plays fast and loose with history, cobbling together history that is favorable to them and glossing over history that does not favor their preferred positions. And so, you know, that's a question. There's also a real question about amicus briefs. Um, anyone can file a brief before the court so long as they follow the requisite procedures. There's very little in the way of 
checks on the kinds of facts that are advanced in amicus briefs. And you know, some of them actually say things I think are really fanciful and outlandish and can easily be disproved, easily falsifiable information. It's all before the court. Some of it makes its way back into judicial decisions. So, I mean, I think there's a larger question about disinformation and how it shows up in the court's work that mirrors on a micro level the same questions we are having in politics. Is that an ethics problem? Is that a politics problem? Or is that just a more general problem of having so many of these decisions not actually debated in public fora, like whether it's a jury or just the court of public opinion, but then actually are left to these sort of rarefied echelons of power to be debated amongst themselves. I, I, I don't have a great answer for that. I kind of think it's a little both and, but I thought that Justice Sotomayor's dissent in Bremerton was a rebuke and, and a very public one in the way that an IG might rebuke an errant justice for doing something like not properly disclosing it. But yeah, so maybe it's a little both and, but it's a widespread problem and bigger than just Kennedy. It's a big problem uh, where uh, anyone is trying to distort facts and law to fit their theory. I'm known for going after a law professors doing that in academic articles, but at least you don't have the impact there that you have in the United States Supreme Court where uh, we have distortion of facts and law to fit a theory and a desired outcome. I've seen this in a number of cases. The clerks, the law clerks exacerbate it. Uh, and I don't know where they're hiring the clerks these days. I haven't been to a federal society meeting for a long time, uh, but Justice Thomas has some very interesting clerks. Uh, and uh, I wonder about whether ideology is being prioritized over the rule of law. It's about facts and law. And if that's not what you want to do, you shouldn't be on the US Supreme Court. Other questions? duty to say what the law is, right? So I'm wondering how um, congressional reforms or congressional attempts for reform to the judiciary should be reviewed and in, in cases where they could possibly go too far or uh, we may be opening a can of worms. Um, I'm just wondering when the court is so adamant about maintaining its own power, how do we review Well, it's a good question. And I, I think that as with many constitutional law questions, uh, you know, it's going to be a function of line drawing. And, and there is, we're fortunate that there is a rich body of precedent in other areas, um, in areas where Congress has occasionally um, overstepped and gone into what you might consider to be the core of the judicial process, the decision qua decision. I mean, there are cases that are effectively um, about the question of, you know, to, to put it in layperson's terms, Congress has tried on occasion to say, okay, you have jurisdiction to decide a case provided that you as a court decide pursuant to the heads I win, tails you lose theory of jurisprudence, right? Which is a clear intrusion into the court qua court. But I think that stopping short of those kinds of, of efforts, um, you know, I think that the court will clearly have a self-interest, but I think there's also, um, you know, the value of public scrutiny and the value of, of reputation that will stop the court from, or at least should stop the court from striking down efforts that are within the parameters that are allowed. Yeah, the court needs to understand that they have a role within in a, a framework where there are three branches of government and also the states and the court's orders are not self-executing. Uh, and the court often relies on the executive branch uh, to enforce its orders. Uh, as President Eisenhower did in 1954 with the Brown versus Board decision, it's critical that the court's orders be enforced. Uh, whether or not we agree with them, they need to be enforced. Uh, and that was the point that President Eisenhower made 
and uh, uh, unfortunately you had some uh, literally armed resistance down south over that. Uh, and uh, the executive branch is there to enforce the court's orders. Uh, well, the court basically says, we want a different system. Uh, we want to uh, be, we don't want to be regulated with respect to our trips with billionaires and everything else. And to protect that, uh, we're willing to uh, basically say, we're going to overturn an ethics code and everything this Congress sends our way. Well, the next time the court has an order, what's the executive branch going to say? Well, go ahead and you enforce your own orders. That's going to lead to chaos in this country. We need a court that we respect and his orders are obeyed. Uh, and uh, they, they're enforced. And uh, I think Chief Justice Roberts understands that. We have time for one more quick question. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. This is a great panel. Come back next week, please. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you a question that's a sociological question. I know you're not sociologists, but I'm sort of, I want to hear what you think. Um, there's a criticism of the, the court in general and whether they should have better checks. Um, and then there's a criticism of Justice Thomas, who has this connection to an insurrection. So maybe that's enough of an explanation for why there's so much focus on him. But I'm wondering if you think this can be understood um, without thinking about race. So there haven't been very many black men on the court. I don't know if there's two or three. Two. Thank you. Um, that's what I thought. So and he and he you have touched on this a little bit he's from pinpoint georgia he's from a really really poor community like does he have more financial pressure yes so there's that but can you explain why there might be this distinction between the financial problems for different justices and the criticism focused on him so I think there's always going to be disparities of wealth on the court. Um, justice Thomas, for a very long time, was quote unquote the poorest justice. Justice Ginsburg was quote unquote the wealthiest. Um, justice Sotomayor, I think, has a similar story, origin story, as that of Justice Thomas. She grew up in very modest circumstances in the South Bronx when she came to the court in 2009. It was after a very long career in public service. She became a federal judge at just the age of 39. She'd only been a law firm partner for about five years at Pavia and Harcourt before taking up her post on the Southern District of New York. Before that, she had been an assistant district attorney with the Manhattan DA's office. So she wasn't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. She doesn't have a billionaire patron, right? Um, so. I don't think you can necessarily divorce the question of race or class from any of this, but I also don't think it answers or excuses it. It may be the case that justices are underpaid relative to what they and their training might command in the legal market. And that's a separate question from whether Justice Thomas is being unfairly targeted because he comes from modest circumstances or because he's a black man. The first black man to sit on the court was Thurgood Marshall, who came to the court after, again, a very long career in public service, um, public service that was animated by his own desire to be an agent of social change, but also born of the fact that he would not have been welcome at many of the places where many lawyers could have gone to actually earn the kinds of salaries that would have led to significant intergenerational wealth. Justice Marshall's widow, Cecilia Suyat Marshall, passed away, I think, about a year and a half ago. and. On the eve of her death, she was just reminiscing about her and her husband's time in Washington. Um, before becoming a justice of the Supreme Court, he had been a judge on the Second Circuit here in New York and had served as the first African-American Solicitor General of the United States. But when he became Solicitor General and they moved to Washington, she said she saw their social world really deteriorate and that they spent a lot of time as a family, which was unusual for them because he was a notoriously gregarious person. He enjoyed socializing, he had lots of friends, um, he loved parties, he loved entertaining. But when they went to Washington, she knew and he knew that as the first black man in this incredibly elevated position that was understood to be a proving ground to the Supreme Court, he could not afford to make a single mistake. That if he made a mistake, it wouldn't take 72 hours of a news cycle. It would be immediate and it would be swift and it would be unrelenting. And he would pay for it for the rest of his life. And so they were relatively reclusive in their lives at the court. They hung out with other justices. Um, sounds grim to me, but okay. 
that's what she had to do. I, all to say that Justice Thomas's circumstances are not unprecedented. The circumstances he finds himself in now, those are unprecedented. And that's on him, not on his past. And so that is my sociological take on this whole situation. We are going to have to leave it there. We are going to take a 10 minute break before the next panel. But before we do that, please join me in thanking what was really a wonderful panel. My name is uh, Anthony Seabach. I'm a professor here at the law school. I, with uh, Jessica Roth, co-direct uh, the Byrne Center uh, on Ethics in the Profession. And uh, I'm going to introduce the second panel and moderate it. And I don't want to take up a lot of the time of the panelists, so I'm just going to give a brief uh, framework for what we're talking about and then tell you who we're going to be hearing from. I just want to mention that in terms of questions, we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, students from the Law Review will be roving around with two microphones. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and someone will come to you with the microphone. So uh, the title is uh, of this panel, um, Ethical Crisis in the Profession, uh, the Trump lawyers and their disciplinary actions. And one might think that we're being a little bit unfair here by singling out a group of lawyers and saying, well, we've got to think about their special uh, interactions as, and special violations of the rules of professional responsibility. After all, um, it's not that uh, much of a surprise, I suppose, to know that lawyers are always being accused of disciplinary violations. And in fact, lawyers are often being found in violation of the rules of professional responsibility, <coughs> despite the best efforts of myself and the others on this panel to teach professional responsibility. So why are we picking on this group of lawyers? Well, and I think that's really what this panel in some sense is about, which is, uh, should we first of all expect a different kind of conduct from lawyers who are acting as agents for um, political actors in a uh, dealing with questions of public trust with our electoral system. And then if we should or should not, and that's an open question, the next question is, given that there have always been lawyers representing um, campaigns, lawyers representing candidates for a very long time in the history of this country, um, is there something unusual, something special about the failure of this group of lawyers to conform, at least in some minimal way, to the standards of professional responsibility? And if so, what? What happened? Now, I will just point out that, you know, American legal culture is a bit um, schizophrenic uh, in the sense that the popular understanding of lawyers um, is, you know, very dark. Uh, and also extremely aspirational. It's very dark in the sense of, I'm sure we're all familiar with, you know, touchstones of our culture, like the 1997 movie Liar, Liar, where the idea is, I mean, wouldn't it be funny if a lawyer couldn't lie? Right? That's the joke, right? Because the assumption is that lawyers always lie. But at the same time, we um, expect these lawyers, maybe, the lawyers who are showing up and doing something that will affect our vote and who gets elected to office not to lie not only not to lie, but to go beyond not lie, to act in ways that are ethical, that have to do with representing values beyond mere truth telling that promote our democracy. Um, and these are the questions I think we're going to talk about right now. So who are our panelists? Our panelists are, and uh, I guess I'm going to go, not necessarily, I will simply go in order of from left to right. We have um, Sung Hui Kim from UCLA Law. We have Brad Wendell from Cornell Law School. We have Rebecca Royfe from New York Law School. And we have Renee Kanaka Jefferson from University of Houston Law Center. And the order of presentation will be revealed before you in a moment. Okay, Renee, go first. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And it's really a privilege to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm building the piece that I am writing for this symposium off a chapter in my new book, Law Democratized, where I advocate for one of the reforms that you heard from Representative Goldman earlier this morning. There I make the case that if lawyers can't tell lies or introduce false facts in court, we should reform our ethics rules to prohibit that behavior in the court of public opinion. 
now I'm not going to say anything more about that for the moment. It might come up more in the Q&A. But as I was making that case in my prior work, I realized and I reflected on the reality that reforming ethics rules can take a very long time. And even if we could make a change like I am proposing to the ABA model code, getting states, all 50 states, to and all US jurisdictions to adopt it in time for the next election, that's not going to happen. And so I was delighted to be invited to contribute here and think about, well, what's happening on the ground right now and what can we be doing right now with the ethics code we have at the moment to make sure that we don't end up with an election where we see numerous lawyers involved in the kinds of things we saw so recently ago. Let me lay some context in terms of just the scope of the number of lawyers who have been involved in the election challenges and what that means for the profession. And unless any of you are out there thinking, well, okay, this is interesting, but it's never going to happen to me. I'd like to suggest to you that this is one example we can look at to critique the way lawyer ethics are enforced, the lack of transparency across the board. And so this is one lens to look at how we might be reforming and better enforcing our ethics code generally. But now let's get into the lawyers that we're all here to talk about. Uh, the Trump lawyers, the so-called Trump lawyers, right? So let me open with some data. We have uh, 22 lawyers who appeared in a formal way in cases on behalf of the former president or worked independently on his false assertions of winning the 2020 election. Uh, this is a little bit dated, right? At the end of 2023, more than $150 million had been spent by those lawyers in dealing with the fallout from their involvement. We have eight lawyers indicted in Georgia. I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Three of them have pled guilty already. Two lawyers indicted in Michigan, at least nine were sanctioned in Michigan by a federal court, five sanctioned in New York, more than a dozen currently face discipline, one's been permanently disbarred, and this story is still being written literally as I speak in terms of the way the discipline process is going to unfold. In many ways, it's overwhelming to keep track of it all. Uh, but let me say a little bit more about the indicted lawyers. And so you got an overview of them again from Representative Goldman's remarks this morning. And what I will say is this is a remarkable and distressing list that we have eight lawyers that were included in a criminal indictment alongside the, the former president. But that's actually not what's so interesting to me about this. It's that this list includes lawyers who were elitely trained at preeminent law schools in this nation who before they found themselves indicted with the former president, many of them were highly regarded and respected in their particular discipline and field as a prosecutor, as mayor of the city, as a former dean of a law school. I could go on and on. And so again, lest anyone in this room think, I will never find myself the subject of a criminal indictment, I think we have to ask ourselves as a profession how such well-educated lawyers who were highly respected in their fields found themselves in this situation. And so that's part of what I'm doing in my project as well. Now, again, this has been in some ways overwhelming for me to keep track of all of the ethics issues that are happening. This is maybe the first time in my nearly 20 years of teaching professional responsibility, I don't feel like I have to make a case for why ethics matters when I'm facing my students. And I've started, if you want to track it and follow along with me, I've started a newsletter, um, the Legal Ethics Roundup, where I'm keeping track of all the disciplinary cases that are going on with these 20 plus <clears throat> lawyers and beyond. But let me drill down now into two very specific disciplinary cases and tell you a, a tale of two disciplinary authorities, which is important both as we discuss what's happening to the Trump lawyers, but also I think this offers us a unique opportunity and a lens to examine the discipline process for lawyers generally in this country and how it works and how often it doesn't. And so the first process I want to mention is from California, and this involved John Eastman, who was one of the lawyers indicted alongside the former president. Now his, uh, 
hearing, his disciplinary hearing, if you will, lasted for several months over this past summer. This is a page from the State Bar of California court docket where you could go on each day and see when it was going to be happening. And you could actually zoom in. Uh, technically, no uh, video or images were supposed to be taken of the Zoom, even though anyone from the public could zoom in live. That's why I've noted uh, that image credit. It's not my own image. It's coming from the Tennessee Star, which I'm reproducing it from. But I share this with you uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's highly unusual that now maybe most of the public is not like me and tuning in every day to watch this bar hearing. But the reality is, in very few instances, can the public ever see what happens in a bar disciplinary hearing involving a lawyer. And I think that's a problem. I actually think that we need more transparency now. We could talk about the trade-offs in terms of why we might want less transparency, but on tipping the scale, I think transparency matters for two reasons, and they both go to education. One is education of the public. To believe in the integrity of our justice system, we need to understand how lawyers are regulated in a largely self-regulated profession. And so a public proceeding like this allows for that kind of education. And importantly, it goes to educate lawyers themselves. And I think this is really key. If we want to talk about having an ethics code that works, I am not a fan of an ethics code that is meant to sanction and discipline and disbar. I think it should be educating to prevent the kind of behavior that would result in sanctions and disbarment. And a public proceeding like this can have that preventive educational component. Now, uh, we still don't have a decision. It was supposed to be out by the end of February. Stay tuned. It's going to be breaking news. I was kind of hoping maybe it would break right at this very moment. I don't know. Maybe uh, check Twitter slash X, see if it's coming out. Uh, I don't think it's out yet. Um, by contrast, Sidney Powell, uh, also one of the lawyers indicted alongside the former president. And uh, for those of you who don't know Sidney Powell's background, she was a highly regarded appellate lawyer in Texas. And her proceedings have been very much behind closed doors. I'm gonna tell you about these two letters in just a second, but I will just say for Eastman, so so far he has not pled uh, guilty to the criminal indictment or had other sanctions uh, against him. Sidney Powell, by contrast, has had a federal court in Michigan issue sanctions, including fines and a requirement to engage in continuing legal education. She has pled guilty to the Georgia indictment and still yet in the State Bar of Texas, even though she was referred there for discipline by the federal court in Michigan, uh, there's so far nothing has happened. And these two letters were written soon after she pled guilty in the Georgia case, again, uh, renewing the call for the Texas Bar to discipline her and remove her law license. One of them came from a group of lawyers practicing in Texas, and that um, makes sense, um, former bar officials and the like. The other came from uh, two entities you might be familiar with, States United Democracy Center and Lawyers Defending American Democracy. And I want to conclude my remarks by just pausing for a moment about the role of organizations like States United and Lawyers Defending American Democracy coming alongside and elevating for us the lack of ethics enforcement here. Um, before I say more about that, though, if you're wondering what's next, uh, we have yet another, I think, going to be more public proceeding that's involving uh, Jeffrey Clark. It will start March 26th. So if you want, I'll be on YouTube. You can watch it alongside me. <laughs> I'm happy to talk more about that also in the Q&A. But let me now go back to uh, where I, I, I really want to focus the last couple of minutes I have to speak with you, which is who should hold lawyers accountable to constitutional governance? And importantly, who should hold those responsible that are charged with that accountability when they aren't doing it? Because I think that's a bit of what we have been seeing in the context of the Trump lawyers. And so here I'm showing you um, logos from a bunch of different organizations. I don't have time to tell you about all of them, but I sort of view them in three categories. The first on the left, Responsive Law, Fix the Court, People's Parity Project. These are organizations that have existed for quite some time that advocate for ethics <clears throat> reform to advance access to justice, to um, uh, advocate for things like the Supreme Court adopting an ethics code. In the middle, you see the Legal Accountability Project, Lawyers Defending American Democracy, the 65 Project, as a caveat, I am on the board of the 65 Project. These are organizations that sprung up in the wake of the election fraud cases. 
And then uh, there are many, many law schools that have centers that are focused on, at least in some way, ethics reform and the kinds of issues we're talking about here. But I'm really interested in the organizations in the middle. And that's a big part of my project for the symposium. And these are the kinds of things I'm asking about them. You know, why were these organizations started, and uh, especially the ones that were motivated in the wake of the election fraud cases to really go after the lawyers who were involved? How are they funded? What guides their missions? Do we need more efforts like this to fill the gaps in ethics accountability that are left by our bar associations? Because each state, as you saw with the examples of Eastman and Powell, handles things differently. There's no consistency across the states. And should existing authorities like state bar associations take on more public roles? My goals are where I'm, where I'm finding myself ending up in this piece are, are, are these. First, to identify best practices and policies if we have more of these kinds of organizations coming up. Importantly, to encourage transparency and uniformity across the jurisdictions for those educational reasons I already mentioned. Learning from the successes and failures in holding lawyers accountable and thinking about possible toolkits and best practices going forward if we see more of these accountability organizations emerging. So I'll stop there, um, but I encourage you to hang out with me on my uh, Legal Ethics Roundup newsletter and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So next, uh, Becky will go. Yes, so um, we've heard a lot of enthusiasm um, so far today from Representative Goldman through the first panel and through Renee's talk about regulation and accountability. And I'm gonna take the somewhat um, perhaps controversial position that in fact, um, regulating these lawyers, disciplining these lawyers is misguided. And if the courts do as Renee said, we're waiting right now for the opinion um, in the Eastman case. If the courts, state courts do um, sanction, punish these lawyers for their role in representing Donald Trump, we will actually create more problems than we solve. Um, so uh, I, I, I first want to start by saying I think the impulse to um, for blood, <laughs> it, it comes from a good place, uh, especially from people who really care a lot about the profession as I do. There's this desire to hold people accountable and um, preserve the integrity of the profession, rid us, um, you know, rid the ranks of the profession of people you think have somehow betrayed the ideals. Um, so I understand where the instinct comes from, but I still think it's a bad idea. And I'm gonna explain why. And the way in which I'm gonna explain why is first I'm gonna um, explain how the lawyer's role is really not more broadly to constitutional governance writ large or to government functions or to the rule of law, really, the Constitution. Their role is very specifically to the judiciary. They are officers of the court, and that matters. Um, next, I'm going to explain how the misperception of their duty, sort of more broadly to the principles of democracy, um, can lead to um, some problematic uh applications of the rules it will run into problems with the first amendment the rules of professional conduct and really public policy more generally and i'm going to do that by talking about um, the complaint against john eastman and i should issue a disclaimer that and and and, and hopefully i don't have any um security here but hopefully this doesn't really anger people but i was um an expert witness for john eastman in those proceedings so um with that caveat i don't think that actually makes it so that i'm in any way biased but we are in an ethics panel, so <laughs> I should probably disclose that. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about why all of this matters. So first of all, lawyers' duties. So lawyers' duties um, are really to the court. And this there's a reason why, which is all of these other terms, like the rule of law or um, the Constitution or democratic principles are all contested terms. And there is this ongoing process that we have, as a country have agreed to by which those terms bring, gain meaning. And they gain meaning through the representative representation of clients in court, which lawyers engage in. So lawyers have an important role in the iterative process by which these terms gain substance. 
And so it is important that we give lawyers leeway to, to do that so that, that it is the obligation they have to courts, not the obligation sort of writ large to democracy. Um, you can see this also reflected in the rules of professional conduct in the preamble all over the place. It says that it doesn't say um, lawyers are have an obligation to democracy. They say the, the, the obligation lawyers have to democracy comes from their obligations to the court, um, their, their, the, to the administration of justice. Um, secondly, um, the, um, the, 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 there are, I think, and I think this is partly leads to my later conclusion, there are reasons for this. And there have been some really interesting sociological studies in Taiwan of the legal profession that suggest that the reason that um, the legal profession was able to develop an identity um, sort of with a, a, a preserving and protecting rule of law values was because of its allegiance to the judiciary. So we're kind of used to our democracy so much that it's kind of useful to look at a, 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 a state that hasn't had um, such a long lasting democracy and how the legal profession really played this role. And it was really through its allegiance to the courts, not a sort of broader allegiance to notion of democracy. Um, okay, so Eastman, um, Eastman's complaint. I want to show, I want to talk about his complaint in order to show some of the problems of viewing the lawyer's role more generally as this just basic obligation to protect democracy. So Eastman, the complaint is kind of, there are basically sort of four sets of charges against Eastman. So the first set of charges against Eastman have to do with public statements he made. So he made a couple of statements. Some of them are pretty famous, like the statements he made at the Ellipse. And all of these statements, he said things like there have been massive um, election fraud, um, changes in the results are not valid. He said many things like this, very specific um, statements, like um, the voting machines were tampered with, things like that. He also said the same thing on the Bannon um, show. Um, second set of charges are based on two memos, um, which laid out different possibilities for Vice President Pence. One of those possibilities was, um, you know, I mean, most people are probably familiar with this. You can count the votes. Uh, you, can, you can discount the um, contested slates of electors and just base the election on the remaining states. You can choose which slate of electors from the contested, so-called contested states you want or you can um, just simply um, push, push things back, give them to the, um, back to the states so the state's legislatures can take a harder look at what's been going on and um, you know, in, in, in any of these scenarios, turns out um, Trump becomes president again. Um, and, um, and, and so he wrote these in two memos. One was a two-page memo, one was a six-page memo. And in one set of charges, he's accused of lying to Vice President Pence in these memos um, about the election and Vice President Pence's attorney and chief of staff. Um, the, then in another set of charges, he, the same memos were given to Trump and the Trump campaign. So he's accused of lying to Trump and the Trump campaign in these two sets of memos. Uh, and then finally, there are a few charges having to do with two court cases in which he intervened on behalf one of them, he um, intervened the, the Supreme Court case that Texas filed against um, several states um, in, in the Supreme Court. And another one was a Georgia case in which he moved to decertify the election. So those are the sets of charges. And, and I'm gonna go through what was, um, what's problematic about the charges. So the first um, set of charges about his public statements run into fairly significant First Amendment problems. Um, and that's because we have a First Amendment, right? The Supreme Court has been fairly clear about it to make political lies. Um, political lies are prote fully protected speech. Uh, the court has, ha through a divided opinion in United States versus Alvarez, there's basic agreement among all the justices that lies themselves are not protected. Um, so- Lies are protected. Sorry, lies are protected. Thank you. So lies are protected speech. And so um, the question then remains, OK, well, should lawyers be treated somehow differently from everybody else because they're lawyers, right? And you might think, oh, well, lawyers have this heightened obligation. So sure. But in fact, the court has said um, fairly clearly that there's no separate professional speech, no such thing. Um, so we just have to apply strict scrutiny and see if there is a valid, you know, compelling government interest that would justify um, imposing limitations on this public speech of lawyers that other people are protected in. And there isn't one because the main um, government interest would be in the preservation of the administration of justice and the 
administration of justice would just was not at issue. And so I think a lot of these complaints sort of think, well, we can because lawyers have an obligation to um, the Constitution more generally, but that's just inaccurate. And so we run into significant First Amendment problems. Um, secondly, um, we would end up um, of course, chilling lawyers' speech in an important way, and that is because lawyers play a very important role in um, not just um, upholding our government institutions, but challenging them when they've gone wrong and distinguishing between when a lawyer has, um, it, it, I mean, in these instances, you could say, well, there's nothing useful about this speech. This was not a valid challenge, but of course, who gets to decide that and concern about state regulators and their own bias? Um, so the second set, of, the second and third, I'll treat together the, the six-page and the two-page memo. Um, they run at least the ones that the time that he gave it to Pence. I think run into the same First Amendment problems, um, and that is because again, there's no um, compelling government interest at issue. Um, but another problem with them is he's not really lying, right? I mean, in, a, in essence, what he's doing is not even making a statement of fact. What he is doing is presenting his clients allegations. And I think any of you who are students or are practicing lawyers know that when you go out into the world, you often, before you research what your, um, you, you, your client's allegations are, you may present them to the other side. You don't have an, a, an affirmative obligation to go out and make sure that what you've been told is true before you bring them into court. And so I, I think these are not statements of fact, and to the extent that they are lies, they are protected speech. This may be a little bit different when you lie to your own client, because while the administration of justice isn't an issue, maybe your fiduciary relationship is an issue, but still, I think um, the, the fact that these are not really statements of fact, but echo, echoes of allegations that the client is making and has made, um, makes it such that it's not really a lie to the client either. I mean, the client has been saying this over and over again repeatedly in public. The final set of, um, of charges have to do with filings he made in court. So here you could say, okay, no First Amendment problem, and I think you're right, right? We have li limits on what, what, what lawyers can say in court. That makes sense. Um, we impose those limits. There are rules that say you can't present an argument that's not based in law and fact. Perhaps these, these, the, 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 that the, it's very clear that these weren't based in law and fact. I think that that's um, likely true, but I also think disciplinary authorities should exercise their discretion in not bringing charges in these kinds of politically high profile politically charged cases, um, in part because I actually think it's a good thing, um, as um, Representative Dan Goldman said, over 60 cases that viewed this evidence was actually helpful in convincing a segment of the population, not as many people as we would want, but a segment of a population that there was no election fraud. Had these lawyers been barred from going into court and actually not gone into court, um, I think we would have had a, legit, a, a greater problem than we actually have now. So funneling political dissent into the courts is exactly what we want to do in highly charged political situations when you have half the country thinking that um, we, you know, that, that the election was stolen. Even that some portion of that, of that group of people actually still has faith in the courts and will pay attention when the um, courts say there has been no fraud. Um, so I want to turn finally to um, the question of why this matters. And um, I think that this is where the heart of um, my argument comes from, because these sound like sort of technical arguments, the rules of professional conduct, the First Amendment, but we have those things for a reason. And we have them because we want to preserve lawyers' roles, not just in, we want to prevent them from doing bad things, but we also don't want to chill them from doing good things. And so if you imagine um, a future, for instance, in which you think, well, um, not too hard, not too hard to imagine that um, a colorblind constitution, for instance, has become our definition of the constitution. It's become like Plessy versus Ferguson to ever even think about bringing up race. And you have 
have a cadre of lawyers who want to change this, right, and are representing marginalized groups, trying to find a way, a crack in the door to bring back this notion of, um, of taking race into account in a way to, um, to forward, to further the rights and, 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 and of marginalized groups. And now you can imagine state bars going after those lawyers. They're going after those lawyers because those lawyers are not respecting the Constitution. And I think that's a dystopian world. And it's a dystopian world that we will have no principle to fight against if we use the rules of professional conduct the way they are being used in these particular um, uh, cases against John Eastman and, and, other, and, and other of Trump's lawyers. Um, it's not that you don't have to look to an imagined future. We can look simply back to the past. Um, in the McCarthy era, I think people are, are fairly familiar with this history where state bars went after lawyers who represented communists and communist party members. It practically decimated the National Lawyers Guild, which was a guild of lawyers who represented these sorts of people. They were tarred as having the same essential politics as their clients, which was um, somehow subversive. and. Um, and, and, and these are things that we need to avoid, and these are the reasons why we have the First Amendment, and it applies the way that it, that it does. These are the reasons why the rules of professional conduct are written the way they are, and it is the reason why lawyers' obligations are not to the Constitution more broadly, but rather to the judiciary, the courts, and the administration of justice. And I'll just say in one second, if I have a, a minute, one I have one second. <laughs> so I'll just say, and, and this is just leads to what I I know that um, that that Professor Rundle is going to bring up, but that this doesn't mean that we have nothing to do. That there are other ways, ways other than the uh, punishing lawyers to help inspire people to take their to inspire lawyers to take their obligation to view the law in a serious and robust kind of way. Um, there are ways other than punishing lawyers to do that, and those are the ways that we should use instead of um, going after all of um, Trump's lawyers for what they did. Thank you. So, uh, Sung, you want to go next? Sure. Oh, turn mine. How about this one? Thank you. Here on. So my remarks today will be about Kenneth Chesbro, and it's pronounced Chesbro and not Cheesebro, even though he's from Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, so one of the puzzles that has emerged in the aftermath of the January 6th insurrection is how and why formerly reputable lawyers like Chesbro not only participated in the effort to derail the transfer of power after the 2020 election, but also were the architects of it. We now know that Chesbro was the mastermind behind the Trump fake electors plot. As a student of Harvard Law School in the early 1980s, he was tapped to fill a prestigious position as one of Professor Tribe's research assistants, along with future Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan and future White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. After law school, he clerked for federal district judge Gerhard Giselle, who had famously presided over the Oliver North and Pentagon Papers cases. After his judicial clerkship, Chesbro declined to follow the herd by going into big law. Instead, he opened his own law firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he developed a close friendship with Professor Tribe and occasionally worked with Tribe on high profile cases such as Bush v. Gore in support of the Gore presidential campaign. He became a supporter of Democratic politicians, including Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and Senators John Kerry and Russ Feingold. But something apparently happened when Chesbro entered his early 50s. In 2014, he made a lucrative investment in Bitcoin, divorced his wife of more than two decades, purchased a Tony Penthouse apartment in Manhattan, and remarried, reportedly, to a woman several decades younger than he. In 2016, he switched his voter registration from Democrat to unaffiliated. 
He lent his legal efforts to support conservative causes, including filing a US Supreme Court amicus brief that referred to birthright citizenship as a vestige of feudalism. In 2020, he donated to the Trump campaign and other fringe Republican politicians, such as Senators J.D. Vance and Ron Johnson. On October 20th, 2023, he pled guilty in Georgia State Court to a single felony charge of conspiracy to file false documents, a charge which did not automatically strip him of his law license. In exchange for a light sentence that included no prison time, he agreed to turn over documents and other evidence relating to the case and to truthfully testify against the remaining 15 co-defendants, which included Trump. Currently, Chesbro faces ethics complaints filed by lawyers defending American democracy with the New York and California Bar Associations. The New York ethics complaint alleges violations of New York Professional Conduct Rule 8.4C, which prohibits lawyers from engaging in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation, and Rule 8.4H, which prohibits lawyers from engaging in any other conduct that adversely reflects on the lawyer's fitness as a lawyer. The ethics investigation is likely to focus on three memos that Chesbro drafted for James Troupas while Chesbro was working pro bono for the Trump campaign. Troupas was a former Wisconsin judge whose law firm not only drew the state's pro-Republican gerrymander after 2010, but Troupas also sought to invalidate the use of absentee ballots in Milwaukee and Dane counties, which happened to be the most non-white urban parts of the state. Chesbro's memos, along with the memos authored by former Chapman Law School Dean John Eastman, became the basis for a conspiracy to create slates of alternate electors to support Trump in seven states won by Joe Biden. And these memos offered a blueprint for throwing the 2020 election to Trump. In the first memo, dated November 18th, 2020, Chesbro argued, that unless one side concedes to the other, the real deadline for finding for a finding by the Wisconsin courts or legislature of the winner of the election in Wisconsin was January 6, the date on which Congress would meet in a joint session to count the electoral votes and certify the results of the election in accordance with the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act. At the time the memo was written, Biden had already been declared the winner of Wisconsin by 20,000 votes, and the Trump campaign was still considering whether to ask for a recount in Wisconsin. Setting the hard deadline at January 6 bought the Trump campaign more time to string out its election challenge until, until the electoral votes were finally certified by Congress. But the technical hurdle that the Trump campaign faced was that there was another important statutory deadline before January 6. The Electoral Count Act penned December 14th as the date on which the Electoral College would be voting, when each state's official electors would be chosen to reflect the electoral outcome of every state. And there was no guarantee that Biden's wins in Wisconsin, as well as other states, would be reversed by courts or governors by then. So the question was, what could Trump do if Biden was still ahead on December 14th? Chesbro cooked up a novel idea. He recommended that the 10 electors pledged to Trump and Pence in Wisconsin meet and cast their votes on December 14th, regardless of whether the Trump-Pence ticket is still behind in the vote count and no certificate of election had been issued in favor of Trump and Pence. Chesbro acknowledged in his memo that such, such actions may seem odd, but he concluded that a fair reading of the federal statute suggests that this is a reasonable course of action. We do now know that the plan had been rejected by the lawyers in the White House Counsel's Office as not being, quote, legally sound. But in my view, one could read the November 18th memo a little bit more sympathetically and charitably. Jeffrey Tubin has argued 
if the November 18 memo had been the extent of Chesbro's involvement, it's unlikely that he would be in legal trouble. That memo seemed to be premised on the assumption that any post-election challenges to the counting or the recounting of votes would ultimately be resolved by authorized officials before the outside deadline of January 6. Hence, the elector, the elector scheme may have originally been conceived as a kind of backstop, while the post-election process of recounting and adjudication was underway. In other words, the casting of the pro-Trump ballots on December 14th and their subsequent transmission to Congress by January 6 were merely precautionary measures designed to preserve the Trump campaign's rights and buy Trump more time until Congress finally certified the electoral votes. On the other hand, the memo does contain what seems to me to be a glaring omission, and it jumped out at me as somebody who practiced law for about 10 years as a transactional lawyer. There's nothing in that memo that advises the Trump campaign to provide a disclaimer necessary to prevent misunderstandings about the legal status of these alternate electoral votes. That disclaimer would clearly indicate that the enclosed votes were invalid unless duly ratified according to applicable law. Because those electors lacked the actual authority to cast their electoral votes, those votes could not, without more, legally count as electoral votes. As Jeffrey Tubin also notes, the names on the Trump slate were not any kind of electors, and the documents they transmitted to Congress were no more authentic than if they had created their own driver's license. So without the disclaimer, the Trump campaign would appear to be palming off uncertified electoral votes as legitimate certified ones. And to the extent that the electors had a culpable state of mind, which is an open question, when transmitting their unauthorized votes to Congress without the appropriate disclaimers, they could be engaged in fraud. And Chesbro's failure to recommend such disclaimers seems to be at least negligent. It is telling that local officials that were loyal to Trump in Pennsylvania and New Mexico included in their vote certifications, they included a disclaimer, a caveat, stating that they should only be considered if Mr. Trump prevailed in the many lawsuits he and his allies had filed challenging the election and was legally the winner. But Chesbro, Chesbro wasn't done. His strategy evolved over the next six weeks in ways that I believe were troubling and also more clearly exposed him to legal liability. So in a memo dated December 6, 2020, Chesbro appears to have changed the goalpost for his legal assistance. The December 6 memo reveals that the goal of legal representation was no longer the mere preservation of the Trump campaign's rights in Wisconsin while the legal process of resolving the dispute was underway. The memo appears to have adopted the Trump campaign's broader goal, much more aggressive goal, of preventing Biden at all costs from reaching the necessary electoral votes to win the presidential election. In other words, the goal of his legal advice was to facilitate Trump's being declared the winner without regard to the legal validity of that victory. In my view, this change in Chesbro's objective is evidenced in at least two ways. First, the December 6 memo expressly advocates for the mimicking of the Wisconsin strategy in five other purportedly contested states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. Note that his strategy was subsequently expanded to include New Mexico as well. I believe that the extension of the alternate elector strategy to those six states is significant because it demonstrates a shift in Chesbro's state of mind. His work in Wisconsin was initially reportedly motivated out of a concern that the state's COVID-19 election measures contributed to election administration irregularities that in his mind improperly swung 
swung the vote in favor of Biden in key locales. But a strategy involving six states that have the critical mass to, of electoral votes to swing the entire election looks more like a coordinated effort to ram, ram through a Trump victory without regard to the legal merits. So recently unearthed email evidence shows that the orchestration of the fake elector slates from multiple states was intended to create a cloud of confusion to bring the overall election outcome into doubt and potentially throw the election to the House. The strategy is summed up well in a message authored by James Troupas, who worked with Chesbro. So Troupas explains, and I quote, our strategy, which we believe is replicable in all six contested states, is for the electors to meet and vote so that an interim decision by a court to certify Trump the winner can be executed on by the court, ordering the governor to issue whatever is required to name the electors. The key nationally would be for all six states to do it so that the election remains in doubt in January. So there's other language uh, that suggests an uncritical acceptance of this much more broad and opportunistic goal. And so there are a number of uh, quotations. I'm just going to give you one. So he wrote, Chesbro wrote, it seems feasible that the vote count can be conducted so that at no point will Trump be behind in the electoral vote count unless and until Biden can obtain a favorable decision from the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, upholding the Electoral Count Act as constitutional or otherwise recognizing the power of Congress and not the president of the Senate to count the votes. This memo fails to consider the illegitimacy of a strategy of forcing Biden to resort to an appeal to the Supreme Court as the only avenue for a Biden victory. That failure to me is very problematic because at the time of the memo, Chesbro could not have had, could not have reached, could not have gained sufficient knowledge of facts to conclude that Biden failed to win enough electoral votes to prevail and thus required a Supreme Court intervention in order to be recognized as the winner. The second reason for discerning a shift in the goals of legal representation is that in the December 6 memo, Chesbro expressly advocates that Vice President, Vice President Pence, presiding over the joint session of Congress on January 6, take the position that he alone has the constitutional power to, to not only open the electoral votes, but to count them. This position is based on what many commentators believe is an implausible legal theory supported by John Eastman and Chesbro, that the vice president as president of the Senate is vested with the unilateral and unreviewable legal authority to determine the validity of the electoral votes in the election. This legal theory is premised on what many believe to be far-fetched interpretations of historical precedents relating to John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, and uh, a radical reading of the 12th Amendment, which others, others have criticized. Um, and I'm not going to go into those criticisms yet. For purposes of my analysis, uh, the step to add the vice presidential unilateral uh, authority theory is crucial because it effectively redefines and recharacterizes the purpose of the alternate elector plan. These electors were no longer just a backstop. Instead, they were repurposed to provide Pence with a pretext, right? A rationale for derailing the congressional process of certifying the outcome. The plan as highlighted in memos authored by John Eastman was for Pence to reject Biden's electors in seven states to either reelect Trump or throw the election to the House of Representatives where Republicans held the majority of state delegations and thus had sufficient voting power to declare Trump the winner. Later, we learned from text messages and testimony that Chesbro more clearly advocated for Pence to derail the congressional certification process on January. 
Um, and I think I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So before we continue with our last presentation, was it? Huh? Before we continue with our last presentation, um, I have to read the CLE uh, codes. So for those of you who are recording this uh, for your CLE credit, here it comes. For those attorneys attending today who wish to receive New York State CLE credit for our program, please record the following code. Profession 84Z. I really wanted it to be Kraken, but they didn't let me do that. Um, in order to receive your CLE credits, you must report this code and any others that we give out on our online affirmation form that we, was distributed to you by email and on the Eventbrite page. Again, please record the following code, Profession 84Z. One final time, Profession 84Z. Now, our last presentation will come from Brad. All right, Kraken would have been great. It's a nice Sydney Powell reference that I appreciate. Uh, so I'm in the, in the un, uh, uncomfortable position of, of being, counter to my normal tendency, an optimist. I'm, I'm not normally an optimist. Um, but but the, the question that was asked earlier, you know, are we in a crisis or is, is there a crisis? I actually think the answer may be no. Um, and I think a lot depends on what we define, you know, this is a Clinton line, depends on what it means. Um, so what, what is it? And, and you know, I, I think our, our politics or our public life, our public discourse may be in crisis, but I actually think the legal profession is doing all right. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the cherry picking or the focus on only the bad lawyers obscures what I'm calling the good lawyers of January 6th. And that's, that's the name of this paper that I'm working on. I've been meaning to write this paper for a while. Um, and I'm really interested in this subject. And it, I come at it in sort of a roundabout way. I, I taught for a number of years a business ethics class in the, the graduate MBA program at Cornell. We had law students and MBA students, and I, I co-taught it with a business ethics professor. And we, we didn't do the standard normative business ethics, shareholder value, blah, blah, blah. We, we looked at ethical failures in organizations. And, and we looked at Enron or the Volkswagen uh, emissions cheating or the GM ignition switcher, whatever, you know, big ethics fiascos. And we, we took a diagnostic perspective. We tried to figure out why did this go wrong um, and, you know, dug into the reporting. And then you know, my co-teacher and I realized we can't end this way. We, we have to look at organizations that do it well. We're, we're, we're educators, right? We're, we're, we're teaching these business managers and lawyers to go out into the world and, and do it well. And we want to look at some examples of, of where it's done well. And so we studied that for the last like third of the class. And, and that's something I think we shouldn't lose sight of in looking at Chesbro and Eastman and Powell and Giuliani and, and all of those lawyers. Um, we should look at the good lawyers. And, and my little set of good lawyers of January 6th comprises a lot of real movement conservative lawyers. So it's interesting that these are folks who are ideologically aligned with the Trump administration in a lot of ways and are also ideologically aligned with a kind of Federalist Society style movement conservatism. Yet the, the House report on the January 6th insurrection, a lot of reporting shows that Chesbro, Eastman, they had these cockamamie schemes, but they didn't go anywhere. And they didn't go anywhere because there were a bunch of lawyers who said no. Uh, and so like in my business ethics class, I want to think about why that is. And, and let's try to use that as the basis for thinking about education and, and possibly regulation, although I'm a skeptic of, of more regulation or more rules in this area. So you know, these lawyers famously included White House counsel Pat Cipollone, uh, Mike Pence's personal lawyer, uh, his counsel Greg Jacob, uh, a guy in White House counsel's office named Eric Hirschman, who had a famous profanity-laced stream of advice to John Eastman, which is very funny to read. Um, and then um, Mike Ledig, you know, all these lawyers went and consulted him. A every article you read about Mike Ledig, he's inevitably introduced as conservative icon, former Scalia clerk, J. Michael Ludig. And, you know, he was someone who provided a lot of advice, uh, Jeffrey Rosen, the acting attorney general. And uh, he's also inevitably described as even Bill Barr, um, you know, the, the former attorney general uh, who, who, you know, leaned forward a little bit to help Trump in a lot of ways as AG. All of these lawyers refused to advise Pence that he had the constitutional and statutory authority to do what, what Chesbro and, and Eastman said that he should do. And, and you know, 
I, I think we should ask, you know, why is that? And one hypothesis, and I'm a lawyer and a philosopher, I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist, I don't know these guys, I don't have this from talking to them, but I think if you look at their, uh, at their advice and, and their actions, what that reveals is a commitment to the rule of law as a principle of professionalism that isn't necessarily something that is susceptible to being pinned down in a rule of professional conduct uh, or enforced by professional disciplinary action. Rather, it's the kind of thing that influences the way we interpret those things. Um, so it, it, it truly belongs to the domain of ethics and not of rules. I dislike the term legal ethics to refer to the rules of professional conduct because I think it, it, it elides the sense in which these are actually positive law rules. They're enacted, they're meant to be enforced, they're subject to you know, due process, vagueness, and overbreadth concerns. Whereas ethics is really more about what we as professionals bring to the task of representing clients uh, before courts or, or giving them advice. And the rule of law fits in there. And so one of the things that I do in the paper is look at a lot of criticism that has been raised against the bad lawyers of January 6th, including Eastman and Chesbro. And a lot of the, and it's actually very hard to pin down the right level of generality for stating this criticism. A lot of critics say they're subverting democracy or they're undermining the rule of law or they're eroding faith in the legal profession or something like that. I mean, that may be true at some high level of generality, just as it's true in the model rules preamble that lawyers have an obligation to uphold the rule of law or democracy. But these aren't enforceable duties. They're, they're attitudes, they're stances. Um, they are, to use a currently trendy term in the ABA, aspects of professional identity. Um, but they're not the kind of thing that we can regulate in the same way that we regulate you know, false statements to tribunals or, or, or something like that. So what I'm recommending here is a regulatory strategy that doesn't rely on professional disciplinary enforcement. One thing that I think is that's vulnerable to is the so-called weaponization or lawfare criticism. You know, as soon as you bring disciplinary charges against someone like John Eastman, the very first thing he and his supporters are gonna say is, aha, look, there you go. There's the, you know, there's the Democrats weaponizing the disciplinary process. They're using this to hound me because I'm representing their political opponent or an unpopular client or something like that. Now, there's a response to that there's a way of responding to the weaponization critique, and that is to show some kind of content neutral or politically neutral criteria that were violated. Sometimes the rules are really good at that, right? If you're talking about a false statement of fact to a court or a frivolous lawsuit, you can say, look at Sidney Powell. She was sanctioned in multiple federal court proceedings. Here's a criterion that is ideologically neutral that we can use to say she deserves professional discipline. But it's really hard in some of these cases like Eastman and Chesbro, where the, the essence of the misconduct is really giving advice that's kind of meh, not very well supported, really adventurous, really creative, however you want to describe it. But that's the problem. And then, you know, to pick up on, on something Becky said, these are contestable ideas. These aren't content neutral or ideologically neutral criteria. These are things that we fight about as lawyers and so much the better. That's what lawyers do. But whether this advice that was given by Chesbro or Eastman was adequately supported or was too aggressive is the sort of thing that people are going to disagree about. So if we just refer this to the disciplinary process, we're just going to transfer that disagreement to the disciplinary process, and it will be open to this critique that this is just another you know, way of weaponizing a legal institution against unpopular positions. So what, what I think we as, certainly as educators, so all of us up here are in the law school business, um, I, I, I'm not sure maybe you know, bar leaders and judges and, and folks like that also have a role in this, but I think the answer to how do you prevent more Eastmans and Chesbros is you cultivate more Jacobs and Cipollones and Rosens and Hirschmans. Um, and you didn't do that by regulating these folks. You didn't do that by threatening them with discipline. You know, if you look at their testimony in various proceedings, none of them said, oh boy, I was afraid of losing my law license. They said, no, you can't do that. There, there was something really bedrock in the way they approached their professional duties in the way they approach their identities as lawyers, which is the backstop. That's what prevented a debacle, more of a debacle, uh, on January 6th. And I, I just don't 
see a future in more discipline and more regulation. These state disciplinary agencies are these small underfunded offices for the most part. Some of them are, Illinois is pretty big and, and, and pretty beefy, but most of them are pretty small. And anything of any sort of political significance is going to attract enough funding and high powered legal talent representing the Chesbros and Eastmans to completely overwhelm these disciplinary agencies in addition to opening up the lawfare or weaponization critique. Um, but I, I don't think we have to tune up the rules of professional conduct, amend them, file more disciplinary grievances. I think what we have to do is more of what worked in producing the Jacobs and Eastman, uh, not Eastman, the uh, uh, Hirschmans and, and Rosens and, and, and those good lawyers. And that's what I think we should be attentive to doing as legal educators, to be emphasizing what the rule of law means when advising private clients, how it requires lawyers to interpret law as applicable to their client situations, but also with reference to the public purposes of the law. Now, I'm not saying the public interest. I'm not saying lawyers are acting directly on the public interest, but rather they are seeking to give a good faith interpretation of the law insofar as they are advising clients. That's what the rule of law means. And I think that's what the, the lawyers who stood up to Chesbro and Eastman on January 6th were, were animated by. So, so I'd like to see us pay more attention. You know, I'm all for you know, making fun of Sidney Powell and, and Rudy Giuliani. Um, but, but I think we should pay more attention to what the good lawyers did right and try to build that into our professional education and socialization process. Um, so that's the thing. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you, Brad. Um, we agreed that we're going to have a chance to talk to each other in front of you. If you would like to ask a question, students shall get mics and will um, be available to give you a mic after we have a brief chance to talk to each other. My, uh, I'm going to take a chance to talk to you. So um, I'm going to ask a question, I guess it goes in to, to all of you, but it is motivated a bit by the last thing that Brad said, which echoes something which Becky said, which is that um, the, uh, the optimistic view is that when um, good lawyers model good behavior, uh, we, can, uh, want, we can outweigh the conduct of the bad lawyers. Right? That's something Brad suggested. Uh, Becky said that when uh, we limit the discipline of lawyers to very clear, neutral mechanisms, like disciplining someone we're making a misrepresentation tribunal. So Sidney Powell becomes the sort of lever by which we communicate to the public that bad lawyers are wrong and they shouldn't listen to them. My response is, um, but look at what's happened. What's happened is that uh, since the onset of this um, flood of misinformation to the public by people who have been authorized by the bars to speak as attorneys, since that began after the 2020 election, the number of people in America, mostly Republicans, but the number of people in America who believe that the election was stolen has increased, not decreased. So to the extent that you think that good lawyers have modeled behavior that have shamed the bad lawyers so that no one believes them, or to the extent that you think that this morning proceedings have picked out the most egregious conduct in a way that has helped provide with um, clear examples of why you shouldn't trust those lawyers, that message has been lost because the message of those bad lawyers that there was fraud, that there, you know, just to quote something that was said, that the vice president is vested with the unilateral and unreviewable legal authority to determine the validity of electoral vote, which is a completely fallacious claim. There are more people who believe that now than two years ago. So I, I want to hear what your response is. Well, I'll just, real, just say it real quick. I, I don't think people have any belief with respect to that claim that you just said. I think they believe the election was stolen and, and, and they believe all the, you know, the big lie. But so when I said, I don't think there's a crisis, I was very clear to say in the profession, I think there's a crisis in you know, background public discourse for sure, you know, in, the, in the media environment and there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. I, I, just, I, I just want to avoid piling that onto the legal profession somehow and saying, ah, what we got to do then is regulate lawyers differently because I just don't think there's a causal connection between the, a couple of outlandish cl claims that are reported by Eastman and Giuliani and, and a much, much broader pervasive culture of, 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 of 
believing things that are false. I just think it's a huge problem beyond the capacity of professional regulation to reach, apart from the First Amendment issues, which I'll defer to Becky. Right, right. I mean, I would just say, first of all, at least as, insofar as Eastman is involved, he didn't say that. Um, he really didn't. Like, if you look at the memos, he gave various different possibilities and one of them was that which he wrote bold and he wasn't proposing it and he never proposed it so i i don't i mean i don't i don't think i agree with brad that that wasn't that's not part of the discourse generally i also agree with brad that things are going very badly um generally though not in the legal profession but i would say you know one of the things that i think is problematic is that we're in a bit of a spiral and that i think you know, in order to, I don't know, I mean, this is maybe a question for Brad, but I think in order to create more of those good lawyers, we need to have institutions within the legal profession, including our law schools that are, um, that are ideologically neutral. Because if people start to silo into different institutions, law firms, law schools, and we have conservative law schools and liberal law schools, conservative law firms and liberal law firms, as we increasingly have, people will start to mistake the broader meaning of the law with what is what they what their ideological wish that it would be what makes it possible to have a more robust understanding of the public meaning of the law is being with people whom you respect and disagree with who have different views of the law it makes you think more broadly about the limits of you know what you can manipulate for ideological reasons and so i'm concerned and i'm concerned about the legal profession for that reason i'm concerned about the world for a whole number of reasons but i agree with Brad, that what you're pointing to is more of a problem with the world than with the legal profession. Can I just say one thing, or well, a couple of things in response to all of that. So um, you've kind of proven my point here about my concern with respect to disciplinary authorities and transparency and uniformity, and that I think we may very well see discipline in the Eastman case, where Becky's made some good points where we shouldn't have it, you mentioned Sidney Powell, and she was sanctioned by the courts, but so far the, the Texas Bar has not done anything with her law license. We might not see discipline there. And so that to me would be um, you know, problematic for, for a number of reasons. If we want to concede that you know, where she's pled guilty to the criminal indictment and she's been sanctioned by a federal court, it seems to me that's a, um, an easier case to make for bar discipline than the Eastman case, to be sure. I worry, I wish Brad's solution that you know, legal education was gonna save us all would, would save the day, because that's the business we're all in. And I know I'm not being entirely fair to what you're saying, but, but I, I worry about that because it's, it's not lost on me. Uh, Greg Jacob was a classmate of mine at the University of Chicago. We graduated the same year, so maybe we got the right ethics training. Um, but uh, John Eastman was also a Chicago grad, uh, a few years ahead of us. Uh, you know, we were getting the same education, and yet it manifested in, in maybe very different ways. And in fact, Greg Jacob testified at, at Eastman's disciplinary hearing, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he, he talked about being ashamed of what he was seeing from his colleagues in the legal profession on January 6th. And so I, I don't know that education is going to be enough, which is why I think there is a role to be played uh, by organizations that want to come forward and require transparency and openness and accountability um, with both sunlight and public education, education to lawyers. Um, which, anyway, I'll leave it there for now. So do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so. I, I do find myself ag both agreeing and disagreeing with some of the things I've heard. I, I do believe, I do agree that discipline has its limits. Um, the rules tend to be weakest where harms to third parties and the rule of law and American democracy are concerned. Um, the rules are strongest when it comes to protecting the client's interests, which of course is not at issue in these, in these cases. Uh, the principal victim of a lot of this legal advice uh, were third parties, right? They're American citizens and the rule of law and the professional conduct rules that the legal profession has drafted, right? We, we drafted them, don't really look out for third parties. Also, professional discipline does work best when the infraction at issue involves an intentional misrepresentation of facts, um, it works less well when, we, when we're talking about legal interpretations. 
Um, at the same time, the foundation of Chesbro's legal advice had a false factual basis. Rule 11 requires lawyers before they file a complaint to do a preliminary factual investigation. Did Chesbro do that? So let me quote from Chesbro himself. So he gave an interview with Talking Points Memo, and these are the things he said, because it ultimately goes to the state of mind. Whether or not he gets punished with professional discipline will hinge, will depend on his state of mind. Um, so this is what he said. He said, I'm not saying that Trump deserved to win in each state. I'm saying it was legitimate to argue under Article 2 that there was a problem. Now, the problem with his statement is he didn't just argue that there was a problem with Article 2, right? He not only recommended creating a cloud of confusion such that the only way Biden can win would be with the help of the Supreme Court, but he also actually helped implement the alternate elector plan and in fact assisted in some of the electoral votes being transmitted to Congress without the disclaimer. Um, and it doesn't seem like he actually gained much new knowledge about the alleged election irregularities in 2020 to justify his much more radical position later on, as you can see in the subsequent memos. Um, he once said that he believed election integrity has become a high profile issue. Uh, Talking Points Memo asked him why. What was his response? I don't know enough about the field to comment. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta wonder where his state of mind is. And I'm, I'm not certain that bar prosecutors will ab be able to really persuasively convince that he had a culpable state of mind. But, you know, a lot of the things he says, do, ha says raises a question to me. So let's throw this open. I see we have a question from the audience. And Jeremy will walk around. It might be see anyone who wants to ask a question. So 
So, but uh, Becky, uh, sorry, uh, Kester, I'm yeah. trying to channel Becky, and Becky can yeah. defend. But here's the question, I think. So, they can say all that all that they want uh, between each other. They can say all that they want on, to their client about this. But as long as they don't make a misrepresentation to a tribunal, the other side will have an opportunity to rebut it. Where's the harm? I, I think one of the points, and part of it, I want to make sure you all have access. So as you're doing this professional work, you can make sure people can see it. But also, I think one of the problems we have in doing this you know, is that particularly when you are talking about lawyers providing advice, they will not produce a document that show that it wasn't legitimate legal advice because they are able to like attorney conflict. Now we've litigated that in motions to compel, which has happened in some of the criminal litigation on, on fraud assertions, right? But I think it's a real problem when, when we're talking about taking things at face value that maybe look like this is legitimate legal advice versus a scheme to actually over rule the vote, over overthrow the vote. And maybe you're right, that's not in the to a legal tribunal, but in many ways it was when you're going in and that is, that is um, uh, uh, the word for cover, like, right? In some cases, there was a DNA litigation, but that hurry up and file litigation before. I mean, I would just say that, you know, all of the First Amendment concerns I have would go away if these lawyers are actually assisting somebody in a, crim in a criminal case and have been convicted of a crime. I, I personally think there's some problems with the um, charges against the lawyers in Georgia and um, the uh, theory behind the unindicted co-conspirators in the January 6th case. But um, if that's proven, then, um, you know, then people, I mean, some states you automatically lose your license. So I don't have a problem with that. And, and I think what you're saying actually goes to my point, which is this is far better dealt with in courts than in the state um, bar disciplinary proceedings where they don't have the resources to handle these kinds of questions. They don't have the um, expertise to do. I mean, I prosecuted lawyers, it's hard. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I have nothing to say about that except for it sort of proves my point, which is I just think bar disciplinary proceedings are the wrong way to treat this. Can so, I drop one little quick well, footnote? I? I'll just drop one little footnote in there. I think one place to watch this argument play out is as we see the Georgia indictment potentially un, un, unfolding or devolving for uh, different reasons. Uh, yeah, um, what what happens, um, and maybe there's a role, I'll just push back a little bit on your point now, Becky, maybe there is a role for bar discipline, and I think we'll see it with respect to Jeffrey Clark, who, um, so the DC uh, hearing will start March 26th, and that's um, a very concrete disciplinary action based on his uh, so-called like, proof of concept letter uh, that he authored that, uh, to Brad's point, um, people like Rob Rosen said this, we you know would not sign off on it. And if um, the criminal process doesn't play out for whatever reason, is there a role in a situation like that for the bar disciplinary authority? I think there might be. Okay, now, all right. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you to this panel, the other panel, and for Dan Goldman. And is it on? I think so. Yes, okay. I think you're all very terrific and very wonderful, and you present very interesting points of view. And I'll tell you where the harm is. You have, not you, you, but the whole idea that opinion and creative thinking doesn't harm me as public for me is wrong. This whole thing that happened with Trump is wrong. What's the fact? Did Joe Biden get 7 million plus more votes than Donald Trump? The answer is yes. And that's, that's what I think is important and what's missing from all this discussion. There is higher authority. There is morality, there is ethicality, which you need to establish and you're, you're thinking about discipline. And that's very important because the truth is that as the public, there is so much spin, I am dizzy. So, but I wanna thank you because I think your discussion is wonderful. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna have lunch soon, but uh, we have time for one more question. Anyone wanna ask a question? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. This way, this, we're going to pretend like you're still here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I am incredibly conscious of keeping everybody in line. So <laughs> I have about 14 questions I want to ask. I know where y'all live. 
Do you want a microphone or not? What's that? Do you need a microphone? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I have I have serious um, concerns about the First Amendment analysis that you presented, but I actually that's not so so we can talk about that at lunch or or otherwise maybe. I guess I want to try posing the the concern that I have with this analysis in because in my other hat I wear sort of international law uh, other hat I guess um, and here right this the the entire strategy right the let us flood the zone with disinformation right this is a hundred percent straight out of the what folks in political science call the authoritarian playbook right so if so if you are Vladimir Putin right uh, and it's highly conscious, it's very well developed. You don't need state propaganda anymore. Um, and it's not just Putin, but he's a wonderful poster child for this strategy. You say, oh no, what happened in Ukraine is there were little green men, or you say, no, it was somebody else who invaded, whatever. You don't have to like force government lies on the public's throat. All you have to do is create enough confusion that people tune out, right? It's a highly developed, well understood strategy. And this is what, um, modern authoritarians rely on to destroy democracy okay so we are lawyers i disagree with the obligate the idea that lawyers duty is solely to the court i don't think that's borne out actually in in law or the the rules either but from that point of view right from the point of view that the lawyers are sort of the front end of the spear with courts which are this knowledge protecting institution right we don't have many in society we've got universities we've got scientific method we've got courts for creating socially shared understanding of facts right and from a democracy point of view from a constitutional democracy point of view in which the difference between us and them is the rule of law right decisions based on facts and evidence as opposed to based on arbitrary whim or views, right? Um, don't we need to take this a little bit more seriously, right? From a First Amendment point of view or, or any others? Well, just real quick, you mentioned the authoritarian playbook. Here's the, I say this in the paper, but here's my weird optimism coming back again. Um, Trump has the odd for authoritarians, I guess, desire to have legal justification for stuff that he does you know he's not just saying i'm going to do this and you can't stop me he's saying i want my lawyers to approve this yeah but so so that, and right so that's the difference right so so somehow we still have a legal institution a, a legal profession that isn't doing that whereas they're much more pliant in in hungary or turkey or or uh, russia so you know that's it, it, you know look i'm not i'm not i'm not so optimistic that i think it's going to stop every would-be authoritarian from their schemes in every case. But all I'm saying, and I'm not saying that legal education is going to solve everything either. All I'm saying is I just want to look at those lawyers that said no and, and, and figure what can we distill out of those the, those case studies and figure that out. And that's what we ought to be working on. But, but you know, right now the legal profession is still serving that backstop role. Cool. You know, for now, I, I, I worry very much about who will be in government in a subsequent Trump administration. Um, I, Trump knows better than to pick sort of movement establishment conservative lawyers. Um, so there, there are a lot of reasons to be pessimistic. So I'm just this tiny little candle in the darkness. That's all. <laughs> I would just say very quickly that we do know the authoritarian playbook. What's less, what's harder to know is how to fight the authoritarian playbook. And I think it's not with more authoritarianism, it's with more democracy. And that's why we have to be very careful about the First Amendment. And I disagree with you about, um, about the First Amendment analysis, which I've written about with Professor Bruce Green elsewhere, and we can talk about. So I agree with De Deborah's concerns. If you look at the scholarship of Kim, Kim Lane Shepala, what what happens in all these uh, countries um, where there's democratic black backsliding is that lawyers are at the forefront of helping these authoritarians dismantle the rule of law and to gut the constitution of our rights and sometimes the judiciary is complicit in it so as a general matter the argument that x or y is not the appropriate venue for dealing with these types of situations those types of arguments are not very attractive to me. So think about the second Trump impeachment, right? Mitch McConnell did not whip his Republicans into voting uh, in favor of impeachment. What did he say? We'll see how the courts take care of it. We'll let the courts, that's the proper venue for taking care of Trump. 
Well, wh where has that gotten us, right? We're, we're off the cusp of the next election, and you know he has been indicted, but he hasn't been prosecuted, and he's on the verge, possibly, I have hope, I'm optimistic, he has, he has, there's a possibility that he may win the next election, and that will create severe democratic backsliding in the US. So these arguments about the moral division of labor to me sound a lot like uh, the abdication of moral responsibility. Okay, and with that, uh, with that, we are going to come to a conclusion. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a lovely lunch behind you, and I want to thank our, our panelists very much. And so we're gonna continue our program now with our third and final panel of the day. Although as soon as we conclude this panel, we have video remarks that have been sent in to us by Representative Jamie Raskin. So I hope you'll all stay for that at the conclusion of this panel. Um, so our third and final panel of the day focuses on the use of the courts and criminal prosecution in particular, although not exclusively, to hold political opponents accountable for unlawful conduct. How can we ensure that such actions are just and legitimate and critically are perceived as such um, when there is a risk that in the wrong hands, prosecution can be so-called weaponized um, and used for political ends that are not legitimate? Um, how should a prosecutor consider in deciding whether to bring charges that the prosecutor thinks are founded in the law and the evidence against a political opponent? Um, and whereas the rule of law interests that are promoted by pursuing such charges, I think are fairly easy to articulate. The interests that are served by not bringing charges in those circumstances may be harder to articulate, and how to weigh those competing interests can be a challenge. Obviously, the context for our discussion today is the unprecedented number of prosecutions against former President Donald Trump and his agents for their efforts to subvert the electoral process and other illegal acts, some going back to his career as a businessman, and candidate Trump's pledge to prosecute political opponents if he retakes the White House. But I certainly hope our discussion will not be limited exclusively um, to the context of the Trump administration um, and prosecutions. Um, the goal is to analyze these developments and also draw upon others from recent history to understand how we got to the point where a significant portion of the public does view, for example, the Department of Justice and other prosecutors as having been weaponized um, and pursuing uh, prosecutions for political ends. So we have an extraordinary panel of experts to help us think through these issues from a variety of perspectives, and all of whom have given extensive thought to the power of prosecutors, prosecutorial discretion, and the responsibility of prosecutors for helping to preserve our constitutional democracy. So Deborah Perlstein, who's to my immediate left, is director of Princeton's program in law and public policy and is the Charles and Marie Robertson Visiting Professor in Law and Public Affairs at Princeton. Until very recently, she was my colleague at Cardozo, uh, where she served for over a decade as a beloved pro uh, professor um, and colleague, um, teaching classes in constitutional law and international law, among other sub subjects, and also was a co-director of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy, which is one of our co-sponsors here today. She holds a JD from Harvard Law School, and after earning her law degree, she clerked for Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. Um, she also worked in private practice, and she was the founding director of the Law and Security Program at Human Rights First. Following her departure from practice, she was appointed a research scholar um, at SPIA, which is at Princeton. Yes, SPIA. SPIA. It used to be called the Woodrow Wilson School. Woodrow Wilson, that, okay, that people may know. <laughs> so that's what she did for four years before she came to Cardozo in 2011, and her work on the U.S. Constitution, international law, and national security has appeared widely in law journals and the popular press. She's frequently quoted as an expert source and has repeatedly testified before Congress. And before she went to law school, she served as a senior editor and speechwriter in the White House for <laughs> President Bill Clinton. And today she also serves on the U.S. State Department Advisory Committee on Historical Diplomatic Documentation which focuses on ensuring the timely declassification and publication of government records surrounding major events in US foreign policy. <clears throat> um, Daniel Richman, who is to Deborah's left, is the Paul J. Kellner Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, where he also teaches and writes about criminal adjudication, federal criminal law sentencing, cybersecurity, data privacy, and surveillance law. He is the co-author of a leading textbook on federal criminal law, 
and his prolific scholarship addresses, among other subjects, prosecutorial discretion and the power of prosecutors to shape criminal law. And like Deborah, his expertise has been called upon frequently by Congress and the press, and he is a recipient of Columbia University's Presidential Award for Teaching. Uh, Dan holds a JD from Yale Law School, and after he earned his degree, he clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall on the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge, uh, Chief Judge Wilfred Freinberg on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. He is a former prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, uh, yeah, yeah. where he was <laughs> Chief Appellate Attorney and worked in both the Organized Crime and Narcotics Units. And before joining the faculty um, at Columbia in 2007, he also taught at Fordham Law School and at the University of Virginia School of Law. And Dan has also served as an advisor to former FBI Director James Comey, as a consultant to the US Department of Justice and Department of Treasury, and as chairman of the Local Conditional Release Commission under New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Uh, to Dan's left is Robert House, who is the Lloyd C. Nelson Professor, Professor of International Law at NYU School of Law. His wide-ranging teaching and research focus on international economic law and legal and political philosophy. Um, he is a co-founder and co-convener of the New York City Area Working Group on International Economic Law and serves on the American Bar Association Working Group on Investment Treaties. He is the author, co-author, or co-editor of numerous award-winning books and articles about international law and trade, and he is the author of a book about the German-Jewish immigrant philosopher Leo Strauss, called Leo Strauss, Man of Peace, which focuses on Strauss's views about the dangers to free thought and civil society when intellectuals and philosophers ally themselves with movements that advocate violence. Rob received his BA in philosophy and political science and an LLB from the University of Toronto. He holds an LLM from Harvard Law School. He has a, been a visiting fellow at numerous institutions around the world and serves on the editorial boards of numerous prominent uh, publications. And before he pursued legal studies, he held a variety of posts with the Canadian Foreign Ministry including as a member of the Policy Planning Secretariat and a diplomat at the Canadian Embassy in Belgrade. He participated in 1994 with South African academics and politicians in, drafting, in a drafting committee that produced the design of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission and has advised numerous other government agencies and international institutions. So he brings a truly unique perspective to our discussion today. And Mary McCord is Executive Director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, ICAP, at Georgetown University Law Center, where she is also a visiting professor. At ICAP, Mary leads a team that brings constitutional impact litigation at all levels of the federal and state courts, addressing a wide variety of areas, including First Amendment rights, immigration, criminal justice reform, and combating the rise of private paramilitaries. She graduated from Georgetown University Law School and served as a law clerk for Judge Thomas Hogan of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. She was the Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the U.S. Department of Justice from 2016 to 2017, and Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for National Security from 2014 to 2016. And before that, she served as an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia for nearly 20 years, where, among other positions, she served as a Deputy Chief in the Appellate Division and Chief of the Criminal Division. She is a statutorily designated amicus curiae for the FISA Court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, um, and for its Court of Review, and served as legal counsel for the U.S. Rep House of Representatives Task Force 1-6 Capital Security Review that was appointed by then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi after the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. She has written about domestic terrorism, unlawful military, militia activity, public safety, and the rule of law for numerous publications. And among her many other activities, she's the co-host of the MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump, which I listen to regularly. Um, I'm Jessica Roth. I'm a professor at Cardozo Law School and co-director of the Jacob Burns Center for Ethics and the Practice of Law. I'm also a former federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York. And it is my great pleasure and honor to have these speakers with us today to discuss these really important topics. So we're going to turn it first over to Professor Paisa. Oh, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much to my friend um, and beloved former colleague, and actually still colleague, because you know we're still doing law stuff, um, Jessica Roth, and to uh, Tony Seabach, who helped put this together, and Michael Hertz, and my many friends on the faculty, Pollock is sitting right there, and former students. It's truly wonderful to be back here, and I am just genuinely honored to be on this 
panel in which I otherwise feel like something of a black sheep <laughs> as a non-former federal prosecutor. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, yes. Um, so, uh, so, so I'm thrilled to be here and, and want to talk about how I approached thinking about what to say on this panel because I'm not, right, I'm not an expert in criminal law as such. Um, I have expertise in constitutional law and constitutional democracy and national security. Um, and from that point of view, um, when I was trying to form a sort of rough question, I thought, okay, so the question I want to know the answer to is how sh worried should we be in a constitutional democracy um, when an administration of one party uh, prosecutes a political candidate of another party, right? This is actually a pretty old problem in constitutional democracies. It's not uh, the first time that ours or, or others have faced it in one form or another. Um, and if I were going to put the question in slightly more formal terms, I would say, how should we balance the potential democracy harms of prosecuting elected leaders against the rule of law imperative of holding government figures accountable for legal wrongdoing? Um, my answer is, uh, there's some things to worry about, right? But I want to systematically unpack what exactly those worries are. Um, some of them, I think, we have to do some things about, and some of them, I think, are not things that we or the law should uh, worry about unduly. Um, and when I say some of these things are things we should worry about, they may be, there may be security concerns and others, uh, but there are only a certain set of concerns that I think really pose harm to constitutional democracy. So what I want to do is start by defining some terms, um, and we can talk about whether those are the right definitions or, or not as we go through, uh, but I thought it'd be useful to at least get some on the table uh, because we use these terms, constitutional democracy and, and, and rule of law and the like all the time, but, but often use them in different ways. Then I want to sort of walk through what I think the harms are that I hear talked about a lot and the ones that I think are maybe three that I'm not so worried about and the two that I am really worried about and then say a few words about what I view as a risk management challenge, right? How to minimize the risks uh, in the course of these prosecutions that we're gonna cause the constitutional democracy harms that I worry most about. Okay, so first some definitions. Um, what kind of trials am I thinking about here? What kind of prosecutions am I thinking about here, right? We prosecute federal officials and state officials and elected leaders all the time for all kinds of things in the ordinary criminal course. So if an elected leader in, say, I don't know, New Jersey is hiding, I don't know, say, gold bars in his sock drawer, um, right? This is the kind of thing for which he should be prosecuted. Um, and, and it is also not the kind of thing as a general matter that I worry a lot about from a constitutional democracy uh, point of view. Of course, all prosecutorial power can be corrupted. It can be used for political purposes and all kinds of other things. Uh, but when there's actually some very concrete criminal allegation uh, at issue, we have grand juries, we have juries, we have this enormously elaborate system uh, of checks that are designed to um, that are designed to ensure that this is a genuinely fact-based prosecution um, and, and not a criminal and not some sort of um, badly motivated uh, prosecution. And, and those kinds of cases I want to set aside for these purposes. When I talk in this context about political trials or political prosecutions, I really want to talk about a pretty narrow set um, of, of cases that I think pose special concerns. The first are um, criminal charges against an elected leader because of conduct while that elected leader was in office, right? So um, this would be a case like if Nixon had been prosecuted criminally post Watergate, say after he left uh, the White House, which did not happen, and I'll come back to that maybe briefly um, in a little bit. Um, so that's one kind, right? Criminal prosecutions against elected leaders for stuff they've done in office. And, and the second is criminal charges against anyone based on sort of core political acts or views, right? And by this, I mean prosecutions for things like sedition um, or insurrection or treason, right? And these are offenses that have existed in one form or another in US history for a long time too, right? And you can imagine why in those contexts there are special risks that arise to constitutional democracy, and I'll, I'll talk more about them, but those are the kinds of cases I'm most worried about. I will note that in those definitions, the Trump January 6th trial that is, is sort of pending 
is actually both of those, right? So it's it's sort of the trifecta uh, of of complicated political trials, uh, but but it certainly sits at the center of the kinds that I would worry about. Okay, so if that's what I mean by political trials, what do I mean by constitutional? constitutional democracy. Here I'm going to take a, a definition off the shelf, which is, I think, not controversial, but probably worth reminding us of. Right. So constitutional democracy is commonly defined as a system of government featuring, featuring not only regular popular elections, but also independent political and judicial authorities, um, respect for the rule of law, a free press, and at least baseline protections for a certain set of individual freedoms and, and, and civic equality. By stating this definition here, I just want to highlight the fact that when we say constitutional democracy, rule of law, the rule of law is part of that system, right? It's not just about elections. It's not just about protecting elections, although it is certainly that. Um, successful application of the rule of law, including for political crimes, right, signals the strength of a system of constitutional democracy. It reinforces incredibly important norms of fairness and the peaceful resolution of conflicts and all kinds of other things we think are sort of central uh, to our system. And, and similarly, or the corollary of that also follows, the failure to do those, to pursue those crimes, right, especially in highly public matters, weakens all of those norms, uh, both um, in, in very visible ways and I think less visible ways. Okay, so the rule of law here, by the rule of law, I mean the very basic idea that people will be governed by publicly available rules that are known in advance and applied equally in all cases, according to their terms, and are, and here's the critical part here, binding on both private individuals and the conduct of government itself, right? And it's that last piece of the definition of the rule of law that is what distinguishes constitutional democracies from other systems of government that are non-constitutional democracies. And I won't bring up Putin again, at least not right now. Um, okay, so when I say harms to constitutional democracy, what I'm talking about are serious injuries to the structural interests of constitutional democracy, a concept that extends not only to preserving the integrity of elections, but also to protecting the functional operations of governing institutions, right? Harms that make it impossible for rule of law systems to operate. So just to give a slightly more concrete example, right? If you walk into a courtroom and lie under oath, you're committing perjury. Right? In general, we have free speech in this country, completely. <laughs> Maybe, as the Europeans would say, way too much free speech, right? But, and you might be able to lie, I could lie to you right now, but if I walk into a courtroom and lie under oath, that's not free speech, that's a crime of perjury. And <coughs> lawyers actually have even greater obligations not to lie, not only in court, right, as a matter of ethics obligations and, and eventually criminal obligations as well, but even to other parties in a case in the ordinary in the ordinary course and in other settings as well, right? And we do these things um, in part to protect the administration of justice, right? We impose this burden on speech in part to protect the administration of justice, but in part also, as the courts have said so repeatedly in multiple different contexts, to preserve the public perception and reality of integrity in a rule of law system. Right? Um, so those are the kinds of structural interests that I'm worried about when I talk about harms to constitutional democracy. Okay, so here are like the top, that's, if those are my definitions, here are the harms that I sort of hear a lot about and worried about. Okay, let me start with three harms that I'm not hugely worried about from a constitutional democracy perspective, which is not to say these aren't bad things, I'm just saying, you know, th these are not the harms that, that I think that I think challenge or we should worry about is a challenge to democracy, right? So Eric Posner, for example, had a, um, I think it was an op-ed in the Times or an essay that it was recently that was saying these prosecutions against folks like Trump and others are terrible because you are in essence aiding or martyring uh, the political leader right, essentially aiding the political fortunes by creating a martyr of, of a leader we might, uh, we might worry about, as if this defeats the purpose of criminal prosecution. Of course, the purpose of criminal prosecution is not to destroy someone politically. That would be a 
sort of horrific use of criminal prosecution if that were in fact the goal. And the United States and most other countries in the world have other laws for that purpose. Um, internationally, they're often called lustration rules, but they're rules that apply sometimes through criminal processes and sometimes through non-criminal processes, like, I don't know, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, um, that has the effect of excluding particular wrongdo wrongdoers, right, from participation in the political process, right? And we can talk about whether those ideas, uh, those laws are a good idea or bad idea, um, uh, but, but it's something other than criminal justice, right, which is great at specific deterrence and arguably general deterrence, um, but it is not proven a reliable way over the course of US history um, to secure the popular rejection of behavior normatively, right? So Nixon's behavior we were talking about, I think, is viewed as a sort of normatively really bad example. He was never subject to criminal prosecution. Um, many of the Proud Boys who now have been criminally prosecuted for their role in the insurrection of January 6th um, have been very successfully prosecuted and yet popularly are viewed by a significant fraction of the public as hostages, right? If we're using criminal justice to secure normative condemnation or political exclusion, we're doing it wrong, right? There are other ways of doing that other than through criminal law. Risk two or harm two, I'm not worried about in this context, is the risk of political violence. Now, obviously, I'm enormously worried about the risk of political violence or inflaming the public through the use of these trials. Uh, but Sam Moyne, another scholar, also argued recently, also possibly in the New York Times or somewhere else, um, uh, that the purpose of Section 3, this was in opposition to the use of, of, of this litigation, was to stabilize the country after a civil war, not cause another one, right? So he's worried about if you really do this, you're going to inflame half the country. And, and quite right, right? Quite possibly right. Um, we have to take those risks enormously seriously. We have the FBI, we have the Marshals Service, we have to use them, et cetera. But the point I want to make here about risks of political violence is that this is a risk in prosecution and in non-prosecution of sufficiently high profile cases, right? Now there's one side in this country that has been more prone, right? You can look at the FBI statistics of late uh, to political violence, but they are not alone and we would be making a huge mistake as a matter of national security if we imagine that the political, the risk of political violence only will ever come from one side. The third harm I'm less worried about um, is interference with conduct in office, right? So whether we're pursuing this post office or during office, these, these cases, I think the courts are actually pretty good at managing these issues um, during the presidency, during a political <clears throat> campaign, for example, and we can talk about that in Justice Stevens' opinion and, and, and so forth. Uh, but I actually think the sort of how to do this, how to run a railroad and a campaign at the same time is something we can, we can do and, and, and have done. Okay, so here are the harms that I am worried about when we bring prosecutions of this nature. The first is the risk of abuse of prosecutorial power is especially acute here. And I think it's especially acute here uh, for two reasons. Number one, it's been especially acute historically, right? So uh, the British colonial uh, sort of government famously used treason to put down their political enemies, which is why we now have a treason clause in the Constitution and make it especially difficult to prosecute those trials. Um, and then, comparatively, currently, this has become a very well-known, long-standing um, mechanism that authoritarian governments use to put down their political enemies, see Putin and Navalny and many, many other examples. And we saw elements of this in the last Trump administration um, with, I would argue, the prosecution, the failed prosecution of Greg Craig and certainly threats of using prosecution uh, politically going forward of General Milley and others. This is a serious concern. Authoritarians use this power to retain and consolidate their own power and instill fear. This isn't based on rules known in advance and factual findings. This is an exercise in arbitrary power. This is the opposite of a system of the rule of law. I take that risk incredibly seriously, right? As profoundly the opposite of what we do in constitutional democracies. The second risk I take very seriously is that there will be system failure in this very high profile setting which causes a loss of faith, a loss of public confidence in the rule of law system. 
What do I mean by system failure? Acquittal is not system failure, right? What I mean is something like trial chaos, jury manipulation, or a proceeding in which the judge appears or is biased or corrupt. These visible signs of system weakness can backfire by diminishing public faith in the rule of law itself. This too is not a new concern. In the United States, the fear of actual or the fear of or actual system failure in these contexts is a common reason why major political trials have not always been pursued, right? So Thomas Jefferson and against, Al, uh, against Aaron Burr, not prosecuting Jefferson Davis in Virginia after the Civil War because of the conclusion that you're not going to get a, a jury trial that's going to be fair or unbiased in post-Civil War Virginia. Um, the McWilliams sedition trial, which if any of you read the or, or listen to the Rachel Maddow um, podcast Ultra, which is just a page turning podcast, if that were a thing, um, is, is about that case, right? Gross judicial mismanagement in those very important political prosecutions, Nixon and, and Jaworski's non-prosecution decision. Um, those risks are real. Okay, so how do we minimize those risks? Because they arise in every, they, they theoretically arise in every case, but they are especially acute here and the historical lessons of these prosecutions, I think would be really, um, uh, we would be really foolish to ignore. Here, I think it is critical that there be meaningful norms and accountability inside the prosecutorial body, right? In our country, in the federal government, the Department of Justice. And here is where I worry most profoundly. After Watergate, when we had a similar historical moment, and 24 lawyers facing, you know, more than 24 lawyers who were subject to discipline or criminal prosecution or the like, there was a revolutionary moment in the profession. It is this post-Watergate moment where we get the creation of an Office of Professional Responsibility in the Department of Justice that's designed to internally police prosecutorial ethics, among others. We get, about a decade later, the creation of the Office of an in in Independent uh, Inspector General in the Department of Justice. We get the requirement of law schools across the country for the first time to compel all of their students to take courses in professional responsibility, which didn't exist pre-Watergate, right? The profession responded to the holy cow, two dozen lawyers just helped the president engage in corruption. That seems like a problem for the profession. We should do something about it. Today, a lot of those checks that we put in place, in particular OPR, the Office of Professional Responsibility, and OIG, are not functioning as intended or as they should, and in particular are not functioning internally to police ethics in cases like the one we didn't talk about in the last panel, Jeffrey Clark, very senior Justice Department official who is elevated in one way or another to the highest levels of the Justice Department and engages in not complicated ethical misconduct, just straight up lying. Right? We'll see whether the Clark disciplinary procedure um, succeeds, but in the meantime, I think there are a host of things we can do to strengthen the internal system of disincentives inside the Department of Justice that have fallen into sort of catastrophic disuse um, in the 50 years since war. I'm happy to talk more about that in detail, but I think we have stuff there. Thank you so much, Deborah. I hope we do get into some of those particulars um, in, maybe in the discussion following. Thanks. Ooh, sorry. Um, so we're supposed to talk about the weaponization or the, the risk of weaponization of, of prosecutions. And I do want to focus on, on the federal side, not because that's where the, the main risk is, but because it's the risk I'm most familiar with and the risk that can be most um, grappled with in the sense that in the United States, state prosecution systems are county based. These are elected DAs. DAs do the darndest things. Um, and there are some checks on them. They, you know, they don't have their own police forces. So there is a, a separate level of accountability there. There's the possibility of governors intervening, although that has its own risks. So I, I'm just bracketing the state piece, but, but it's one that we're still reckoning with. They're, they're players that 
mostly because of what state offices do, which is rapes, robberies, murders, and the like, have not been involved in the kind of high wire prosecutions that we're seeing out of Georgia now. Um, this may change, and, and as it changes, it's something we're going to have to think about. Um, on the federal side, I, I think the, the baseline in terms of the risk of, of weaponization should be that there, the Department of Justice is, is quite resilient. Um, you know, I was joking around with, with Deborah, who's, who's writing a, a wonderful piece about the unitary executive theory that has been bandied about in the Justice Department. But, but it's kind of a joke in the sense that there's not a unitary Department of Justice, and there never has been from 1789 on. Um, I think the, these offices, particularly in, in jurisdictions where assistants can walk away and do walk away to, to massive paychecks, and are connected to a, a very rich bar. Um, these are places that can hold their own and have historically held their own pretty well. Um, there's no question that the last few years under Trump have, have heightened the, our concerns, uh, and they should. Um, there are two kinds of challenges we should think about being presented. One is just, what can we do to prevent um, partisan or, or personal prosecutions? on abuse of prosecutorial authority. The other is, is what can we do to, to highlight the, the, the righteousness, the appropriateness of cases that are brought so that they, so that they have some legitimacy? Um, in terms of the first problem, the, the weaponization and, and the bringing of actual cases, um, this is hard. And I certainly don't look to courts to provide much help here. Um, you know, the real risk when it comes to political prosecutions isn't that the facts and the law won't fit. Um, the federal criminal code is, is quite substantial and there'll readily be, be instances of conduct that can be charged under them. The real question is, is not whether technically a statute fits, but whether it's appropriate to bring a charge and what, what the judgment going into that is. Um, I don't think, um, you know, grand juries and petit juries have a role but they have a restrictive role. Um, they're told to look at the facts in the law, and when they get a case, um, presumably under the, 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 the uh, threat model I'm discussing, that the facts in the law will apply. So the question is, can judges add anything? And I don't really think so. Um, some people do. Um, cer certainly, selective prosecution doctrine is, is pretty underdeveloped, and, and probably rightfully so, although I'll note there was just a selective prosecution victory for a bunch of white supremacists out in, uh, in, in the West Coast in the last few weeks. Um, so, so you can win, but you're unlikely to. So the question is, is can, are judges really equipped to think through whether this is the kind of charge that would normally be brought and is appropriate to bring here? And here's where we just don't have a very well-developed vocabulary for discussing this. I think we're gaining a little bit of vocabulary thanks to, to some of the declination statements we're seeing. You know, if you look at um, the statements about not prosecuting, not prosecuting Hillary Clinton and not prosecuting Biden, you certainly get a sense of why Trump really should be prosecuted for what he did in Florida. But it's not something that emerges out of the charging documents. And it's not something I really can expect judges to do very much, except in a very idiosyncratic way. I know plenty of judges who really would add value to the process, but I know plenty of judges who would subtract value from the process. And there's this notion, particularly among law students, that judges are this great free, free space that bring um, wisdom to everything they touch. And the more you know judges, the more you realize maybe not so much. Uh, um, you know. So, so should we add more safeguards? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think the, particularly if you look at the recent history under Trump, the real risk wasn't the bringing of actual cases against enemies. There was probably one example of that. They tried to prosecute Andrew McCabe, the former director of, of the FBI, and it, it, it appears that the grand jury blocked that from going forward. But by and large, that wasn't the real threat. The real threat was um, effort to protect friends. Um, this incredibly bad faith uh, you know, that was mentioned um, in a prior panel, um, papers filed to, to let General Flynn escape prosecution were, were, were criminally negligent or, or just straightforward and bad faith. Um, and anyone who touched those 
I don't know why they're still in the department, and I, I suspect some of them are. Um, that's a risk. There's not much you, that judges can add about to cases not brought. Another risk is, is sort of investigations, fishing expeditions that really harass people. And I guess since everyone's making their own disclaimers here, I was one of the people whose emails and pictures and, and the like were all subject to search warrants. And I spent two years under investigation from the National Security Division and the US Attorney's Office. Um, it so happened that I was innocent and had one of the best lawyers in the country working for me, so it was fine. Um, but, but, but most people don't have that luxury. And you know that really is something that, that it's really hard. Judges will not add any value to that whatsoever. Um, and then there are the efforts to essentially use the Department of Justice as a platform for putting out misinformation. Um, the efforts um, to basically push the US attorney in Georgia to suggest that there was something uh, 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 amiss in the election there. Uh, Jeffrey Clark's efforts. Again, judges will not add, that's essentially harnessing the department's um, reputation um, to commit crimes. And judges will not do anything, many, many of the other things we were discussing in this panel in terms of, as Deb was suggesting, internal reforms within the department may address that, not sure, but judges will add no value. And I don't want to spend much time, but I just want to flag I think in the reading material some of you got, it was there's this proposal by, by Ian Ayers and, and Sri Prakash to, to have a, a prosecutorial jury to pass on, to make sure that all cases being brought forward are righteous. Um, I can't imagine how that works. Um, certainly, they're not going to be reviewing for just facts and law, because that's not where the problem is going to come. And they've really made very little effort to, to flesh out what value is added. And particularly when you think that, you know, you think of former US attorneys in the United States, they're not a font of legitimacy in many cases. You know, the fact that Chris Christie thinks the prosecution is okay or not okay does nothing for me. And, and I suspect it will do nothing for most people. Um, so, well, so, so in terms of cases that are being brought, not sure we have very much to do. Um, except really bolster the professionalism of the department and, and hope for noisy withdrawals. Hope for, this is where leaks to the media really play a big part. Department officials who are pushed to do things um, speak about it. And, and that's a good thing. It's, and it's not necessarily a pleasant thing, but it's really a part of our governance structure. Um, what do you do about the second problem? How to, how to make American people realize that a case that is brought is an appropriate case? And I think that's really hard. Um, I think prosecutors who are bringing these cases should embrace the idea that what they're doing is gonna come under fire. Um, one of the problems in America is that prosecutors don't think enough outside their little world. And tunnel vision is a risk and the fact that what you're doing is gonna be the subject of, of considerable attack I think that's a, that's a feature, not a bug, um, internally. Um, but beyond that, you know, once assuming they're, they're doing the right thing, um, what can they do to show that this is an appropriate case? I'm not sure there is much. They could they push out filings. I think Jack Smith is doing a great job in where appropriate, pushing out filings in, in some cases where you wouldn't expect them, giving more facts than you would expect in a perfectly ethical and legitimate way to, to um, educate the public. So I think more can be done about that. But at a certain point, there are just limits to what, the, what our system can do to convince a polarized population. You know, should the DC case on January 6th go forward and end in a conviction, uh, you can imagine that a, a large chunk of the American population would say that's just what 12 people from DC think. Um, it's, it's not what I think. And I just want to remind you, this is a country where a chunk of the population is, is positive that the moon landing was fake. Um, so you, you just have to remind yourself that, that the idea that you're going to get convince everybody is, is just um, impossible. And you shouldn't even try. And the only, I, I guess the place I'll end, since I don't want to spend too much time, is I want to urge on you um, the, the the, the drug I use during most of the Trump administration, which is history. Um, 
Uh, I'm actually in, in the process of writing a, a, a book on the history of federal criminal enforcement. I'm doing it only from 1789 through 1870. Um, quitting when the department was formed, but I don't have a bit of an afterwards to cover all this. But, but with, when, you, when you really look at the history of federal criminal enforcement, you lose some of that golden age um, feeling that people have when they worry that things are out of joint now. Things have always been out of joint in our country. Um, the federal criminal system is, is reasonably new. It only got scaled up in the latter part of the 20th century and it's only then that it starts to get the kind of clout that it has now because it brings a lot of important cases not involving political figures. And I think it's a large portfolio of cases that really has allowed, you know, going after terrorists, bank robbers, um, fraud, um, that's where you get your clout. And, and yes, this is kind of a quiet argument against independent councils because I think the, the legitimacy of what federal prosecutors do comes from their bringing all these cases. Um, same with the Bureau, which has essentially been in a, a, dis, you know, a defensive crouch since all through Trump. And I think if they stepped up and, and really took more of a, a role in, in enhancing the legitimacy of what federal enforcement is all about, it would be for the good. But beyond that, um, I think we just have to stay with a solace of history and realize that we've survived narrowly, um, not just as a country in, in general terms, but with respect to federal criminal enforcement for quite a long time. You know, we've had attorney general who've been indicted. We've had attorneys general who should have been indicted, but weren't. Um, we've had the president testifying as a defense witness and a corrupt, to defend a corrupt friend of his. But that was the Grant administration, so don't, don't be hating on that. Um, but at any rate, we, we've come a long way, and I, I can't say what we find. I'm not going to buy into this full optimism, but, but I will buy into this, this not running around worrying that we're in an unprecedented crisis that we lack the tools to deal with. Thank you, Dan. Um, we're going to set up for, let's see, You were sounding very optimistic there at the end. I'm sorry. Was, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll beat you later. Yeah. Then you, you brought it down. Yeah. Uh, so I need the um, quicker. Uh, how, maybe, maybe I should, you know, it's, with the slides, it's going to be easy for me to stand up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks very much uh, um, to Jessica and Tony for inviting me and uh, to the Law Review for their vision and skills uh, to uh, support this happening. Um, and especially uh, uh, for a great um, uh, dinner last night to launch, the, uh, 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 to launch the proceedings, which was both very convivial and very tasty, uh, both the food and the wine. Uh, so thank you. Um, so um, this is um, uh, a project that I started a few months ago. Um, and um, uh, it uh, first resulted in a paper that I presented at the philosophy colloquium at my own institution. And, and it's kind of mushroomed um, so that today I'm going to talk about uh, political trials um, and a range of uh, uh, political philosophers' reflections on them, basically going through the, to the 19th century. Um, in further iterations, um, uh, I'm working on um, uh, additional thinkers, uh, Edmund Burke, his prosecution of uh, Warren Hastings, the um, British governor in, in Bengal for corruption, and then into the 20th century, the um, uh, doctoral student of Carl Schmidt, uh, uh, Frankfurt School adept, um, and eventually uh, employee of the, uh, of the um, predecessor to the CIA, Otto Kirchheimer's book, uh, Political Justice, and um, I'm also looking at uh, Judith Sklar, uh, a thinker I'm independently writing another project um, uh, about. 
uh, and uh, some uh, others. And on the suggestion of some of my colleagues when I presented the original paper, um, the final version of the project is intended to, uh, to pair thinkers with uh, accounts of particular historical political trials that influence their, their thought. Um, and so, um, so it's going to become a lot more than it started as. And uh, I have many colleagues and friends to thank for, um, for both their suggestions and, uh, and encouragement. So what are political trials? This goes uh, you know, to um, uh, Deborah's uh, uh, own uh, uh, delimitation of what we're talking about, uh, the kind um, that most of these thinkers were concerned with uh, were trials for abuse of power, attempted coups, uh, actions outside uh, the law of, of powerful political figures, mostly while they were in office. And this sort of corresponds to, you know, the Trump January 6th indictments. Then there are corruption trials, which are very important, and often there are arguments about them being politicized or weaponized by uh, uh, political opponents. That was especially the case of the Lula trial and out of full disclosure, I did some advice to um, Lula's legal team on some of the international arguments they were making, and eventually he came back to politics. And so we also have Netanyahu, who we now have Menendez, and and corruption, you know, means things like bribery, um, you know, influence peddling, um, uh, in some cases actually stealing from the public fisc. Um, then, there, then there are political trials um, that don't really exist so much in the U.S. where um, impeachment re itself refers to crimes and misdemeanors, but, but this is typical in France where you can actually impeach uh, an official for something like dereliction of duty, fundamental disregard of their duties or abuse of their powers. And an example of that was um, some time ago was um, the trial of Laurent Fabius, uh, who was the prime minister of France in connection with his mishandling of the HIV infected blood crisis um, of a few decades ago. Fabius uh, was uh, acquitted and uh, returned to uh, political life after that. Finally, what I'm excluding from this project uh, or uh, philosophers' reflections and theorists, other theorists' reflections on transitional and international trials. Um, uh, there's a lot of contemporary literature on, on these. Uh, Ruti Taitel, Leora Bilski, um, earlier Judith Slar, more recently Philippe Sands. Uh, and so, you know, I leave those uh, to, um, to other scholars um, to write about. Um, so that's the kind of scoping of the project. So what can we learn from political philosophy? Uh, why bother? Um, and uh, that's a question I think is particularly important given that there are real experts here on trials. And, um, and so why turn to political theorists? Um, and so Ronald Dworkin, uh, Dworkin suggested in an essay in the New York Review of Books about civil disobedience that that actually um, what uh, considerations should guide prosecutorial discretion includes matters of political morality that are not and probably could not be settled simply by a positive law and past practice. Uh, Rawls suggests that uh, political philosophy can uh, elaborate instructive conceptions of basic political ideas that help to clarify our judgments about institutions and policies. And, and the question of political trials, as we'll see, is very much for political theorists and a, a question of the appropriate uh, institutions um, uh, that uh, can um, facilitate such trials without the kinds of abuses that um, uh, Deborah was referring to. Um, so let's start with Machiavelli. Um, and so how do I transpose Machiavelli's um, world uh, uh, of um, uh, Renaissance politics of uh, uh, iron and poison, uh, stilettos and dungeons to American experience? I, I, I'll, I'll tell you just one story, and maybe some others here know about it. It's the, it's the, it's the story of, um, and it's a turn of the 20th century story about Governor Goebel in, in Kentucky. 
And so uh, uh, Bill Goebel uh, was a colorful and um, controversial figure who um, uh, uh, killed a man who, with his pistol, who had written a negative article about him in a newspaper in Kentucky. Uh, and then a few years later, he decided to run for uh, governor. Uh, but it, but um, the Republicans were doing well in the state, and so um, uh, uh, ultimately the Republican candidate, uh, Bill Wilson, squeezed out a narrow, eked out a narrow victory uh, over uh, Goebel. Goebel then arranged that the Democrat-dominated General Assembly, it's a bicameral meeting of the Kentucky legislature, meet and, uh, and disqualify enough Republican votes so that he, the Democrat, would actually win the election. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Assembly did that, much to the protest of the Republican minority. There were then threats on Goebel's life. And when he came into the State House to take power, um, uh, he was shot dead uh, as part of a conspiracy uh, that included uh, the Republican candidate, Wilson. Uh, the Republican candidate then fled uh, to Indiana, uh, which refused to extradite him uh, on uh, murder charges. So, I mean, this is not that far away from, you know, I mean, the beginning of the 20th century, some of our lives and, or grandparents' lives, and also not far away from the political world that Machiavelli faced in the Renaissance uh, city-states. And, and if you think, you know, the, the Trump business is bad, you know, um, like resorting to, um, you know, murder is perhaps taking it up a further notch. So what does Machiavelli say? He says that in situations like the Bill Goebel situation, it's much better to have open prosecutions uh, that deal with uh, claims of abuses uh, than to have them settled in mo more covert or informal ways, like uh, by pistols. Um, and so for Machiavelli, political trials um, it allow crushing instantly anyone who attempts things against the state. Um, and that's basically uh, those intended on usurping power or taking power through, um, through illegal means, including, including fraud. Now, Machiavelli's proposal is that these trials be sort of like in, in, in the ancient world, done before the entire uh, political community. Uh, so, or at least, uh, you know, a representative group that would probably include hundreds and hundreds of people in a public forum. So it's, it's he envisages political trials as a form of citizen virtue to uh, curb uh, those citizens who uh, attempt to, um, uh, you know, uh, to subvert the law <laughs> And in order to exercise um, a power that's not legal or legitimate. Um, and so, yeah, uh, why does uh, he opt for such large bodies? He points out that, and from some experiences, um, having only a few judges uh, accuse uh, a few powerful people uh, is a big risk. You can, it can degenerate into one elite uh, basically uh, persecuting uh, another, as he puts it, uh, uh, the few always behave in the mode of the few. So big emphasis on a large, uh, if not huge jury and, and, and totally public a uh, accusations and trials. When we come to Montesquieu, Montesquieu says that he's going to correct Machiavelli. Um, but correct means that he's going to accept Machiavelli's premise that you need political trials to uh, control and deter people who will try and uh, take power uh, outside of the law. Uh, or if they do take power within it, basically consolidate their power in uh, uh, an illegal uh, um, uh, way. Um, but, um, uh, you know, for, for Montesquieu, it's important that there be some leniency, that after an attempt at an insurrection or an illegal seizure of power is put down, that one not uh, engage in generalized vengeance against the people who have, um, have participated in it. So you might pick the ringleaders and, 
and try them, but you might also end up, um, uh, you know, pardoning a lot of people uh, and and being concerned that um, one of your objectives is to heal the divisions in the political community and not simply um, wreak, uh, you know, uh, a severe punishment on those um, who are responsible for the uprising. Um, but Montesquieu also emphasizes leniency is not impunity. Uh, and he says if one examines the cause of the situations where the state was caught with its guard down, one sees that this was due to impunity in the face of crimes and not the moderation of penalties. And I think this emphasizes you know, something that, that uh, Deborah was saying, which is, you know, th this is, uh, these are all risk-risk trade-offs that, you know, there's a risk of creating further division if you, uh, uh, if you go for severe criminal justice, but there's also a big risk uh, that impunity uh, will, will insufficiently deter um, these kinds of events um, in the future. And one thing that, uh, it will become clear when the larger project is done and we move forward even to thinkers in the 20th century towards our times is that is that almost none of them uh, viewed uh, political trials as unnecessary some of them viewed them as very risky and likely to be uh, misused but they all pretty well think that you you need this um, to maintain uh, the rule of law and the reason for that is that they actually believe that a figure like Trump would emerge from time to time in politics. And so one uh, lesson one gains from studying these older thinkers is that we shouldn't be, you know, beating up on ourselves, oh, how could we let it happen? Or, you know, what did we do that allowed this to occur? For these thinkers, the problem is in human character and that somebody ambitious and lawless is going to emerge from time to time who also is popular and charismatic. And that's not because of anything we did wrong uh, as a society or because our institutions are rotten, but it's because of the relationship of human character uh, to power. And so we, we should feel a little better that, you know, that this happened, you know, is not really our fault. <laughs> that we don't deal with it properly <laughs> might be our fault, but that it happened is not really our fault. It's not something we didn't do, like, you know, you ask, uh, oh, how did I produce a kid like this? What, where did I go wrong? Um, so a very important principle that Mont Montesquieu introduces, which will continue with all of the liberal thinkers who reflect on this issue, is the distinction between speech and action, and, the con and, and what is the connection between them. Uh, one, Political trials um, that that prosecute speeches alone, even if those speeches contain uh, a revolutionary message, um, uh, should not be prosecuted. They they risk um, uh, uh, harming a free society more than protecting it. But what becomes complex is where the speech is directly connected to uh, a sp a specific. Um, um, a, a specific incitement or exhortation to a specific group of people here, such as in a public place. And there Montesquieu says, one is not punishing the speeches, one is punishing the act, uh, and they, the speeches only become crimes if they prepare, accompany, or follow a criminal act. And so that's one of the main principles for prosecutorial discretion, I think, that would one would draw from from Montesquieu's form of liberalism. Uh, Constant, uh, Benjamin Constant was a 19th century French liberal, much influenced by Montesquieu. Um, uh, he, like most uh, French liberals at the time, was kind of caught between rejecting, or, or his thought is in tension between, on the one hand, rejecting the reactionary politics of the Restoration, and on the other hand, um, uh, a kind of abhorrence for, you know, the the, the sanguinary politics uh, that represent the um, the terror and the worst aspects of the French Revolution. So, trying to navigate uh, between those uh, those two um, those two extremes, um, 
you know, and, and here, uh, you know, Mont uh, Constant distinguishes between mere misuse of, of power um, and, uh, versus a situation where there are illegal acts that create usurpation uh, of a power that the law has not conferred. And the first, he suggests, should be dealt with in political bodies. The second is what you want to try in an ordinary uh, uh, court of law. Uh, Guizot, um, and this goes to, I think, some of the things that uh, perhaps both uh, Deborah and David were saying. For Guizot, um, what's important is to preserve the forms of criminal justice, the impartiality um, or an, a, an appearance of impartiality uh, of the proceedings. So, um, and that's crucial for the legitimacy of, of political trials. Finally, the Federalist. Um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, reference to the treason provision in the Constitution has already been made, a, a reference to that has already been made. Uh, part of the Federalist concern is that the offenses be precise, that they not be confected offenses, that they be crimes that people would generally think of as actual um, uh, uh, crimes and not, so to speak, um, you know, purely political uh, offenses um, as opposed to recognizable criminal, uh, criminal behavior. Um, uh, and also, um, uh, the Federalist, uh, like Montesquieu, emphasizes that impunity is itself a danger. Um, it's, a, it's a strong incitement to sedition, the dread of punishment, a proportionally strong discouragement to it. And, but at the same time, also following Montesquieu, the Federalist emphasizes that there's a role for pardons, for leniency. So on the one hand, we don't want impunity. On the other hand, we, uh, we, there should be a, a generous use, for example, of the pardon power where necessary and appropriate um, to create healing and unity after such a, a divisive uh, episode uh, uh, in the political uh, uh, community. Okay, so um, those are some snapshots from uh, the first stage of uh, the project. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to talk about some of the later thinkers that will be uh, included in the next iteration. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Mary. So I have the unenviable task of being the last speaker after lunch uh, in the last half hour of the presentation. So for those who want to stand up, move around, um, <laughs> sit back down, wake yourself up. Um, I also, I think I'm the only speaker of the day who's not really an academic. Like I'm called a visiting professor, but I'm just a practitioner. I spent almost my entire career as in, in government and as you heard from the introduction, I run a litigation shop. We're a bunch of litigators. Most of us are former DOJ. So I am what I would call a radical pragmatist and uh, almost everything that I will speak about today is really just about trying to um, make sense of where we are and how we should be thinking about it from a purely practical standpoint. We can't, so there are certain things we can't change. Uh, there are certain things maybe we can, but how do we work within the system that we have? And you may also have heard, I co-host a podcast called Prosecuting Donald Trump, so you probably kind of know a little bit about the way I approach, approach this topic. Uh, it's not called not prosecuting Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so I start also with definitions, but uh, and I have a rule of law definition that I think is very much like Deborah's, but maybe um, pulls things apart just a little bit. And this is, I think, important to any conversation we have about sort of the ethics of, of prosecuting political opponents. And so I think of the rule of law in four parts. One is very much like what Deborah said, which is a system of laws that both the governed and the government agree to abide by. Second is transparency in the enactment and the enforcement of that law so that there is stability and predictability. Third would be a fair uh, legal system by which rights and responsibilities can be addressed and adjudicated. And finally would be competent, diverse, independent judges and lawyers to be part of that system. Now, we don't always succeed in um, um, meeting, I think, these kind of notions of rule of law. And this, this, this 
this sort of four-pronged definition that I have doesn't really come just from sort of studying sort of U.S., but like thinking about it in relationship to other countries and and how we would think of rule of law because you know our judges are are uh, become judges differently here than in other countries. Our lawyers, our prosecutors, our systems are different. Um, so when I think about that four-part test, to me that really all speaks to one thing that's in, that's important, I think, for our system and important to think about this, which is accountability. And it's not just accountability for the little people, for the minions, for the rioters on January 6th. It's accountability for the powerful and the rich and the people and the white people, the people that aren't always and historically in our country held accountable. Um, and so that sort of brings me then to, and it won't surprise you since I basically grew up in the Department of Justice, it, to the principles of federal prosecution. And like Dan, I was a federal prosecutor and, 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 and like Jessica, and so I, I tend to think of many things in terms of federal prosecution. The state systems are very different with elected DAs, the incentives are different, the pressures on them are different. But in the federal system, it's only, you know, nobody's elected as a prosecutor. Um, uh, and really, when you think about how big the department is, it's not even that many of the people who are political appointments, particularly in the US attorney's offices, which bring the vast majority of the prosecutions that the department brings. In the US attorney's office, there is one political appointee, and that is the US attorney themselves. And so in an office like my former office of over 300 attorneys, there's only one who's political. Many of us uh, who spent our, our time, and, and by the way, I should say, even though I was the acting assistant attorney general for national security at the end of my career, I was always career. Even as principal deputy, often a political appointment, I elected to remain com career and compete for that job. So, um, so I've never been a political appointee, and most of my colleagues who have spent decades in the department were not political appointees. And I would say outside areas like SDNY, EDNY, DC, and a couple of other big jurisdictions, EDVA, Chicago, LA, um, most of the US attorneys, even though they get politically appointed, most of them are people who had already spent 10 or more years in, that, in those offices as career employees. So when, you, when I think about the bulk of the department, I think is re really quite apolitical, and in fact, I. Uh, associate myself with the comments of Congress member uh, Goldman this morning who said I mean, he went his whole career without really talking about politics in the office and I can I can say the same at least when I was at the US Attorney's Office things when you go down the street to Maine Justice which I avoided for 20 years really like the plague was like you guys don't bother us we won't bother you we'll do our own thing um, but once I went down there, it does change a little bit. There are more political appointees in the big uh, RFK building and in other buildings around DC. And um, it's not that they're you know, making all their decisions for political reasons, but the folks in the leadership at Maine Justice are engaging with the interagency more, they're engaging with the White House more. I don't mean White House interfering in the decision about who to prosecute, who to investigate, we have strict no contact no uh, contact policies about that, but there is a little bit more of a sort of a political balance to things, like um, more of a weighing, like what will be the reaction politically to different things that and decisions that are made. So, okay, so coming back to principles of federal prosecution, because I think that in many ways, what I get from this definition of the rule of law and how it applies to accountability it does come out in the principles of federal prosecution, which are part of something called the Justice Manual, which governs, is guidance that really is binding on all um, DOJ attorneys. And that is that in making prosecutorial decisions, they should be, one, ensuring that there is a fair and effective um, exercise of prosecutorial discretion, and two, that their decisions promote confidence on both the part of the public and the defendants um, that their decisions are made rationally and objectively and based on individual assessments of the facts and the law. And so, you know, that translates itself, I think, into uh, what then the, the justice manual goes on to sort of discuss about how you apply these principles. And the first thing you do as a federal prosecutor, you look to see, is there a federal interest, right? Because 
The police power under our constitution is reserved to the states, so the vast majority of criminal prosecutions in this country take, take place uh, brought by state prosecutors generally elected DAs. And we're talking, a lot of that is sort of reacting to crime. So most of your sort of street crime, uh, uh, you know, whether it's theft or drug dealing or, um, or homicide or sexual offenses, most of that, with some exceptions, is prosecuted at that state level. So you're looking, as a federal prosecutor, what is the significant federal interest here? And if it's, if it's the type of crime that maybe could be prosecuted federally, but maybe also could be prosecuted at the state level, you're really thinking through, is there a federal interest significant enough here? So let me give you an example. Let's assume it, it's a crime involving um, transmission or distribution of child pornography, right? There are federal laws against that. There are also state laws against that. That's the kind of thing that could be prosecuted in both places. Hate crimes. Federal hate crimes are essentially state crimes of violence, murder, uh, assault with dangerous weapons, things like that, but done because of someone's race or gender or ethnicity or religion. Um, so ordinarily those crimes would be prosecuted by the state and the only reason that there's a federal interest is because Congress has said, we think there's particular societal appropriation, appropriation, the word you got, you know the word I'm trying to say here. Um, uh, for, for crimes that are, that are done because of race or gender, et cetera. So then you have to think through, and in fact, the U.S. Code even requires prosecutors not to bring hate crimes unless they've, you know, really explicitly thought through the, the fact that this could be brought at the state level. So first thing is a, is a federal interest. Second is, um, I kind of already alluded to it, are there alternatives? And would those alternatives satisfy essentially that federal interest. And I think we could talk, and Deborah and I talked a lot last night at dinner and Jessica about alternatives um, that might include things like the case I mentioned in the panel before lunch, a case that I've brought. Once a prosecutor, it's just hard to quit. So like I'm always trying to think of civil ways to go after the bad guys, like the fraudulent electors. I like to sue militias because like that's something that decided needed to happen. So we did that civilly. So is there a civil uh, enforcement mechanism that might, you know, bring accountability, not necessarily carry all the weight of criminal prosecution, and that may be more forward looking as opposed to backward looking to punishment for something that's already done. Now, I'll say as a prosecutor, I don't think I thought much about civil alternatives, honestly. It's only when I left DOJ and all I had was my civil capacity that I started really thinking about those alternatives. But nevertheless, what are the alternatives? And then the other is treating similarly situated people similarly. Like in one of the key principles of federal prosecution, and that's why when you'll see certain crimes being prosecuted, sometimes if particularly if they're high profile crimes or sensitive investigations or crimes that do involve elected officials or people running for election, you'll see the department putting out a bunch of comparators, right, to sort of justify why this prosecution was warranted because we've done this, this, and that over history that shows this was warranted or this is very different than other cases and, and that's why it's warranted. Um, so those kind of things all come into the thinking when a federal prosecutor is deciding whether to investigate and then ultimately seek to bring charges. Um, when I think about some of the questions that Jessica asked us to think about for this discussion about prosecuting somebody who's running for office or is a political appointment or whether it's for conduct that was committed while they were in office or, um, uh, or subsequent to being in office, some of the, the, one of the places I start and then I want to apply this to our current um, circumstances is generally I think the approach should be that you are not going to bring a case against a political point a, opponent or some, but someone who is running for office that you would not bring against somebody else who committed the same type of conduct. Um, so in other words, and this is really embodied in also the Justice Emanuel, Justice Manual, that you're not going to take action, overt action, bringing an investigation, doing a search warrant or anything like that, where it could be perceived that you are actually, you know, putting a thumb on the scale, right, of an election or or building up, a, it could be perceived that this was done for political purposes. Um, and so one, one criticism could be if 
a prosecutor does bring a case against someone, a political appointment, opponent that normally would not be brought against somebody else. But conversely, I think there's a problem to decline to bring a prosecution against someone for doing something that you would otherwise prosecute someone else for just because that person is a political opponent or is running for office. So from my perspective, that neutrality and the ethics of it should run both ways. You don't get favor, but you also don't get um, treated you know, uh, less favorably. So let's apply that to the two federal prosecutions of Donald Trump. If we look at the January 6th prosecution, we could say what could be a greater, I, I think some people would say, what could be a greater federal interest than trying to hold someone accountable for actually trying to overthrow the vote of the American people um, and stay in office through whatever means, fraudulent and others that are necessary. That's a pretty significant federal interest that yes, we've got a Georgia Fulton County prosecution, but it's still never going to be fully addressed at that state level, I think, um, the way that a federal prosecution would. So, okay, big federal interest. Um, what about similarly situated people? Well, you've had at this point, we're close to 1,500 people prosecuted for violently attacking the US Capitol, including um, obstructing the official proceeding, and including, in some cases, seditious conspiracy. We have people serving sentences now of over 20 years. Uh, that's not the normal sentence, but there, there, is a, there are some sentences uh, that are that significant, many others that are in the you know five to ten year range, which is nothing to let sneeze at. I don't think really any of us really want to go spend five <laughs> to ten years in prison. I can certainly say I don't. Um, so significant on them. Um, so lots of people have been prosecuted. Is Trump similarly situated? Well, one could say yes. He should not. He should not uh, be escape liability when so many others are doing arguably things that he asked them to do. But what about the other people who are more like him? What about the six unindicted co-conspirators in the January 6th prosecution? And we know who they are. They're readily identified by the facts about them. Um, is there something wrong about them be, being unindicted co-conspirators as opposed to being indicted co-conspirators? co-conspirators. Now, I could say part of that was if you'd indicted all these people, that would have added more complexity to the case. It would have made it even more unlikely to get to trial before the election. But one could also argue, well, Mary, isn't that just, isn't that just proof that this prosecution was done specifically because you wanted to get to trial before an election, therefore putting a thumb on the scale, right? Now, I can argue against that, like that's one thing, right? For the law students in the room, you do this long enough, you can argue both sides persuasively, and we could go on and on. I could go back and forth about how I can argue against myself. Um, but I think that bears, you know, and maybe Jack Smith will eventually indict those people. Maybe while Trump's up there with his immunity appeal in the US Supreme Court, Jack Smith will say, hey, what the heck, let's go ahead and go after Jeffrey Clark and uh, Ken Chesbro and Boris Epstein and some of these other guys. And, um, you know, then we wouldn't have this issue of at least some arguable disconnect between who's being prosecuted and who's not. Well, okay, let's talk about then the uh, Mar-a-Lago uh, mishandling of national defense information case. Federal interest is great. Like, I mean, I was in national security, several of us were in national security. This is a huge number of clearly marked, highly classified documents at very high levels, top secret and sensitive compartmentalized information. That's this kind of stuff that is, you know, that you cannot even look at outside of a skiff. Like I had a safe in my house when I was in national security that I had to have behind a deadbolt and the only thing I could bring home, bring home were documents at the secret level, not top secret, not SCI. Everybody in government knows that. Certainly the president who gets a briefing in a skiff in, in the first floor of the White House every single morning of the day knows that this is sensitive. So the number of documents stored at a social club where we know foreign adversaries have visited and can roam the halls kind of willy-nilly, that's, that's really a serious federal interest. Okay, federal interest. Um, what about similarly situated people? Well, uh, first of all, we've never had anything like this, so it's hard to get comparators. Same with January 6th. Like, it's hard to get a comparator just like Donald Trump. But even still, um, 
we, you know, we've got David Petraeus, who was a general who was prosecuted for uh, um, retaining cla marked classified information after he left office. Then we've got Biden and Pence and Clinton, who are not prosecuted for having some uh, classified information that they kept after they left office. So, okay, so that looks like we've got disparateness, but how do we reconcile that? Well, let's look at the facts. Petraeus, like Trump, well, I guess Trump didn't directly lie to the FBI, lied to the FBI through his attorney, right, by telling his attorney that the, here's where all of the, doc, the uh, boxes that left the White House with me are, these are the boxes for you to look through, hid the other boxes, tried to get his an attor attorney to lie from him, uh, enlisted his own employees to obstruct the investigation, try to get rid of videotapes, et cetera. David Petraeus lied to the FBI about the classified information he had taken. He got prosecuted, Trump's being prosecuted. Biden, Pence, they came, they voluntarily reported to the FBI and others that they had found some classified materials in their own homes. They voluntarily agreed to search searches of their homes and their offices. Joe Biden sat for a five hour interview uh, just the day after Hamas attacked um, in Israel. So very, very different. So you can make these distinctions to sort of show that federal interest in, in the prosecution. Um, so where does that all leave, leave us? And there's so many things, but I, I really want there to be time for questions. So I'm going to leave you with one last thought. To my mind, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about shouldn't we, uh, do we need to pull back on prosecutions that could be viewed as political because, in fact, this is not just talk, this is something that Donald Trump's lawyers have put in many of their briefs, um, that this will start this cycle of retribution where every president is then going to be prosecuting his political opponents and this is going to open this flood floodgates. Well, I think the contra to that is if you if you do not prosecute where it is otherwise warranted, aren't you then just basically saying rule of law is dead? I mean, for the people who are right now saying that there's a weaponized Department of Justice and that the prosecution of Donald Trump is a political persecution, for most of those people, they have already given up on rule of law because they supported the things that Donald Trump was doing that were so against the rule of law when he was in office um, and things that he is saying that he would do if he's in office again. So those people are not going to decide if A.G. Garland or Jack Smith says, you know what, we shouldn't do this. We're worried about floodgates. We're gonna withdraw these indictments. Those people are not going to come around and decide that, oh, now there's no weaponization, everything's fine, we're back to rule of law. That, I, I think that's impossible. So who you really care about? You care about the rest of the population who, without that prosecution, says, well, you know what? I know a few people who have been prosecuted federally. Some of my friends, some of my neighbors, they got caught up in some sort of drug crime or some sort of white collar fraud. You've got people, 15, almost 1,500, and there's going to be more prosecuted for January 6th. What do those people think? What does the society think if there's no prosecution of at the higher level and only the prosecution of us sort of ordinary minions? I think what that sends, the message that send, sends is that there is no rule of law and that a person who has enough chutzpah in, while in office to go after his political enemies um, is a bad actor. Uh, and we should not support them. And my last point is that, um, uh, you know, I'm not always known as an optimist, in fact, quite the contrary, but I do think we should give Americans a little bit more credit. Like elections matter. There is something we can do to prevent Donald Trump 2.0, and that is to vote, um, particularly if you live in a swing state, which we, you probably don't if you're here. Um, and then I think we should get rid of the Electoral College, but that's a different, that's a whole entire, <laughs> that's That would be our next conference. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mary. <laughs> so before we do anything further, I do have to announce a CLE quote for those who are watching online. Um, it is Rule 72K, R-U-L-E 72K. So if you're watching online and seeking New York State CLE credit, you have to enter that code. Um, on the requisite form, R-U-L-E-72-K. Okay. So, uh, 
This was tremendous. I feel like we could go at least another hour, but we won't. Um, so there was actually, I thought, much more optimism on this panel than I anticipated. Um, and so many places we could go with this. But one thing I got from you all is that we don't need any new institutions, right? And that maybe what we need to do is just take some solace in the fact that this is not brand new. Um, others have experienced this and thought about it. But if we are worried about some of the folks who worry about the legitimacy of our institutions, who are not so far gone that they can't be persuaded to have more faith and to fight for those institutions, how can we do a better job communicating about what's happening? I think Dan touched on that a little bit, but prosecutors, especially federal prosecutors that we've focused on, are trained really to confine what they do to their filings. Um, and I think that you've both alluded to sort of needing to make the case in court, but maybe we're in an era where there needs to be even more. I'll start that off. I mean, and you know, I grew up with those rules too, right? You, you, you no comment on your way out of the courtroom. You say, see what I filed in court. But you know, all of America is not going to read 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 page briefs. That's what I have to do to do that podcast. But like, you don't have to do that. I do that so that you don't have to do that. But you also don't necessarily want to take my word for it. And you don't necessarily want to take some other legal commentators word for it. And so I do think that particularly in, in, in cases where the politics can be, you know, the, the political balance could be questioned, it probably does behoove, and we have seen A.G. Garland do this, and we've seen Jack Smith do, it, do this, to come out and say something about it. I think they should stick to the things that are in their briefs and in their indictments, and not otherwise use a lot of adjectives or ad adverbs, right, or, or try to um, expound on what this means or the significance, but I think you know, to be able to make a public statement when an indictment is brought or when a major ruling happens is, is important to, to for so that people can hear something from the decision maker about what is happening and not have to, you know, read through lengthy legal documents. I want to jump in and just put a plug for the seminal article in the area by one Jessica Roth. <laughs> um, That's about declinations. But but it makes the larger point, which is there does need to, I mean, this just picks up on, on what Mary was saying. Um, we are in a world where, where government needs to explain its actions um, as much as possible. And obviously there are gonna be limits on what prosecutors do, but I don't think those limits are the ones that were set down 20 or 30 years ago. Um, there are gonna be some hard questions, obviously. There's all sorts of uh, fear these days about what her said about, about Biden, about um, what Jim Comey said about Clinton. And obviously people will differ on where the lines are drawn, but the idea that this shouldn't be done, I don't think is, is, is a place that is tenable anymore. Um, prosecutors have gone far on their brand and on their position, and this isn't working anymore to the extent that, that it used to. And maybe it didn't even work that well before, but we were less aware of it because, because the media markets were segmented and we didn't have social media the way we do. But explaining your actions when you're an incredibly powerful government official is, is just sort of impossible to avoid and should be impossible. So we are running out of time. We can probably take one or two questions, maybe, from the floor. Um, I'm sorry, oh, I have to make a yes. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Michael. So, uh, it's very striking how there's absolutely no confidence in the of self-regulation by the Supreme Court. There's lots of confidence in self-regulation by the Department of Justice. It's not universal, but, you know, <clears throat> but it's... Um, not what one would have, one might have expected the office to do. Um, my question, I was struck that there was so little said about the special counsel. Dan gave it two sentences and nobody else mentioned it. And if you are thinking about this big problem, the, the obvious move would be to create some structure to depoliticize the prosecution. And that's what, you know, the, the uh, Prakash and Ayers thing is aiming for. It may be stupid, but that's the intuition. Um, and you know, the structure we have is the special counsel. Special counsel regulation, like the independent counsel before it, seems to be less popular at every path in the day. And I welcome any talk anybody has about why that's not on your radar screen. 
was we ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can give a partial answer, and, and I'll be a little parochial in the sense that I'm speaking of uh, U.S. attorney's offices in big cities, like the ones Mary refers to, but these are, these are the offices that, that often bring the cases. And unlike the Supreme Court, these lawyers are going back to private practice, or some of the losers are going into academics, like me. Uh, uh, but, but they're not going to be ju justices forever. This is an incredibly permeated institution. Um, there are judges who are former prosecutors, and again, there's a, a big rap these days on former prosecutors as judges, and there's, there's reason to be to argue that, that there are too many of them, but there's also reason to, to celebrate that, that they're there to protect the integrity of, of the offices that are appearing before them. And if you start taking apart the ecosystem, the lived world of a prosecutor, particularly in a big city, you'll find it is bounded and constrained, and I've written about this a lot, in ways that are just light years away from what the Supreme Court deals with. So that's not to say there, there aren't pathologies, and that's not to say that there, there aren't problems that have actually happened. But the threat model is just totally different when it comes to the bigger cities. And when it comes to Maine justice, that's where I, you know, for the reasons Mary was suggested, I have more concerns. Um, I also have concerns about special prosecutors that have uh, a single assignment. Um, this is a problem. Um, this is, it's, you can have people of incredible integrity, but the limited assignment and the report obligation just comes with this overhang of, of a binary of bringing a case against this person or walking away and leaving that person without the ability to put them in a portfolio of cases. No, this isn't the case we're going to pursue because actually terrorism is more important in this district. Um, the large portfolio of U.S. Attorney's offices really is an incredible feature that, that helps assure the public that some decisions across cases is being made. And, you know, the other part is if you just look at history, the, you know, the Watergate prosecutions, the investigations were started by U.S. Attorney's offices. You know, the idea that, that U.S. Attorney's offices in larger cities are incapable of pursuing these cases and doing it well is just belied by history. And the history of special counsels is, shall we say, fraud. I guess I want to say just a couple of things. First, on the difference between line prosecutors and the Supreme Court, right? If line prosecutors lie, they will lose. They might also face discipline and or criminal sanction, um, but there is a checking mechanism that is imperfect, but extant and multi-pronged, and there is none at the court, right? Um, so there's that. Um, in Maine justice, right, which is where I worry there is a problem. So I, I'm on exactly the opposite side, right? Um, and, and, and I worry there's a problem for several reasons. I'll just, the one factor I'd write about OPR, the Office of Professional Responsibility, it's created immediately post Watergate. It's always been a little problematic and maybe a little more than a little problematic because it's under the control of a political, it's under the supervision of the Deputy Attorney General, right, who's political, so it's not independent like an Inspector General. Um, but it was operating, right, and in the years immediately post Watergate, it's sort of in early days of its founding, it's dealing with maybe 450 investigations annually right into professional, potential professional allegations or serious allegations if it gets to the investigation stage of a professional misconduct. Um, I just checked yesterday about the 2023 statistics and you don't get real reporting. We need more transparency there, but you get high level statistics. And last year, the number was 10, right? And you can track, and I did this with the help of a wonderful Cardozo law student who graduated. I hate it when they do that, but um, uh, no offense. Um, but but and and you can track sort of what's happening and it's not that they're getting fewer complaints in the OPR coming from the courts or outside the Department of Justice. It's that nobody in justice brings anything to OPR anymore because as one former inspector general told me, everybody knows OPR is where complaints go to die, right? And the IG, which is the only other internal potential option has no jurisdiction over professional misconduct by attorneys in the Department of Justice, okay, for, for attorney conduct. So there's nothing. Um, and that's why I worry about Maine Justice way more than I worry about the line attorneys who have to actually make their case in Maine Justice. They can do all kinds of stuff without ever getting anywhere near a court. Um, the last thing I want to say on the transparency front um, is there's a lot more that could be done, right? Um, not only 
with tracking ethics violations, right? State bars, most of them don't keep statistics at all. Justice Department publishes almost nothing and it's like pulling teeth. It took me like a year to get statistics. I had to do multiple FOIA requests and like multiple, right? That, that's, that's not okay. Um, and the Justice Department in this context could do itself a lot of favors yeah. by, by opening those books. Oh, that's a great point. So we could obviously go on so much longer, but we have videotaped remarks from Representative Jamie Raskin. So please join me in thanking our panel. Hey, it's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District, calling out to all my friends at the Conference on Ethics in the Judiciary and the Legal Profession. I'm very sorry not to be able to be with you in person, but I am stuck here in Washington. Um, and I understand that uh, my friend and colleague, Dan Goldman, is giving you a keynote address um, at breakfast time or lunchtime. I don't know if I'm giving the lunchtime or the dinner closing. Um, and um, I definitely um, am suffering from um, not having read everybody's paper, not having been able to see all of the participation. You've got an extraordinary lineup of uh, scholars and colleagues and professors there, and um, it's making me very nostalgic for the days when I could uh, come and participate in events like this. Um, but I do look forward very much to reading everything. It seems to me that um, when I read through everybody's paper and I am thinking about everybody's ideas, I'm going to be looking for certain kinds of things because there are different solutions available to the problems that now pervade the legal profession and especially the bench. Um, there are structural solutions. Uh, I've been working with some colleagues on the idea of trying to legislate an inspector general at the Supreme Court who would be able to oversee and ferret out potential conflicts of interest in different episodes of corruption on the Supreme Court and within the staff um, as well. Um, so that's a certain kind of structural solution. Another kind of structural solution has to do with um, recharging the separation of powers, maybe breathing more life into congressional oversight over Congress. Some of that has already begun and that would have to go hand in hand with mechanisms of um, greater transparency and better reporting uh, mechanisms. So these are attempts to structurally adjust our institutional arrangements in order to improve ethical outcomes. There are also solutions that I would put more in the category of um, moral or educational in nature, things like either mandatory or elective ethics training programs, um, professional consciousness raising, even some of the kinds of um, scholarly or academic endeavors like you're engaged in today, which could uplift um, discourse in the profession and on the bench and perhaps raise the consciousness of judges and of uh, justices. Um, and then I think that there might be what we would think of as kind of rule based or statutory kinds of changes um, where we either uh, try to impose new ethics codes or we get the court to write new ethics codes and to build different sorts of enforcement mechanisms into them. I take it that in a time of a lot of agitation and anxiety about this issue, we will be proceeding along different tracks, um, both structural reform tracks and moral and educational reform tracks and also statutory or rule based reforms um, with different kinds of compliance and enforcement mechanisms built into it. So I'm very curious to see what all of you guys come up with um, on that. Um, these issues, um, which are definitely in the, the minutia of the law, it's not always the kinds of things that grab the biggest headlines. Um, nonetheless, do go to the very heart of 
the rule of law and whether we'll be able to make it stick and make it forceful against a series of attacks from the outside that look to me very tyrannical and authoritarian and sometimes fascist in nature. And we know that the essence of fascism is the attempt to destroy the rule of law. And we have no rule of law if we don't have uh, a set of legal conventions and norms that govern what lawyers do and what judges do um, in a way that promote um, in, in a way that promotes integrity, honesty, and trust in the legal system and the legal process. So um, I just want to underscore the great importance of what it is you're doing here, uh, because it does go right to the heart of the existence of the rule of law, the future of the rule of law at a time when the rule of law is under siege all over the world and we have bad faith strategic actors who completely stepped outside of the legal and constitutional system and are uh, heckling it from the outside, attacking it from the outside, and essentially trying to unravel and undermine uh, the whole system of rule of law that we've got. So thank you for your hard work. Uh, I'm sorry I've not written any um, contribution uh, to your deliberations today, um, but I will be sure to read everything that you guys do, and I'm certain I will benefit from it. And um, hang tough, everybody, for democracy and the rule of law, hang tough for the Constitution. And if you're ever down in Washington, make sure to come and see me uh, in the House of Representatives. All best. Bye-bye.